And Mr. Perato, if you could just speak a few words on uh, syngas utilization for hydrogen steel making uh, and reducing your carbon footprint. If you just give us a, in few words. Mr. Perato? Yes, yes, I'm here. Unfortunately, connection was somehow disturbed, but now I'm yeah. back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so the point yeah. is, uh, if, if you could just in a few words highlight how the syngas utilization has helped in uh, reducing our carbon footprint. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I've prepared very few slides because, let's say, the minutage uh, that we can speak, of course, is not much. So I will just introduce what could be a potential use in blast furnace, also of hydrogen, to to reduce uh, carbon footprint, uh, replacing part of the carbon as reductant with hydrogen. So that's uh, I will bring also a short example of what we are doing, but there are also many others that can be can be discussed. Yeah. Let's say. Right, Mr. Parato. So uh, I. Minister, joining right away. So, Ankit, can you just cross check uh, who are the panelists who have not joined so far so we can give them a reminder? I think. Yes, I think uh, Pradeep is also already working on that. Yeah, okay. Paramjit told me that he uh, has a meeting with Secretary at four o'clock, so he will join back later. Mm -hmm. So, that is not a problem. So, Paramjit, we need not wait for. Uh, Joachim is yet to join. Joachim Wanchili from Linde. Joachim, I, I can't see Joachim. Can you see him, Ankit? No, not yet. Professor Basu will be joining a little late. Yeah, Professor Basu, yeah, he will be joining. So I think we can uh, get started now and then uh, in the meantime. Yeah. For the other, or we wait for uh, the honourable minister to join. Yeah, we we have to wait for the minister. Minister yeah, should be joining any any moment. I think he's uh, ready to join. So. And then we we can start. Yeah. So have you started the YouTube streaming also? Yes. So I've also. Uh, place the link on the chat. So if anyone wants to watch it on YouTube, the link is available in the chat. I think the minister is all set for only thing is Welcome, Mr. Arjit Viswas from Tata Steel. Mr. Masi Malano, how are you? I, uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I uh, will uh, talk uh, about uh, our experience with uh, hydrogen combustion, with uh, the burners, full you hydrogen, a, I mean. Right. You are a very good friend. And you know, in every exhibition in the world I've been to, you were the first one I met at Daneli booth. So. You know, we are good friends for so many years now. Yes. For every time you are the first one I get to meet. So it's, I, I, I'm really I, happy to see you. Again. I see you. I see you with pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simalano. So, buongiorno once again. And buongiorno. Uh, we are just waiting for the minister. Otherwise, we are all ready. Uh, Mr. Pavlov, how are you? Mr. Pavlo, Mr. Pavlo from Sevastal. 
I'm here. Good to meet you all. Yes. Not ready to switch on the camera right now. Okay, I'm walking, but uh, thank you for inviting me here on this great event. I'll be talking about disruptive technologies in some time. So if anybody wants to uh, kind of to drop me a line to discuss some pilots, to discuss some investment in disruptive thing, hydrogen, decarbonization, carbon capture storage, fertilizers, anything you have in mind, please, please do that. And the end of my presentation is going to be your kind of my email and contacts. So I'll try to give you our perspective and uh, where the steel and mining industry is going and what is the role of hydrogen in this journey. So I'll try to make it short, but exciting. And again, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Mr. Pavlov. Spasiba, Balchoy. And uh, we'll come back to you in a short while. Uh, before that, uh, uh, Pradipta, if you can just give a minister to a uh, minister's office uh, reminder, if the minister is ready, we can start. If you could just give a reminder to Mr. Alin Kumar. If... Mr. Shivu John, a warm, a warm welcome to you. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So how is Linz? Yeah, fantastic today. It's quite warm, very good. Great. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I, I would say Linz is a very beautiful city to live in. So this time of the year must be very pleasant. What, it is about 21, 22 degrees right now in Linz? Yeah, around that. It, uh, it is slightly cold, but okay. Great. So, so who else is left? Uh, uh, Ankit, if you can just ask Pradeep if he has spoken to Anil Kumar about ministers. Joining. Yeah, he's uh, already on the call right now. Okay. In the meantime, Ankit, do you have the Danelli presentation which was there, uh, which you played last time? Then we can play the Danelli presentation by the time, as they are the only sponsor today. So we can play. Do you have it with you? Then we can play the Danelli presentation before the ministers. So we are already delayed by five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nine minutes, yeah, nine minutes. I think maybe we can uh, start and... No, no, Ankit, it is impolite to start without the minister. I think it is impolite because I don't want, uh, you know, I fully appreciate because, uh, but I can see the minister is there, but it is impolite to, uh, you know, begin it without the chief guest. Sure, sure, no problem. Yeah, otherwise we are all ready, but you have to understand the minister may have got stuck uh, in some discussion with someone, maybe you did it by another five, four or five minutes, but we, it is impolite to not to wait for the minister. Let's wait for the minister and and uh, 
स्वागत है आपका हम फिर से आपका आभारी है आप इतने आप अभी अभी लौटे हैं जमशेदपुर दुर्गापुर सब होके फिर भी आपने हमारे लिए वक्त निकाला इसलिए हम आपके तह दिल से आभारी है मंत्री जी आज तो दुबली खुशी है हमारी कि अब हम ऐसा टॉपिक पे बात करने जा रहे हैं जिसमें प्रधानमंत्री जी हमारे यशस्वी प्रधानमंत्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी बहुत ही इंटरेस्ट ले चुके हैं इसमें और उनका ये पंद्रह अगस्त के दिन वो हमारे हाइड्रोजन पॉलिसी का अनाउंस भी कर चुके हैं इसलिए हमारे लिए ये दोहरी खुशी की बात है कि हम ऐसे विषय में आज बात करने जा रहे हैं जिसमें प्रधानमंत्री जी खुद हाँ तो इसीलिए मंत्री जी अब तो अब इस विशेष तरह से आपकी आभार प्रकट करना चाहते हैं कि इस विषय में आप हम हमसे जुड़े और हमें हमारे मार्गदर्शन के लिए आप आज हमारे साथ यहाँ उपस्थित हैं मुख्य मुख्य अतिथि के रूप में आपको फिर से स्वागत करते हुए मैं आपकी आज्ञा चाहता हूं कि हम हम अपना कार्यक्रम शुरू करें चलिए ठीक है मंत्री जी तो हम शुरू करते हैं विद द परमिशन ऑफ द ऑनरेबल मिनिस्टर स्टेट फॉर स्टील श्री फग्गन सिंह कुलस्ते वी बिगिन आवर डेज वेबिनार मैं रिक्वेस्ट अंकित टू स्टार्ट ऑफ yeah so uh, good afternoon and a warm welcome to all the panelists and uh, the attendees who have joined us today and uh, to everyone watching on our live stream we welcome you all to our 31st webinar titled as decarbonization and use of hydrogen for iron and steel making organized by steel and metallurgy a uh, warm welcome uh, to the honorable minister and to our sponsors daniely for supporting this event i would now like to introduce our panelists for today so uh, to start things off we have our chief guest for today uh, honorable minister of state for steel government of india shri fagan singh kulaste ji followed by that we have our keynote speaker mr vya sharma managing director jindal steel and power limited dr mukesh kumar director of steel research and technology mission of india satmi then we have mr pramjit singh additional additional industrial advisor ministry of steel government of india Dr. Yokim Fonshil, Director, Global Commercialization, Linde Technology, uh, Linde PLC. Professor Shuddosh uh, Shatto Basu, Director, CSIR IMMT Institute of Minerals and Materials Technology, Bhuvaneshwar. Mr. Sachin Kumar, Senior Fellow and Area Convener, Industrial Energy Efficiency, TERI. Mr. Ilya Pavlov, Head of Hydrogen and Innovative Decarbonization, Vice President, Investments. Uh, Severstal Ventures Mr Shibu K John Vice President Strategy and Business Development for uh, the Upstream Business of Prime Metals Technologies Mr Massimiliano Fantuzzi Vice President R&D Daniele Centro Combustion Mr Praveen Chaturvedi VP and Head Sales Upstream India Tenova Technologies Private Limited Dr Arijit Biswas Principal Researcher Ferro Alloys and Minerals Research Group Tata Steel Uh, D Satish Kumar R&D and SS Steel Mills and uh, Product Development Group JSW Steel Limited uh, Marco Perato Technical Sales Manager COC Iron uh, COE Metallurgy Paul Ward SMS Group Mr Ashton uh, Hertrich Sales Engineer Daniely Centro Metallic So uh, thank you all for joining us today and thanks again to our sponsors uh, Daniely for supporting this event 
Uh, before we move on, I would like to share a few short guidelines for smooth platform management. I'm sure by now we are all familiar with the guidelines, but I would just like to quickly breeze through them. So for the numerous attendees who have joined us on Zoom to listen to our discussion, we have a Q&A section in Zoom, which can be accessed by all panelists and attendees. And I would request everyone to post your questions and queries in the Q&A section, and the panelists can then choose to either answer it live or directly in the chat. I would also request all the panelists to keep their microphones muted when the others are speaking to avoid any kind of noise feedback. And uh, last but not the least, I would request everyone to adhere to the time limit as given in the program to avoid any delays. So uh, our session moderator for today's discussion will be my father, Mr. Nirmalaya Mukherjee, editor of Steel and Metallurgy. And on behalf of Steel and Metallurgy and our sponsor, I would welcome you all to this webinar uh, and uh, request you all to please rise for the national anthem. जन गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जल धितरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे Thank you, Ankit, uh, and a warm welcome to everyone, uh, and special welcome to our chief guest, the Honorable Minister of State for Steel and Rural Development, Sri Fagan Singh Kulasteji, and uh, our chief guest will be addressing us, guiding us toward, towards a way forward for creating a hydrogen economy, which the Prime Minister has taken very uh, serious and keen interest in. And uh, as the Prime Minister has commented on our Paris Protocol that we will be ahead of the Paris uh, uh, deadlines which are set and will go beyond the set uh, deadlines. We'll go ahead, or we will be ahead of the deadline. So with that, I will give you the Mantri Ji, Sri Fagan Singh Tulaste Ji, to our Mark Darshan, and to share our Mark Darshan. Fagan Singh Ji. Hello. Hello. Yes, Mantri Ji, we are listening to you. webinar, जो कि डिकार्बोनाइजेशन एवं आयरन तथा स्टील मेकिंग में हाइड्रोजन के उपयोग पर स्टील एवं लजी के द्वारा आयोजित किया जा रहा है मैं उपस्थित इस्पात उद्योग के हमारे कैप्टन और इससे आयोजन में विशेषकर हमारे परजी जी सर शर्मा जी और हमारे सभी पैनलिस्ट स्पीकर्स प्रेस मीडिया के सभी फ्रेंड्स टीवी और सज्जनों मैं सबको नमस्कार करता हूं विशेषकर पर्यावरण को साफ सुथरा रखना आज के समय में हम सभी के लिए एक महत्वपूर्ण है पर्यावरण प्रदूषण से होने वाले हानिकारक प्रभाव से हम सब पूरी तरह से वाकिफ हैं हमें उन कारकों की पहचान करनी होगी जो कि पर्यावरण को नुकसान पहुंचाता है इस पात उद्योग ने पर्यावरण को प्रभावित करने वाला 
तीसरी सबसे बड़ा उद्योग है जैसा कि मुझे बताया गया है कि इस्पात उद्योग है एक टन स्टील के उत्पादन में लगभग 1.8 टन कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड ऑक्साइड गैस का उत्सर्जन करता है और जीवांश ईंधन ईंधन के उपयोग से वैश्विक उत्सर्जन का सेवन से एट परसेंट उत्सर्जन इस्पात उद्योग से हो रहा है यह एक चुनौती है कि कैसे ग्रीन हाउस गैस के उत्सर्जन को कम किया जाए जैसा कि आप जानते हैं कि इस्पात उद्योग ऊर्जा सघन क्षेत्र है काफी मात्रा में ऊर्जा की जरूरत पड़ती है लो एस के रिडक्शन को के साथ करने पर कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड गैस निकलता है जिसे उपचार के बाद पर्यावरण में छोड़ दिया जाता है लो एस के रिडक्शन करने के लिए कोक का इस्तेमाल किया जाता है प्राकृतिक गैस का भी उपयोग किया जाता है इस रिडक्शन के दौरान कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड का उत्सर्जन होता है जो हमारे पर्यावरण को प्रदूषित करता है देश का लगभग 60 परसेंट उत्पादन बीएफ, बीओएफ के द्वारा किया जाता है जिसमें कोक का उपयोग किया जाता है बाकी ईएएफ, आईएफ के द्वारा डीआरआई स्क्रैप के उपयोग करके उत्पादन किया जाता है पहले आपने डीआरआई के ऊपर वेबिनार आयोजित किया था जिसमें वक्ताओं ने बताया था कि 86 परसेंट डीआरआई का उत्पादन कोल आधारित है तथा 14 परसेंट डीआरआई का उत्पादन गैस आधारित है वक्ताओं ने मुझे बताया कि गैस की अनुपलब्धता के कारण गैस आधारित डीआरआई का उत्पादन कम हो रहा है सबसे बड़ी चुनौती है कि कैसे लो एस के रिडक्शन में प्रयुक्त होने वाले कोक की जगह किसी अन्य अवयव का इस्तेमाल किया जाए आज के इस वेबिनार इस दिशा में एक महत्वपूर्ण और एक पहल है और पैनलिस्ट इस पर गहन चर्चा करेंगे हाइड्रोजन लो आयस के रिडक्शन में महत्वपूर्ण कारक हो सकता है इस पर अलग अलग इस्पात उद्योग ट्रायल कर रहा है हाइड्रोजन फ्री फर्म फार्म में उपलब्ध नहीं है ये औद्योगिक रूप से उपलब्ध है हाइड्रोजन का इस्पात उत्पादन में उपयोग इस समय कास्ट इफेक्टिव नहीं है माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्रीमान नरेंद्र मोदी जी ने नेशनल हाइड्रोजन मिशन की घोषणा इस साल है पंद्रह अगस्त को लाल किला के प्राचीर से किया है जिससे कि हमारा देश दो तक नवीनीकरण ऊर्जा से कार्बन फ्री ईंधन के क्षेत्र में आत्मनिर्भर बन सकेगा जब हाइड्रोजन से लो आयस की तकनीकी का ट्रायल सफल हो जाएगा तो मुझे उम्मीद है कि उस समय तक हमारी सरकार के विजन के अनुसार हाइड्रोजन की उत्पादन बड़े पैमाने पर होने लगेगा और इसकी लागत भी कम हो जाएगी जो कि आने वाले समय में एक ग्रीन ईंधन के क्षेत्र में क्रांति लाएगा जैसा कि आप जानते हैं नेशनल स्टील पॉलिसी 2017 के अनुसार पेरिस संधि के अंतर्गत भारत को उत्सर्जन सघनता 2005 के स्तर से 2030 तक अपने जीडीपी का 30 से 35 परसेंट तक 
घटानी है इस लक्ष्य को प्राप्त करने के लिए भारत को ऐसे ऊर्जा अनुकूल संसाधनों का पता लगाने की जरूरत है जिसका वह खर्च वहन कर सके और वे उपलब्धि भी हो इसी दिशा में हमारी सरकार द्वारा नेशनल हाइड्रोजन मिशन की घोषणा करना तथा देश भर में नेचुरल गैस को पाइपलाइन के माध्यम से उपलब्ध कराना एक महत्वपूर्ण कदम है आने वाले समय में इस्पात उद्योग द्वारा नेचुरल गैस तथा हाइड्रोजन का उपयोग करके ग्रीन हाउस गैस का उत्सर्जन कम करने में मदद मिलेगी भारत विश्व में नवीनीकरण ऊर्जा के क्षेत्र में तीसरा सबसे बड़ा उत्पादक देश है आज भारत में लगभग 136 गीगावाट ऊर्जा का उत्पादन नवीनीकरण ऊर्जा स्रोतों से किया जा रहा है जो कि कुल क्षमता का 38 परसेंट है भारत ने नवीनीकरण ऊर्जा स्रोतों से 2030 तक 450 गीगावाट का लक्ष्य रखा है मुझे लगता है कि मेरी सरकार इस लक्ष्य को समय से पहले प्राप्त कर लेगी जैसा कि नेशनल इस्पात नीति 2017 में बताया गया है कि ग्रीन हाउस गैस के उत्सर्जन को 2030 तक 2005 के स्तर से 30 पैतीस प्रतिशत तक घटाना है हम इस लक्ष्य को समय से पहले प्राप्त कर लेंगे भारतीय इस्पात उद्योग इस्पात के उत्पादन में नेचुरल गैस तथा हाइड्रोजन का उपयोग ज्यादा करेगा और ग्रीन इस्पात का उत्पादन कम करेगा ग्रीन इस्पात का उत्पादन के क्षेत्र में हमारी सरकार ने 2019 में स्टील स्क्रैप रिसाइकलिंग पॉलिसी तथा 2021 में हजार स्क्रैप्स पॉलिसी लाई है जिससे इस्पात उद्योग को स्क्रैप की उपलब्धता सुनिश्चित होगी जो कि ग्रीन इस्पात के उत्पादन में क्रांतिकारी कदम होगा आज के पहले इस्पात उत्पादन में हाइड्रोजन के उपयोग पर गहन चर्चा करेंगे और अच्छे सुझाव प्राप्त होंगे जो कि हाइड्रोजन से इस्पात के उत्पादन में उपयोग होगा मैं सभी मित्रों से भी आग्रह करना चाहता हूं कि हमने जिस प्रकार की कल्पना हमने किया है और प्रधानमंत्री जी की जो अपेक्षा है इस अपेक्षा के अनुरूप है हम इस बात के क्षेत्र में जो बेहतर उपयोग है हाइड्रोजन के उपयोग पर स्टील एवं कला जी के द्वारा आयोजित सेमिनार से हमारी पैनलिस्टों के माध्यम से जो चर्चा होगी मैं चाहता हूं कि इसके बारे में हम जब चर्चा करें और उसकी रिकॉर्ड और उसमें से जो भी अच्छे महत्वपूर्ण सुझाव हैं हम इससे जन को और कैसे उपयोगी बना सकते हैं स्टील एवं मेट्रोलॉजी के सेक्टर में मैं चाहता हूं कि इससे का रिपोर्ट्स और बाकी जो भी डिस्कशन के जो मुख्य बिंदु होंगे मुझे मंत्रालय को अगर आप लोग सुझाएंगे तो मुझे भी खुशी होगी और हम प्रयास करेंगे कि इससे आने वाले भविष्य को और कैसे हम बेहतर कर सकते हैं स्टील सेक्टर के क्षेत्र में ऐसी मेरी अपेक्षा है पुनः एक बार मैं जी को अर्जी जी को मैं बहुत बधाई देता हूं हमारे जी को और सारे पैनलिस्टों को भी कि आप सब लोग ऐसे समय में हम इस कार्यक्रम को आयोजित कर रहे हैं मैं हमारे इससे जनकर्ताओं को भी मैं बहुत शुभकामनाएं देता हूं बधाई देता हूं धन्यवाद नमस्कार नमस्कार मंत्री जी हम आप पता नहीं कैसे आपका आभार प्रकट करें जब भी हमने आप से कभी भी रिक्वेस्ट किया आप, आपने ना नहीं कहा बस एक बार जब आप कोविड प्रेरित हो गए थे उस बार छोड़ दे तो अभी आपने कभी ना नहीं कहा इसलिए तय दिल से आपका शुक्रिया अदा करते हुए मैं आपका पूरा सेक्रेटेरिएट अनिल कुमार जी दुबे जी सबका 
मैं तय दिल से शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ कि जब कभी हमने रिक्वेस्ट की है आपने ना नहीं कहा हमारे मार्गदर्शन के लिए हमेशा रहे हैं आप हमारे साथ बस एक ही आज आपसे बस एक ही चीज मांगनी है जबकि आप ग्रामीण विकास मंत्रालय का राष्ट्र मंत्री बन चुके हैं तो मैं आपसे यही दरख्वास्त करूंगा कि ये जितने हमारे रूरल एरिया है जितना ग्रामीण एरिया है इसमें इस बात की खपत बढ़ाने के लिए अगर हम एक वेबिनार के अरेंज करके आप आकर इसमें अगर मंत्रालय इस्पात मंत्रालय और ग्रामीण विकास मंत्रालय दोनों मंत्रालय से आप बस आपका सहयोग मिलता तो हम चाहते हैं कि एक वेबिनार ऐसा करें जिसमें ग्रामीण विकास में इस्पात का क्या रोल है इस पर एक वेबिनार किया जाए यही आपसे विनती है जरूर जरूर इसके बारे में आप लोग प्लान कीजिए जरूर इसके बारे में डिस्कशन करेंगे और कैसे इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर को और इसको और नीचे तक ले जा सकते हैं रूरल एरिया में जरूर इसके लिए प्रयास करेंगे मैं शर्मा साहब से भी विनती करूंगा कि वो हमारी इसमें मदद करे कि हम रूरल एरिया में जहाँ की हमारी खपत बहुत कम है वहाँ कैसे बढ़ाया जाए क्योंकि हमारे गाँव के भाई बंधु का यही समस्या के ये समझते नहीं है कैसे इस पर इस बात का इस्तेमाल किया करें एक बार मैं सजन जिंदाल जी से बात कर रहा था तो यही बोलते हैं कि हमारे देश के लोगों में यही कमी की वो जानते नहीं है इस बात की कैसे इस्तेमाल किया जाए तो इस बारे में मिस्टर वी शर्मा मंत्री जी आपका और पूरे मंत्रालय का मैं सहयोग चाहता हूँ इस बारे में कुछ किया डॉक्टर मुकेश कुमार इनका भी सहयोग चाहिए तो मुकेश कुमार जी आप अगर इसमें सहायता करें तो एक हम चाहते हैं कि रूरल बेस्ड कंजम्पन को कैसे बढ़ा जाए इसे करें फिर से फगन सिंह जी मंत्री जी आपका बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद करते हुए आप मैं यही दरख्वास्त करूंगा आप थोड़ी देर के लिए हमारे साथ बने रहें शर्मा साहब डॉक्टर मुकेश कुमार इनसे बस इनका मतलब हाइड्रोजन इकोनॉमी में क्या कहना आप थोड़ा अगर सुन लेते तो ये यही विनती है आपसे शर्मा साहब द फ्लोर इज योर्स मिस्टर वी शर्मा इज द मैनेजिंग डायरेक्टर ऑफ JSPL who needs no introduction, and uh, I often keep saying that uh, the only person whom I regard as a leader of this industry after Mr. Muthuraman is Mr. V. S. Sharma. Uh, oh, thank you. Know, you. Uh, the the person whom I uh, you know have the maximum regard for was one was Mr. Muthuraman, and next is Mr. V. S. Sharma, who have led the industry from the front, and uh, uh, the amount of uh, goodwill, the amount of knowledge. Uh, mr sharma shares and whatever he predicts i don't know how whatever he predicts for the industry becomes like gospel becomes like uh, the gita the the truth uh, which prevails so whatever he predicts today will become truth tomorrow that is for sure over to you mr sharma yeah, sarva thank sarva. you so much thank you so much uh, for speaking so high about me mananiya mantri mohde ji aur mere sabhi sathiyo dr mukesh kumar ji shri pranjit singh ji Uh, Dr. Jokam and uh, Professor uh, uh, Mr. Basu uh, and uh, my friend uh, uh, Mr. Nirmala. So thank you very much. Good afternoon uh, to everybody. And some some people are uh, they have just got up. Good morning to them. Uh, and because this particular webinar is uh, being conducted across the globe, many people have joined us. So good afternoon and uh, good morning to everyone. so thank you very much for inviting me to speak on very very interesting and very hot topic of uh, 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 of energy uh, and becoming becoming the self reliant making the steel industry uh, self reliant or carbon neutral in time to come so uh, decarbonization uh, is a very very vast subject uh, uh, it takes a lot of time and it will take lot many years to reach to this particular level of course many of the countries they are already working many of the scientists researchers technologists uh, they are working on these technologies and we being a user we are also watching and very curiously we are working with them how to reduce the uh, the, the carbon footprint as a whole so uh, the companies like uh, palworth companies like danelli companies like hyl companies like midrex companies like prime metal vi as uh, uh, the sms and uh, many more organizations they are working how to reduce the total carbon footprint uh, while we are making steel 
so the basic thing what uh, what is understood now that we have to come out of uh, the blast furnace route steel making and uh, we have to reach to electric arc furnace steel making so the challenges are many so the first challenge in a country like india is how to reach to uh, electric arc furnaces and what will be the feed stock so normally we say either it is scrap or it is uh, a part of pig iron and part of uh, Uh, uh if you see in totality uh, the dri so normally the people in the world they use hbi dri about 40 45% and they prefer to use about 40% or 45% scrap and balance 10 to 15% pig iron for a, a better uh, melting time so but the but unfortunately uh, when we take the indian context indian uh, scenario Uh, neither the dri or hbi is available in the country uh, which is produced out of gas nor the scrap is available so now the the scrap uh, scrap policy is in place but it is going to take a couple of years of time uh, so that this scrap can be made available today we import 10 million ton scrap in a year which is 10% of the total steel production and we expect that 7 million ton scrap by 2025 will be a Uh, in house generation in country so total 17 million ton scrap will be available for electric arc furnaces and part of that will go to induction furnaces also so here uh, i request to government of india we should come out with some policy so that we can convert the entire induction furnaces base organization into electric arc furnaces we have to support them we have to give them some benefits some profits some attraction so that they switch or they graduate from uh, induction furnaces to electric arc furnaces and when the electric arc furnaces they to do come in picture the biggest challenge today is power tariff today uh, if you see most of the scrap which will be generated that will be generated in northern india and western india so at least 70% of this scrap will be generated in northern india and western india together but unfortunately in northern india and western india the power tariff is about 10 rupees to 12 rupees a unit which is very high so uh, the 10 cents of power or 12 cents of power uh, electricity electricity charges 10 dollar cent uh, which is very high for any any steel industry to survive so normally the steel mills through the electric arc furnace route uh, if the gas is not available and if you don't use the uh, Uh, at the at the uh, coke bridge uh, then you know as as a carbon addition then uh, we need about 700 uh, units or 700 kilowatt hour per ton uh, total including uh, uh, ladle furnace lrf including utilities including electric arc furnace steel melting and uh, part of uh, billet caster or the slab caster so this 700 units per ton means uh, we will consume about 8000 rupees indian rupees uh, or little more than that so 8000 rupees is about 100 dollars 110 dollars so 110 dollars per ton of the cost only electricity that will make this steel unviable or non competitive so uh, so electric arc furnaces primarily uh, we have to see that we control the cost of electricity in the country we make the free flow of electricity from one grid to another grid we reduce the levies levied by different uh, grids and uh, we make the wheeling arrangement wheeling of power in such a nice way that from one location to another location transporting power should not become costly or expensive we have to now switch over to higher voltage of uh, transmission towers instead of 230 kv or 440 kv i think the time has come to graduate to 750 and 1250 kv uh, uh, the power lines we don't need to buy a new land no need of any new right of way we can uh, install these transmission towers on the same right of way which is used today for 230 kv so government of india will have to think that how to graduate 230 kv transmission line to 1250 kv transmission lines so that the overall transmission loss can be reduced we have to also see that how can we high, uh, to uh, switch over to high voltage dc lines uh, and we can install many of the uh, dc electric arc furnaces in the country instead of electric arc furnaces so that time will come 
Now coming back on the hydrogen, so we have two major points here, how to produce hydrogen. So uh, the most and the cleanest or the green hydrogen that comes either through the hydroelectric dams, that is hydropower, or it comes from the nuclear power, or it comes to the solar power, or it comes from wind power. So uh, the hydroelectric dams and, uh, and the uh, uh, nuclear power plant, primarily these are uh, government driven, government support is required. So it is a policy matter whether the government of India wants to enter into nuclear power plants in times to come or not. Hydro full potential is yet to be utilized in the country. More than 65% of the water resources are still waiting uh, to be converted into dam and to, to produce electricity, especially uh, in, the, in the state of Arunachal Pradesh and Sikkim and part of uh, adjoining part of Nepal and other part of Himalayas. So these are the areas where we can install more and more uh, hydroelectricity generation, and we can uh, uh, generate uh, electricity at a cheaper cost, as well as it will be environmental friendly. The other area is, uh, if you see uh, the nuclear, as I already told you, it's a policy decision, how, how much uh, nuclear power plant, what is the total dependence on nuclear power plant government of India wants to take. The third comes to the solar. Solar, as of now, this technology is coming fast, but of course, it occupies a lot of space. And uh, then the, the, the overall arrangement uh, in day hours versus night hours, though that balance is still imbalanced. So we have to find out that uh, uh, wind energy as well as solar energy, they go side by side and uh, they can generate uh, a good amount of electricity for the nation. The other, the, the next area is, which is immediate solution available to the nation, that is how to produce hydrogen through coal. This will be a brown hydrogen, uh, because when we speak coal, then you know many people, they speak coal is detrimental to the world, but it is not. Coal is a very friendly product if utilized rightly, if, uh, if, if it is gasified rightly. Underground coal gasification has to be developed, and uh, many countries in the world having technology uh, underground coal gasification that we have to uh, find out how to do the under, underground coal gasification. Secondly, the coal bed methane, we have to find out that CBM route is too, totally exploited and uh, we take out uh, coal bed methane uh, from uh, 200 meters to two kilometers down in the, uh, uh, from the earth and we do not uh, damage the environment and we, we do not burn uh, the coal in the open atmosphere. The third is uh, the on the surface uh, closed chamber uh, hydrogen, uh, closed chamber gasification plants through the entrained flow or through the, the fixed bed mechanism. So the fixed Ankit, is uh, Mr. Sharma disconnected or is it? I think, uh, yeah, he had some connection issue, I think. Okay, so we wait for him to come back. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think his video is frozen, so he, I could have had the, just uh, send a message to ask Pradipta to follow up with Arunesh and check. Arunesh and Srikanth will be able to. <clears throat> I think he got disconnected. There was a connectivity issue. I think. In the meantime, Ankit, uh, do you have the video? Shreya has sent. Yeah, you're mute. In the meantime, yeah, we can play the sponsor video.
अंकित यू कैन मिस्टर शर्मा इज बैक मिस्टर शर्मा इज बैक सॉरी सॉरी देयर वाज अ डिस्कनेक्शन नो प्रॉब्लम नो प्रॉब्लम शर्मा साहब मे आई कंटिन्यू नाउ या प्लीज प्लीज ओके so uh, i was telling that uh, the the cbm coal bed methane and also uh, about the ground uh, gasification these are the technologies uh, which we should work with so that immediately the hydrogen is available uh, to the steel mills and we can produce uh, dri we can also inject hydrogen 10 to 15% in our blast furnaces and we can also uh, utilize uh, this hydrogen in dri making as well as uh, Uh, into the injection as a gas as a shroud gas into electric arc furnaces uh, i know uh, during last uh, one month of discussions with uh, various companies like tenova and also with sms and also uh, with danelli uh, uh, we have come to know that they have already developed the burners and they have already developed the facilities so that we can uh, inject hydrogen into reheating furnaces also so this is a very good development but from where the hydrogen will come that is a big question so uh, today we feel that the hydrogen the best hydrogen route in india is uh, is not uh, the uh, uh, the green hydrogen but uh, this is the route what we have today that we can convert the brown hydrogen from coal uh, we have put up a plant fixed bed gasification plants in gas plant in uh, uh, in in angol plant in india where we convert coal into syn gas and syn gas is uh, used to produce uh, dri and uh, this uh, dri uh, is produced uh, uh, to a level of about 1.8 million ton per year uh, slowly gradually we will reach to about 2 million ton per year and uh, uh, the 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 gas the cost of gas uh, when we compare with the landed cost or delivered cost of natural gas in india so this gas is cheaper Uh, we are in a position to do at about uh, less than six dollars per mm BTU, uh, whereas the uh, domestic gas companies they supply gas about ten to twelve dollars per mm BTU, and the gas is not available. Pipeline is not available up to the plant. Uh, yes, of course, the pipeline for the domestic gas is available only for the domestic users, not for the industry. So uh, I think it will take a long time, maybe ten, fifteen years, to make the natural gas available to the steel industry. Uh, and it will take time and especially for the uh, dri manufacturing or uh, or for the power manufacturing power generation so uh, till that time the answer is uh, uh, you know something is better than uh, nothing uh, why to burn this coal into open furnaces let us uh, convert this coal into through a uh, either high high temperature mechanism through entrained flow or through uh, the low temperature a uh, fixed bed type uh, gasifiers based on lurgy technology and uh, entrained flow uh, there are many technologies in the world many suppliers in the world those who are uh, supplying this entrained flow uh, uh, gasification so the best is to produce uh, a syn gas having 58 to 60% of uh, hydrogen 28% carbon monoxide balances methane and uh, nitrogen and uh, we should utilize it making in dri into dri and simultaneously we should start thinking like paul worth has explained to us that how to utilize syn gas into uh, uh, blast furnaces so uh, we had been discussing with uh, paul worth about a month back and uh, they explained they gave the presentation then they are working very seriously uh, and thankful to the paul worth italian team uh, those who are working very Uh, uh, rigorously on this particular project, and I'm sure in times to come we'll be in a position to reduce cooking coal requirement at least by 10 to 15 percent if we inject hydrogen into uh, uh, the the blast furnaces. So uh, the answer uh, I feel today is uh, first of all I'm not averse to the idea of 100 percent hydrogen and hydrogen through the uh, green hydrogen through the solar. I mean that is the aim, and we should all try. to produce green hydrogen either through solar electrolysis and then water electrolysis method or through the uh, hydro power plants or through the nuclear power plants this is one the another is uh, wind energy and that is category 2 and then finally we should till that time till the world moves to the technology mature the technology to the final stage uh, with, with the technology which is already available in the country 
and many parts of the world that is making syngas and syngas with a with the enrichment of oxygen uh, we can definitely reach to a level about 65 to 68% of hydrogen and whereas the carbon monoxide we are about 20% so the moment we reach to this level uh, this is a better proposition uh, in the indian scenario indian context yes you're right by maybe by 2040 uh, the steel industry will graduate to reach to level of 100% hydrogen uses uh, but you know most of the Uh, most of the uh, uh, countries or most of the steel mills they are still installing the blast furnaces so these blast furnaces will continue for another 20 to 25 years time so when this 20 to 25 years time what they will do how will they convert the uh, uh, the 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 co2 uh, neutral uh, company it will be very difficult but there are three ways in it number one we should try to uh, make a uh, make it uh, 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 make it mandatory that at least 50% of the steel should be produced through the electric car furnaces number 2 we should try to uh, convert coal into syngas or coal into pure hydrogen and then finally we should use hydrogen into electric car furnaces as shroud gas we should try to use hydrogen for making dri we should try to use uh, uh, hydrogen as much as possible in blast furnaces and we should also try to use syngas for the reheating furnaces and for heat treatment furnaces and that is the answer for a country like india there are many, there are many countries in the world those who do not have the natural gas i think this is the only way that we can reduce the carbon footprint today on and average 2.4 ton per ton of co2 uh, that is per ton of uh, the 2.4 ton co2 per ton of steel uh, the steel industry is uh, is producing and uh, the best of the best industries in the country in the world sorry uh, that is 1.85 to 2 ton of co2 per ton of uh, uh, steel making i'm sure with the with the coal gasification having 60 to 65% of uh, hydrogen 20 to 28% of uh, carbon monoxide in terms of syngas uh, we can reduce to a level of the co2 to a level of 1.35 ton uh, per ton of uh, steel making and uh, if somebody is having uh, 50% hydrogen 50% blast furnace route and 50% uh, electric car furnace route through the syngas route then on an average uh, the company can can be in a bracket of 1.85 to 2 ton of co2 per ton of uh, uh, steel making i think that is the answer in my view coal is not a bad product coal is a very good product but the usage of coal has to be made environmental friendly and if we can we are successful in making uh, uh, coal as a environmental uh, friendly product then i think world will never ever have uh, a grudge or world will never ever have an enmity against coal people because the world largest resource are uh, are available in uh, 10 countries uh, you know all these countries where we have a lot of coal available many of the uh, many of the countries like like australia and uh, mongolia and also uh, colombia and uh, uh, russia and uh, finally united states they are still exporting cooking coal and this cooking coal consumption has to come down and this should come down by 50% if we want to make a green and environmental friendly atmosphere in the world so they they should be given a target that they will reduce their production the coal mining by 50% in next 5 years or maybe 7 years time the moment we start asking these countries to reduce the coal production that means the coal consumption will come down automatically the problem is not the consumption today the problem is the production if all these uh, good countries five five good countries those who produces maximum cooking coal if they are asked to to regulate or to throttle the coal mining then this is going to be the right right step in the right direction then only people will think how to inject more hydrogen uh, into uh, blast furnaces and how to utilize more and more syn gas for making power or generating power so if we generate power through the coal gasification route we can do the same in about 4 to 5 cents per unit which is a very uh, very economical uh, solution and then electric arc furnace will also be in a position to run very efficiently 
so uh, uh, the today's uh, summary is number 1 uh, the nuclear uh, solar wind hydro should be increased without any any objection without any problem number 2 the next is brown hydrogen we should try to do through the coal gasification in a very very protected atmosphere either through cbm route coal bed methane or through the underground coal gasification or through the above ground gasification but in a very closed and very scientific manner so that we do not burn coal in the open atmosphere then last but not the least all of the power plants especially in a country like india we produce uh, our requirement of electricity is met out at least 70% through the thermal power route all of these plants should be located on the pit heads in the coal mining area where the coal should be either converted into cbm or should be converted into uh, syn gas and then they should put a combined cycle power plant today the rankin cycle that is the the overall efficiency of power plant in terms of energy utilization that is hardly 32% and best of the best most efficient plant may reach to 35% but if you put up a combined cycle syn gas based power plant then the efficiency levels can be even up to 58 to 60% i was talking to somebody in ge and siemens they have devised the turbines where through the combined cycle route they can reach to overall efficiency of 58 to 60% so this is a very good development for each 1% of increase in efficiency means 2% reduction in the overall a uh, uh, co2 reduction from the world so you can imagine it is not only steel industry but is a power industry as well which has to go side by side and which has to align themselves in the overall drive of uh, prime minister's vision that we want to reduce the co2 emission as per the paris protocol and we must try to do so thank you so much wish you all the best anybody who is having a chance to visit our angul plant uh, which is in the east past east part of the country in odisha where we have the dri plant coupled with our coal gasification through ilurgi uh, technology and they are most welcome whether he or she please tell us we'll make the arrangement of your visit and you will love to uh, to see this plant it is a most beautiful plant environmental friendly plant and uh, this is a, a coal a fixed bed Uh, coal gasification technology at low temperature 650 degrees celsius and we inject uh, oxygen to increase the cv the overall calorific value uh, is 3400 kcal which is a very good gas it is already reformed and it is directly fed into midrex uh, uh, vertical uh, shaft kilns i'm thankful to midrex who has adopted this technology in 2010 and they conceived it i am also thankful to hyl hyl has further improvised uh, the technology they are also now offering such technology to the world including the technology with the uh, coal uh, uh, cog that is cocoan gas and syn gas together so this is a very good development in the interest of mankind and in the interest of world thank you once again wish you all the best thank you mr sharma thank you sharma sir for once again uh, uh, i would say a very encouraging uh, outlook on uh, the entire uh, hydrogen economy because most of us are of a wrong belief that whenever it comes you talk about coal it is like something blasphemous it is not let us uh, all are try and understand we have a country like india which has such huge resources of coal we cannot let it go to waste it has to be utilized and as you rightly mentioned it has to be realized it has to be utilized in a judicious manner in a judicious manner by treating uh, coal in such a way that we do not let the carbon footprint take over then you know if for example when we use steel uh, we cannot blame steel because it's corrodes there are so many things you can do to prevent corrosion of steel in a similar way there are so many uh, methodologies which are available to treat the coal to use the coal gas and uh, uh, to use it judiciously so let us not go it uh, an idea that any one who talks about coal is you know talking about something which is polluting the whole world there are ways and means we cannot remove once again we cannot remove the the blast furnaces all over uh, the world it, it is a huge capital uh, uh, intensive uh, 
investment when you put up a blast furnace. You can at the most what like what JSW did, replace the old blast furnace with a new one where the energy efficiency is much better, where you use PAC, pulverized coal injection, where you use so many energy efficient methods. So with that, Sharma Saab, once again, thank you for uh, taking the way forward and once again, taking the drive to make our power tariff rational. It has to be a one India, one tariff plan for the power sector, from the power sector, because power is what, which has to be made available throughout the country at the same cost. You cannot have a discrepancy when it comes to power. It is like a basic requirement, whether for the industry or whether for a domestic consumer. The, the requirement of power is essential for any industry or any household for that matter to survive. So it has to be rational. Thank you, Sarma Sahib, once again. So with that, we'll move on to Dr. Mukesh Kumar, uh, who has always been vocal on uh, efficient utilization of energy. And to take it forward, Dr. Mukesh Kumar uh, is someone who uh, really talks from the heart. And uh, I'm sure he's going to give us a straight roadmap how to go ahead. Over to you, Dr. Mukesh Kumar. Dr. Mukesh Kumar is the director of Steel Research and Technology Mission of India, which is uh, formulated under the AGs of Ministry of Steel, Government of India. And uh, Dr. Mukesh Kumar personally is involved in each of these projects. So Dr. Mukesh Kumar, over to you. Thank you, Mukherjee sir. And thank you very much for inviting me in this webinar and giving me this opportunity to share my views. And Sarmaji has already said, uh, told a lot of things about the decarbonization and hydrogen and other things, what roadmap India should have, what are the opportunities available here. I have made a small presentation I would like to share with all the people. But one thing before I start my presentation, I would like to say that these two words, decarbonization and use of hydrogen, should not be linked and should be read in isolation. Because decarbonization is one way we have to follow. It is inevitable, sir. Because whole, it is written in bold line that without decarbonization of a steel industry, we cannot move further, sir. But when we will use hydrogen, that is a question mark. So these two must be looked into differently, sir. And we have to see how both can be addressed, sir. So just I would like to share my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, just I want to say when we decarbonization and uh, we say use of hydrogen, from where this word has come? Because today, this is the hot word across the globe, people are talking about decarbonization, but most of the places it has been linked with hydrogen. And people think if we use hydrogen, then only it is a green steel. But World Steel Association also has told very clearly that instead of using word green steel or green steel with hydrogen, we should use word low carbon steel, sir. Because ultimate objective is decarbonization. And if we can produce, we can do decarbonization, so that is what is mentioned in the COP21 agreement ki that we have to reduce our emissions drastically so that global rise in temperature should remain below 2 degrees centigrade. Preferably, it is 1.5 degree. And for that, we have to strengthen our technological platform because technological intervention is must. People have taken, considered hydrogen as a roadmap, but whether hydrogen is the only route that we have to see. Throughout the world, people are working on other alternative technology also by using renewable energy and other things. Those also can lead to zero emission route if we are using renewable electricity. So if we see our overall global emissions, global emission is around 33.1 gigaton of carbon dioxide emission is there. And what Sarmaji has told, we are contributing around 7% globally. But in India, we our uh, CO2 emission in the steel sector from scope one is around 2.2 to 2.6 ton per ton of steel. <clears throat> and if we consider scope two also, scope two also add around 0.6 to 0.7. So we can say that the total emission scope one and scope two comes to around 2.9 to 3 ton. And with this, it means if you see the total India's uh, uh, CO2 emission 
is around 2.6 to 2.7 gigaton. And out of that, if around 300 million ton is contributed by steel sector, it means it is more than 10%. So it has a lot of impact and we have to see how best we can reduce our impact. So what are the challenges for available for India when we are considering our decarbonization sector in steel? Number one, the top most priority is ours is a developing country. Our per capita consumption is very low. It is going to, is only 74 and going to increase to 158 kg. And for 158 kg, we need steel production capacity around 300 million ton and finish steel requirement around 230 million ton. It means we have to make a big expansion from 140 million ton to around 300 million ton. That is two to and a half time. Whether any technology available with us, technologies are natural gas. Whether natural gas is available, natural gas is not available. Natural gas is very costly. Wherever plant have been put up based on the natural gas, it is producing around 15 to 20% higher cost than the BF and BF route. Can we continue with DRI, coal-based DRI? Coal-based DRI are small plants that cannot add large capacity. Say 500 tons per day, 400 tons per day like that. So that is also does not appear to be root. We have syn gas like JSPL has gone ahead with the syn gas. But the problem comes in the syn gas also is of the carbon dioxide emission. Because when we look into the carbon dioxide emission, uh, the carbon tot overall greenhouse gas emission in syn gas route, if we go with JSPL without any uh, carbon capturing, it may cross even blast furnace and BOF route also. So there also we have to see how best we can do it, sir. So the large opportunity available for us to grow and we have to grow, but we have to grow. But today, looking into technology available, we don't have any other technology other than blast furnace and basic oxygen furnace available and only route. That's why most of the expansion, whatever has been planned, they are planning with blast furnace and basic oxygen furnace. But in these things, we have to take care that enough provisions and enough measures are taken to decarbonize so that we should not continue like business as usual. And we have to reduce this thing. Lot of technological development has taken place in blast furnace and BOF also, like top recovery turbine is there, coke dry quenching is there, heat recoveries are there. So if we adopt even those things, around 15 to 20% reduction is possible by through those direct technological intervention only. So there are opportunities available here. Sir. Now, when government has made signed this Paris Agreement, and they told me we want to reduce our emission from 33 to 35, 35% emission intensity. We want to reduce at 2005 level. There was no specific commitment made for iron and steel sector. But as a consequence, Ministry of Steel has taken its, its own INDC. And they have given a target that let us see what is the target for primary sector, what should be the target for the secondary sector. And if we see from 2005 level in primary sector means BF, BF route, we told it was three in 2005, and we told by 2030, we will come to 2.2, 2.4. But whether 2.2, 2.4, whether it is in line with the sustainable development scenario, whatever has been projected by International Energy Agency, that we have to see because that is not meeting that criteria of two degree rise. So for two degree rise, we have to further tighten our belts. Similarly, on the secondary sector side also, there was in 2005, it was 3.2 and this was told to we'll reduce it to 2.6, 2.7. But in that sector also, if we don't shift from the coal-based uh, coal uh, DRI to other base DRI, then it is very, very difficult. Already we are still 2.8, 2.9. So up to 2020, we have achieved our target. But beyond that, journey is tough. So now let us see whether can industry decarbonize steel making. If you see globally, Globally, we are producing around 1865 million ton of steel. And if we consider even whatever projection, we are giving around 1.85 ton carbon dioxide per ton of steel as contribution. In my opinion, it is only scope one emission. It is not scope one and scope two. Because scope one and scope two, if we add together, it will further rise. Because a lot of electricity is being used by external sources only. So to limit this two degree temperature, we have to reduce our emission to drastically and as per the international energy estimate we should reduce it to around 50 500 million ton 
and to reach 500 million ton it means our total emission has to come down to around 0.2 ton per ton of steel against 2.5 to 2.6 which is in today so is it possible can we do a carbonization of this industry or what other alternatives are there with us so right now if we want to see this route uh, road map only hydrogen is a possibility hydrogen can resolve it but hydrogen is having other problems which we have to see how best we can do it now based on this thing scenario of 2 degree they told by 2025 india should come down to less than 1 point less than 2 means around 1.8 we should reach and globally we have to reduce emission by around 28% co2 so that we should remain in two so some countries are there like usa is there turkey is there in those countries because they are already shifting from carbon steel based to the scrap based because they are having lot of scrap available with them and that's why their emission level is getting reduced drastically because in electric arc furnace route emission is only around 0.5 ton against 2.2 to 2.5 ton in bf and bf route so china is also planning 30% capacity by scrap route other countries are also planning so globally it may be possible ki that we may reduce our drastic without even hydrogen also now there are uh, when we uh, world steel association was discussing with all the steel players they told if hydrogen is not right now available in immediate future so what are the available available so it is been projected ki that our demand may increase by more than around 20% by 2050 and if we have to do th then three ways are there by which we can decarbonize the industry the first step is ki that let us say technological intervention which are already proven and available with us like i have given you a number of examples of turbine uh, top gas recovery turbine dry quenching of the gas dry slag granulation heat recovery systems and utilization of the pellets in blast furnace utilization of the coke oven gas in blast furnace utilization of natural gas in dri and other things and reaching hydrogen by 3 to 4% all those routes are there those can reduce have a potential to reduce emission by 20 to 25% second is scrap based maximization presently if you see world across 30% of the production is by scrap based route only because out of 1865 around 550 million ton is produced by the scrap base so that also if we maximize to around 670% 80% because in time to come availability of the scrap is going to be increased because most of the countries are becoming old so recycling process will start we feel if we go with this scrap route another 20% reduction in the carbon can come by using of the scrap also if we can increase it to around 800 to 900 million ton scale then the balance 30% what we want to achieve around because we want to reduce emission by 80 to 90% then we have to see what technology changes are required like hydrogen is one of the route molten oxide electrolysis is also one of the route dc plasma arc furnace is also route but dc plasma arc furnace molten oxide electrolysis these can be able to reduce my emission only if we are using green gray green hydrogen if we are using brown hydrogen or we are using green hydrogen then it is not a answer so we have to see because india today if you see we are generating around 84 gigawatt of solar power we have target to reach around 175 gigawatt by 2025 and 450 gigawatt whatever honorable prime minister has told by this thing but how much power will be available for hydrogen route that we have to see because one thing you must see hydrogen has its own limitation but other technologies like carbon capturing is there carbon capturing and other things are there if we follow the route of carbon capturing yes we can see so i can in brief can say in short term scrap can play a important role because it can reduce my emission by 60 to 70% but in long term we have to see other technologies also now i am coming to the hydrogen because everybody is talking hydrogen whether hydrogen is still making what is the facts we have to realize that hydrogen reduction is a endothermic reaction it requires lot of external heat whether it is required for carrying out the reaction so what will be that external source of heat if we want to use hydrogen number 2 direct production of hot metal steel not possible we can produce only dri and then we require ef and ef again require power so what will be the source of the power theoretically 54 kg of hydrogen is required for producing one ton of steel but uh, taking into account efficiency and other things 
we feel around 80 to 90 kg of hydrogen is required. So for producing 1 million, one setting up 1 million ton steel plant based on hydrogen and what is the power required <coughs> for generating just hydrogen. So we have calculated and we found 450 megawatt of power is required for generating hydrogen only. Forget about the requirement for electric arc furnace and other things. Whether that much power can become for meeting the capacity of 100 million ton increase in capacity. When 1 million ton only require 450 megawatt of power station. <coughs> Technically feasible that we can produce, but it is an expensive option. Because today cost of hydrogen is very, very high. In some countries like Australia and other places, people are taking are talking 8 to $10. But in India, we are talking 4 to $6. Even if we talk 4 to $6, the cost will increase by around 40%. So how to compensate for that? So unless the cost comes down to less than uh, $2 or so, it, it looks very, very difficult. So each ton, if you see energy-wise, because I am giving you idea of 450 megawatt. So if you see each ton of coal-based steel requires about 6 megawatt of hour of energy. Scrap base requires one tenth of that. But if we go with hydrogen base, because hydrogen requires a lot of energy, so it is only around 4 to 4.5 megawatt hour energy is required. It means reduction is only possible. Around 20% reduction has taken place in energy requirement. Otherwise, total energy requirement is remaining same. So only what are the options available? We should increase the carbon tax and we should decrease the hydrogen price. If these two things can we do, then only in India, presently it looks hydrogen may be a feasible route. Because this is a normal flow seat which is being talked. And if I'm just uh, give for palletize making, you need fuel, which is unknown right now. For electric arc furnace, again, we require electricity, which is unknown. But even if just we consider, I have given you this thing, that solar, wind, and hydropower, if we use for reduction, it is also a huge requirement. So what is the, this thing? Hydrogen transition at this moment looks very, very challenging. It may take some time. And that's why we have to continue with other options available with us. So India is blessed with large reserves of high-grade iron ore and non-coking coal. Natural gas production may be an alternative, but domestically looking into present price and availability, it also does not look any scrap. A scrap base may be an alternative, but scrap is not available. Today, if you see, our consumption is only around 26 to 27 million ton of scrap. And in 26 to 27 million ton of scrap, around 6 million ton was imported last year. 5.5 million ton was imported last year. And before that, it was around 6.5. Although vehicle policy and other things are coming, it will give another 10 to 12 million ton. But looking into the focus, what other countries are giving on scrap-based production, global availability of the scrap is going to be reduced. And we cannot rely much on this thing. So what we feel, only carbon, uh, other options we have to adopt so that we can achieve decarbonization. What are those option options? Like all the off gases, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and whatever gases are there, we should capture those things and can be directly converted into ethanol. A $165 million project has already been started by ArcelorMittal. We are also going to start one project in Chandpur Ferroalloys plants. We are already considering for Bilai and Bokaro because if we go with some green hydrogen is available and if some green hydrogen can also be added into our capturing carbon dioxide, then 100% carbon can be converted into ethanol and so that 100% carbon decarbonization is taking place in this process. So this ethanol is one of route. Methanol is also another route. Another technology is like I mentioned dry slag granulation. We should start producing electricity from this. This also will give me a lot of credit. So what I feel, technology interventions are must. A lot of technologies are available. Just we should not think hydrogen will be the only solution. Whatever technologies and other carbon capturing may be looking a very, very attractive route for Indian positions, and we must follow that thing. Too. So if we minimize our energy use and switch to cleaner fuels, that will reduce our CO2. We should not use off gases for generating power, as Sarmaji has told. Efficiency is very, very low. We should use for making methanol, ethanol, and other things so that we can get better efficiency. And we should purchase more and more renewable power instead of producing coal-based power in our plants. If we follow these things, yes, there we can reach towards carbon neutrality. And thank you very much. These are my small things. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mokesh Kumarji. Uh, once again, you showed uh, an alternate route forward. Uh, 
एंड एज जैसे हमारा कहावत ही है डोंट पुट ऑल योर एग्ज इन वन बास्केट सो वी कैन नॉट अफोर्ड टू पुट ऑल आर एग्ज इन वन बास्केट वी कैन नॉट इवन से दैट वी विल नेवर अगेन इंस्टॉल अ सिंगल ब्लास्ट फर्नेस इन दिस कंट्री वी आर गोइंग टू हैव हंड्रेड परसेंट डी आर आई ऐसा भी बोल नहीं सकते सो इट हैज टू बी अ मिक्स एंड मैच ऑफ एवरीथिंग टूगेदर दैट इज द एसेंस ऑफ अ कंट्री लाइक इंडिया वेर द डिमांड इज ह्यूज the resources are uh, varying at times we can afford huge resources for example in a time that we are in right now where uh, the cash flow is very good the industry is making money we can afford to go in for good capex but at the same time this is a country where almost half the production comes from what we call the mini steel plants which earlier we used to call as secondary producers now ministry of steel has issued a circular saying that you cannot categorize them as secondary or primary producers so we call them the mini steel plants these mini plants are also a numerous it's a huge number of smaller plants are there so it has to be a mix and match of all the technologies together and uh, as of today as you rightly said cost of producing hydrogen is still very very high uh, the i keep saying that when initially the uh, the mobiles came into india for every outgoing we had to pay money incoming also we had to pay money gradually today we have come to a stage where if you pay a little amount of money you have unlimited incoming and outgoing for the whole month so technology as it uh, progresses it will bring down cost but as you rightly said it is going to take time so we have alternate avenues available to utilize it. and thank you dr mukesh kumar and i'm sure uh, you know your suggestions will also uh, be taken up by uh, mantri ji ne aaj khud ka the honorable minister himself said that please send me a report of what is discussed today so dr mukesh kumar i will share with you my uh, uh, compilation of this so that if you could also take it up because you are closer uh, than me to the minister's office so you can take it up with the minister's office and see if we can uh, take it up with other bodies like niti ayog with uh, uh, you know uh, let's say uh, the uh, energy uh, agencies yeah. and uh, take it up with the international agencies as well where we look at avenues and uh, our next speaker since uh, uh, paranjit is uh, still not free from secretary's meeting so the next speaker will be my good friend yakim who is passionate about uh when you talk about decarbonization and uh, I, you know using the hydrogen economy he is passionate about it and uh, if you know i i track him on uh, social media sites and see how active he is in pursuing this uh, just the other day someone recommended that if you want a good speaker it should be dr yoga so i said no no he has already confirmed we say then the uh, gentleman wrote saying it's not a surprise because everyone in the world of decarbonization i would say knows him quite well so uh, dr mukesh kumar with your permission i'll move on to Thank our you. next speaker dr yakim vonchili dr yakim vonchili is the director global commercialization from linde technology uh, in linde he had spent quite some time in india so he was there in my city calcutta for quite some time so he knows he knows india better than uh, the back of his hand so over to you yakim to take uh, the uh, session forward thank you so much nimala a great pleasure to be here and uh, you know i still count myself as kalkotian you know even if i haven't lived for 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 five years now so great this is really an interesting topic and i will try to flip through a couple of slides together with you to give some some of the views uh, here uh, i will move these slides quite fast because we have limited amount of time uh, for it but I'll, i'll take take you through and i hope that you can can now be able to see my 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 screen here so we we talk about the decarbonization and the use stepwise use of hydrogen in iron and steel making and what is important of course to to be aware of that is that going all the way into hydrogen 
that is to go into something that is rather expensive today because production of green hydrogen depends on the electricity prices. And in many places that constitutes say two thirds of the cost to produce, produce electricity. We need green, green uh, electricity, green power to make green hydrogen. But we hope that in the future we can come to a situation at least where, where we talk about $2 uh, per kilograms of, of, uh, of uh, hydrogen. However, that still is the equal to $15 per, per gigajoule. So, you know, it's they, still rather expensive. So we have to be clever of how we apply it. Of course, there are some places where you can get cheaper using, using uh, solar power and so on. Uh, so, so that's great. However, Already today, we have possibilities to reduce CO2 emissions by 10 to 15 percent without increasing the, the cost and, 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 and without using hydrogen even and having that on, on as, a, as a cost neutral and, and no cost penalty. And uh, I think there are a number of examples around the, the, the blast furnaces by using stove oxygen enrichment, by, by injecting low carbon injectants by gasifications of injectants, for example, and ultimately uh, injecting hydrogen into the blast furnace. And as we have been working a lot with, has been in combustion space with ladle preheating, with, where we can use hydrogen going forward, electric arc furnaces, uh, having a good chemical package there using clever, for example, biomass fuels there. And again, ladle preheating, so of course, around there. And not at least in the steel reheating area where we worked a lot over the years, but there are great opportunities to reduce the, the, the carbon footprint already today. Because when we, when we make the processes more energy efficient, we are saving carbon footprint, but we are also we are also decreasing the need for hydrogen the day when we start facing in hydrogen. And one thing to remember here also is the importance to use the internal gases if you're in, in an integrated steel mill. And I, all, I always like to emphasize the example that you can have a very good combustion with a low calorific fuel if you use oxygen. So if you take blast furnace gas together with oxygen, it's actually the same as taking natural gas and combust it with air. In the I mentioned the stove oxygen enrichment. I think this is a great opportunity to save, save carbon footprint and redistribute the energy balance of, of an integrated steel mill. And, and that can, can be done to, to, to save a top up of a natural gas or coke oven gas. You can, re, you can run the hot stoves on, on solely on, on blast furnace gas and use the coke oven gas for, for other purposes. Altogether, you can get a positive effect on the carbon footprint. And there is a possibility to go further into something called flow gas recirculation, that, where we can reduce the, the carbon footprint further by using flameless combustion in the stoves. What we have been working with lately to a large extent is here in that, this space is called hot oxygen technology, which is a way to do a gasification with, with the very hot oxygen stream, 1650 Celsius, which creates an atomization of kind of any type of material. And this we can then use with feedstocks like biomass, uh, municipal solid waste, any type of waste and so on. And, and we can do partial oxidation to create a syngas, for example, out of this, which then can be applied uh, as a low carbon footprint injectant into the blast furnace and in that way replace coke or replace co uh, PCI also. The, this could be a, quite an interesting alternative to apply directly here. And this can be combined, of course, also when into DRI production. And we can use coke oven gas to, to, to produce DRI with, with this type of partial oxidation system. You know, uh, coke oven gas typically contains more than half. More than half of the coke oven gas is, is actually hydrogen. And, and so, so we are taking a good step with this type of technology, combining and integrating uh, a, 
DRI process into our plants. Now, quickly over to, to electric arc furnaces. We've been working with the core jet technology now within Linda Praxe for 25 years. We had 25 years anniversary, done 170 installations worldwide of, of that. And this technology you may be heard of is a flame shrouding, which makes it possible to have, have fixed wall mounted injectors in, in the electric arc furnace, shutting all the doors and getting getting the energy exactly where we want it in the cold spots, having the oxygen penetrating the, the bath and, and getting, getting the most optimized way of running an electric arc furnace. And with this, where we <clears throat> have both the, the, the burner, the post combustion and, and uh, oxygen injection, and, and for that sake, uh, coal injection, if you want, combined into one device, we have been working with many different types of fuels over the years, natural gas, LPG, coke oven gas, and oils. And now recently we've been work, start working with hydrogen and that has gone extremely well. And we could see that, that using hydrogen, we are using the ideal fuel for, the, for, for this purpose. With that, we can produce the longest injection jets. We have the best, best performance of this equipment, much better than, than natural gas or any, anything else. So we see a great future using hydrogen there as well, not only from the important carbon footprint perspective, but also related to better operation. When we look at ladle preheaters, we have been doing more than 200 installations using flameless oxy fuel across the world. And we have been saving huge amounts of, of fuel, typically 50% of the fuel consumption, halving the fuel consumption at ladle preheating. This is, of course, not the biggest spot in, 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 a, in a steel mill, but it is important. It adds up. There is a number of ladle preheating stations, and they, they run more or less all the time. So with that, we can have reduced the carbon footprint nicely, get the more uniform uh, uh, heating of the ladles and also to a higher temperatures. And we now can take this further, if we like, and, and, and introduce the use of hydrogen as a fuel, which means that we can go from 100% to 50% in the first step, and then with hydrogen down to 0% uh, carbon emissions. Then the last piece I wanted to address here quickly is the, the reheat furnaces. We have what the solutions portfolio we call Rebox, which we have been working with for a couple of decades now. We have more than 180 installations worldwide, which has been used then for increased capacity, but to, but to a large extent to fuel savings. And, and, and fuel savings meaning CO2 reduction reduction of CO2 emissions. And this has been by up to 50%. Again, possibility to use hydrogen, and I will show you that. So we de developed our burners from going with 100% oxygen and natural gas 100 and 100% oxygen and LPG, creating a flameless combustion. You see the photograph to the left is from a, from a furnace uh, for, for, uh, for uh, round billets at ArcelorMittal. And then we take that further in our labs into using hydrogen instead of fuel. And we could see that we could manage in this development path to get the flameless oxy fuel combustion with 100% hydrogen as fuel. And this we then took further through a, a set of pilot tests in smaller scale, like 10, 20 kilograms with different steel companies. We worked together with a lot of them into a full scale testing a year ago. That was with, with uh, the Swedish steel company Ovaco, Sweden based steel company Ovaco, and they are producing ball bearing steels. And we did full scale testing there, 25 tons of ball bearing steels were heated with the flameless oxy fuel using 100% hydrogen as, as fuel. And so this was a very, very important breakthrough, the first in the world of its kind. And we had the results were very thoroughly evaluated by, by Ovaco. They checked all the parameters and that including scaling, decarbonizing and, and, and all these kind of things. All parameters were fulfilled. They were very happy with the results. You can see the statement from the, from the CTO of Ovaco here in the picture. And actually these 25 tons 
of ball bearing steels were taken to Ovacus customers. And so they've been out there for a year now and, and doing great. So we could prove that not only we could do full flame as oxy fuel that we've done for a couple of decades, reducing the, the fuel consumption and the carbon footprint, but we could also do this in full scale using hydrogen as a fuel without having any negative impact on the steel material. And you know, ball bearing steel, rather sensitive material. So that this is very, very good news. So we are very optimistic about the abilities to support our customers going forward with a stepwise decarbonization, first increasing the fuel efficiency, and reducing the carbon footprint there. And then go to the next step using hydrogen. And you might know that Linda is the world's largest supplier of, of hydrogen, actually. So I stopped there. Thank you very much. Sorry to rush through very quickly. And uh, I hope you, you could pick some, some of the points at least. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, any questions, please. Uh, so thank you, uh, Joachim, once again. So any questions for Dr. Joachim? Uh, Ankit, can you check if there are any questions in the Q&A section or in the chat? Uh, no, no questions yet. Okay. I think one question was there, which Mr. V. S. Sharma has already Yeah, he has answered. already answered. He has already answered. Okay. So, Joachim, I have uh, just one question to ask you, though it is yes. not related to your presentation. Are you still in Germany or are you back in China? No, no, I'm, I'm still in Germany. I'm still in Germany. Okay, good. <laughs> we, we, uh, still, we, we finally got some sunshine also in Germany, I can say, after a lot of rain. <laughs> yes. Yeah, after yes. But I, 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 I hope I can come back to India soon as well, my friend. Yes. Yes, yes. Looking forward to, yeah, because okay. you, you are more of a Calcutta than I am, that is for sure. <laughs> uh, thank you, Joachim. Thank you once again. Thank and, you so uh, much. My pleasure. Uh, I, yeah, so it is... Uh, for everyone's knowledge that Linde is the world's largest supplier of hydrogen, not just oxygen. So he was, uh, though if you know, he was there for our last oxygen uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the work which Linde has done along with the steel producers of this country is remarkable. So let's uh, put our hands together in thanking uh, Linde for uh, providing us oxygen during this period of pandemic. So. Uh, with that, and I, and I, 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 would, I would like to say that a big thank you to all our colleagues over the world, because when India was under such pressure, the whole Linda that is present in 100 countries, we were, we were trucking in, uh, in different ways, oxygen from many, many neighboring countries in the Middle East and across Asia to, to, to help India. So we, I, I was very happy and proud of our company that we, we could show this effort, uh, really, and, and help the Indian people. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Joachim. Uh, Ankit, a uh, special word of thanks in German for Joachim. Yeah, uh, vielen Dank, Herr Joachim, for the uh, super presentation. Okay, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> okay, uh, so with that, uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, that is Professor Suddha Sattu Basu, has he joined? He said he'll join by 5.30. Is he there already, Ankit? No, there? I was just checking actually if he's in the attendees, but he's also not there. So I think uh, he will take a little more time to join. Okay. So then we'll move on to uh, Mr. Sachin Kumar, who is a senior fellow and uh, area convener for industrial energy efficiency at uh, Terry, which is the Energy Research Institute. So over to you, Sachin Ji. The floor is Good evening, yours. sir. Good evening, sir. And thank you so much for uh, inviting me. And I am from the Energy and Resources Institute, which is headquartered at New Delhi. And we have offices across different parts of the country. And over the last few years, we have been working very closely on decarbonization subject with the large industries, especially the steel sector. And we have come out with some reports for the steel sector and also on the use of hydrogen. And I will be using some slides, if you allow me to uh, put up my PPG. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I hope the PPT is visible. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. And I will be talking very briefly on transition towards low carbon steel manufacturing in the country. And as we all know that in India, we have different type of uh, steel production routes and we are 
very unique in having the coal based direct uh, reduction route which you have mentioned about the mini steel plant that we call now and earlier the secondary steel sector and these plants are basically catering to the demands of the steel in some specific location and different parts of the country but if we see overall the iron and steel sector then it is one of the largest energy consuming industry subsector in the country consuming more than 20% of the overall energy consumption by the industry sector. So any intervention when we talk about in the iron and steel sector it will have implication over the overall industry sector in the country and overall economy of the country. And I am aware of the fact that uh, over the years, the Indian steel plants have uh, reduced their energy consumption, the specific energy consumption, but still a lot of work has to be done. This slide is a bit dated, but it actually gives uh, out the fact that still a lot of work has to be done. I know that under the PAT scheme, many steel plants have uh, improved their energy efficiency, the specific energy consumption, but still there are many plants which are operating at the world best level in terms of energy consumption, but still a lot of work has to be done in this domain. And we have analyzed in another report towards the low carbon steel sector, which was released by Honorable uh, Minister of Steel last year. And we have tried to find out that the uh, steel demand in the country will grow substantially over the next uh, few decades. I think in the national steel policy also, as Dr. Mukesh uh, Kumar has mentioned, that it will be around 300 million ton by 2030, and we have uh, analyzed that it will be around 500 million ton by 2050. And we have to, if we have to reduce this demand, then we have to come out with some uh, measures like resource efficiency improvement, especially to the material circularity, like we can use high strength steel in the building and infrastructure. We can use uh, some behavioral changes like uh, more use of ride sharing in the cities. And by these measures and improving energy efficiency, we can reduce the demand of the steel by 25%, up to 25% by 2050. And this is a huge number when we consider the uh, total steel production in the country. And apart from uh, reducing demand by resource efficiency measures, if we are able to adopt the best available technologies which are available globally and which has already been proven by the steel fraternity globally, we can reduce the overall energy consumption in the steel sector in the country. And if we are able to reduce our specific energy consumption for the BFBF route, say from around 6.5 right now to somewhere around five or less than that, or for the DRI process from seven to somewhere around again to five or even less than that, then we can, uh, reduce the energy consumption in the steel sector by a substantial margin over the coming decades. And again, in the baseline scenario, we have already considered the impact of the PAT scheme. So this is beyond the PAT scheme. And this is all about the energy efficiency improvement in the existing plant. But if we have to go out with the steel sector in which we are envisaging new steel capacity in the country by 2030 and by 2050, then we have to think of the new technologies or the new technological development that is happening in the steel sector. And what are the available options with us? So one option is that we go with the carbon-based route, the carbon-based route which is being championed by the Tata Steel in uh, Europe in the form of the high Hyserna technology, a smelting reduction process, which basically says that we can reduce the 20% emission as compared to the existing processes. And if we are able to integrate the Hyserna technology with uh, the carbon capture and uh, utilization process, then we can reduce the emission by 80%. Although in terms of the carbon capture, utilization and storage aspect, a lot of work has to be done to understand this aspect in the Indian context because uh, not many studies have been undertaken on this aspect in India. And this is a niche area which needs to be explored more if we have to use this smelting reduction route for uh, the decarbonization of the steel sector. And another option is that we have the uh, hydrogen-based route, which is talked about the lot of work and a lot of uh, discussion is going around the hybrid route, which is being uh, demonstrated and piloted in Sweden. And again, this route says that we can able to reduce the uh, CO2 emission from this route by 94% if we are able to supply the low carbon hydrogen, uh, low carbon uh, uh, electricity and uh, green hydrogen to the hybrid route. So this is again, one of the options which can be considered, but I go by what Dr. Mukesh Kumar has said earlier and Dr. V and Mr. V. R. Sharma has mentioned that in India, which is rich in the coal and we can use alternate route, which is basically through the use of seam gas. So that is one of the options that we can explore. But some of the options which are, uh, I would say, which are uh, 
uh, applicable for the Indian steel sector over the coming few decades is that like in 2020s, in this decade, we can focus more on improving the energy efficiency of our existing plants. We can improve the resource efficiency. We can focus more on the domestic scrap. As the Honorable Minister has mentioned that the government of India has focused on uh, increasing the scrap availability in the country by different policy measures. So this is one of the route which the Indian steel fraternity would like to use. And I think by 2030s or maybe before then that, the Tata Steel will be able to come out with the uh, full-scale demonstration plant on the full-scale plant on the commercial plant on the Hessena technology. And this technology will be available for adoption by the new BF BF fruit plants which are coming out in India. And I think from uh, 2030 onwards, if you are able to get more insight or more understanding on the carbon capture, utilization and storage aspects, then that will be a boom from the steel sector wherein they can use this technology for the new steel plants. And from 2040 onwards, we can think of using hydrogen. I think Dr. Mukesh, has, uh, Mukesh Kumar has rightly mentioned that there is still a time for the hydrogen to come at a full scale in India. And, I, and we are also hoping in our analysis that by 2040, we are able to get hold of uh, hydrogen in the steel sector by using in the blast furnace or maybe using hydrogen based GRI for the new capacities to be built in the country. And I think some of the uh, results which we have analyzed, we have found out that if we go on in the baseline scenario, then our CO2 emission will be somewhere around little more than 800 million ton by 2050. But if we are able to uh, improve our energy efficiency aspects, adoption of best available technologies, then we can reduce the CO2 emission by somewhere around 15%. But again, if we are able to uh, include the resource efficiency measures also in our production aspect and in our steel usage aspect, then we can further reduce the CO2 emission by 35%. And as I said, we are trying to we have tried to analyze that we are able to integrate the hydrogen use in the Indian steel uh, sector by 2040. Then we can reduce the emission further by 2050. But in an other optimistic scenario, I would say because the government of India is giving a lot of emphasis now on hydrogen and a lot of discussions are going on. And we are aware that the Niti Aayog and the Ministry of MNRE, even the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, they are taking interest and they are coming out with different initiatives for the different uh, sectors, industry sector to use hydrogen. So if by chance we are able to, or if in, log, uh, in likelihood, if the government which is uh, pursuing the hydrogen in a big way, if we are able to introduce the hydrogen in the steel sector by 2030, then we can think of uh, reducing a substantial portion of the CO2 emission from uh, the steel sector by 2050. So we will be somewhere near zero around 2050 where if, if we are able to introduce hydrogen a bit early. And why we are saying so, because in another report that we have come out uh, uh, late last year, and on the on the potential role of hydrogen in India, and we have envisaged that by 2050 we will be having a demand of hydrogen will be somewhere around 30 million ton, and major chunk of this demand will be from the steel sector. So this is one of the uh, analysis that has been come out that around 9 million ton of hydrogen will be required purely by the steel sector in the country by 2050. So this is one of the sector which will be using hydrogen to a great extent, apart from the existing sector like ammonia or uh, the refinery sector. But I think there is a word of uh, caution that is required for use of hydrogen because uh, in this graph, we have just tried to show that even uh, as Dr. Mukesh Umar has mentioned that the cost of green hydrogen today is very high. It is more than $5 uh, per kg, but uh, if you are able to reduce the cost of hydrogen, green hydrogen, say up to two to three dollar per kg, then it will be able to compete with the BF BF root. And although in this graph you may see that uh, the BF BF root, coke based BF BF root, it is still economical than the natural gas based root because of the high cost of natural gas in the country. But again, the hydrogen will be competitive, uh, competitive if the cost is between two to three dollar per kg. But again, it will be. Uh, it will not be able to compete with the BF BF root. Even the price of hydrogen goes down to $1 per kg. So what we need actually is some sort of the policy push to support use of hydrogen by the steel fraternity because otherwise it won't become uh, economical. So this is a very broad analysis and it can be refined further, it can be used, but this gives a broad sense that to use hydrogen in the steel sector, we still need some sort of the policy support and the policy measures, which we have come out another report which basically analyzed the techno-economical aspect of the green steel uh, production using hydrogen in the country. And we have analyzed 
the DRI sector, this report is also available in the public domain. But what I want to focus upon is that we need some policy support, both from the supply side as well as from the demand side. Like uh, Mr. V.R. Sharma said, initially that we used to, uh, in India, we used to more use more of the natural gas or the syn gas, although natural gas is still not available and the price is very high and it has to be come down to dollar uh, six to eight uh, per ton, then it will be more uh, uh, usable by the steel fraternity. And if we have to use hydrogen, then like the hy hybrid plant is being built in Sweden, demonstrated in Sweden, we in India also need some sort of a demonstration plant so that the entrepreneur or the different steel plant, they have the confidence, they have the faith that this technology is feasible in the Indian condition. Although globally, the steel is a global industry and uh, the global players are already in India, but still a plant in India working in Indian condition that gives a lot of faith and the confidence to the industry. So there is a need to, uh, from the policy side, to have a demonstration plant uh, in the field. And I was uh, uh, present in a work sort of a webinar day before yesterday and uh, which was organized by the Bureau of Energy Efficiency and uh, there, uh, Mr. Abhay Bakre, who was the Director General of uh, BE, he has openly said if, if any plant is interested in uh, not even uh, piloting, but even for the trial of hydrogen and they have the financial resources and they can approach BEE to get the financial help for the trial basis. So my whole idea of saying is that the government is there to support, but it needs uh, the cooperation from the both sides, the entrepreneur willingness, as well as the policy support. And as I said, apart from demonstration plant, what we also need is some sort of a large scale green financial support to the industry to uh, switch over to the use of uh, hydrogen for uh, steel making. And I think a lot of word is going on and the discussion is going on on the uh, penalty or the carbon border tax by the European Union. And if we have to support uh, the use of hydrogen for the steel sector, then we might have to uh, discuss about the emission penalty on production. Right now, we only have the targets under the Perform Achievement Trade Scheme or B for the energy consumption. So might be in future, there might be targets on the carbon emission from the different industry subsector. So I'm not sure, but that may be one of the possible ways. And uh, we have also have to support the small scale plant, as I said, India is unique in having coal-based DRI route, so they need support, more, uh, both financial as well as the technical support to switch over or to graduate to better technological options. But apart from the supply side uh, measure, we also need from uh, the demand side, we also need, we need to develop the standard for the green products, which can be used by different end use sectors, automobiles, building. So they need some green product standard. We also can have some sort of a corporate buyer club where they can come together and demand the green product so that the demand for this product is increased and it will give a confidence to the steel producer to go ahead and use better technologies to produce low carbon steel so that can be demanded because that has a demand in the market. And some same sort of uh, uh, method can be used for the public procurement. We can think of having some sort of uh, public procurement of the steel on the basis of the low carbon steel. So these are some of the policy recommendations and we are also coming out with the steel roadmap in the near future. And uh, we will be happy to share that with you. So this is all from my side, sir. Mr. Mukherjee, thank you so much. Thank you so Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sachin Kumarji. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, I would say you are quite in tune what Dr. Mukesh Kumar and Mr. Vyar Sharma said uh, that, you know, the best, uh, as of now, uh, the optimum uh, solution we can derive is from mix and match till you are in a position to reach your benchmark level of about $1 cost per ton of producing hydrogen. So that is an ideal situation. Once we come to that situation, perhaps we will move towards 100% hydrogen economy. Till such time, mix and match is a solution. So thank you once again. Uh, and we are all aware of uh, the kind of work which uh, the recent uh, the Energy Research Institute, Terry has done, has been doing, and uh, it is a body which commands national uh, respect for all the work that you have done over the years. So with that, we'll move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker for the day uh, is Mr. Shibu John, who is the Vice President, Strategy and Business Development in Prime Metals. And uh, I think uh, in your presentation also, there was a reference to Prime Metals in the work that you have done. So uh, I'll now put you over to Mr. Shibu John, who's 
Vice President, Strategy and Business Development for Upstream Business at Primetals Technologies, which is based out of Linz, uh, one of my favorite cities in Austria. Definitely a, a, a location where uh, the Vost Alpine plant is located right next to uh, the headquarters uh, or the center of competence, not the headquarters. The headquarters of Prime Metals is of course London, but the center of competence is based out of Linz. And uh, Mr. Shibu John will take us through what solutions Prime Metals can offer. Over to you, Mr. Shibu John. You are muted, uh, Mr. John. Uh, hello, hello to everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Can you can you see my screen or just a quick yes, check? Uh, yes, of course. Okay, Absolutely. fine. So good. Uh, the, thanks, uh, Steel and Metallurgy, uh, Ankit and Mr. Mukherjee for the invitation to me to join this uh, webinar. Uh, I was quite pleased in the last webinar. We gave I gave a quite a detailed overview of the decarbonization strategy. And as we discussed today, uh, as Dr. Mukesh Kumar also said, I would like to maybe separate the decarbonization and the usage of hydrogen. So more I'll be talking on the usage of hydrogen being the key topic for the decarbonization, uh, all the interim measures, the, the long-term measures, the carbon capture, the carbon capture utilization, I would suggest to look at the webinar which was hosted previously by you. So taking this forward, uh, uh, I would like to share the presentation. Okay, just to give you the overall view of, the, uh, of where we are as Prime Metals Technologies, sorry. So as, at Primates Technologies, we, we have all the portfolios for the technologies for the iron making, be it the carbon base, be it the pelletizing, sintering, blast furnace, Corex, Phoenix, converter, we do the whole, whole lot of technologies. And when we look at the, the natural gas hydrogen-based technology, so I separate it into two categories, using the low grade and the high grade. First on the high grade is very clear, it's on the pelletizing DR plant. Uh, and then to the EF, or we also had a technology called Fino Red, which was two plants was built in the world in 90s. This was already using hydrogen up to 78, 75% in the past, and also the scrap coming directly from EF. In the Indian context, more relevant would be the medium grade or the lower grade ore, which we believe will also need the DR route, and then followed by a two step process, which is a melter and a BOF. Melter, melter and a beer. So, so, so these are the, tech, the pathways for decarbonization. There are a lot of pathways, intermediate pathways in terms of the usage of HBI, usage of hydrogen, increasing the scrap rate in the converter, looking at, uh, looking at a pre-melter, a melter uh, to, to use the scrap, a CO2 capture sequestration for a blast furnace. There are a lot of intermediate steps, but I don't want to go into the detail of that today. I would rather focus on the hydrogen topic today. So looking at the overall uh, the emissions reduction intensity target. So last time I explained on the total global emission, but looking at the intensity target globally, uh, the, the iron and steel uh, industry has to come down the emission intensity target from uh, two ton of CO2 per ton of liquid steel to roughly around 0.8. And when we talk of 0.8, here we are talking of direct and indirect emissions. And everybody knows the steel sector is hard to abate, so it is not expected to be carbon neutral, it is, sub, it is expected to lower the carbon intensity to the maximum possible. So it's expected that a 60% reduction is required. This is based on the STS scenario, which says that the carbon neutrality is, is still far away. It's not at 2050, but it is at 2070, which is a two, two degree scenario. And if you look at the Indian scenario, which is on the right-hand side, so we can see that the intensity today is 2.5, which is scope one and two has to come down to roughly around 1.1, which is a 155% reduction. So just to give a perspective, globally, more than 10%, it is roughly 11% if you take the scope one and two, the, the direct and indirect emissions combined is more than 11% globally. In India, it's roughly 9.5%. So one of the key thing is what I have seen is we need to set, India need to set very ambitious em emission intensity target. As it was told in the past, uh, the, the steel ministry has targeted a 2.4 ton of uh, CO2 per ton of liquid steel by 2030, which we believe is quite conservative. This need to be revised to meet the climate ambition goals of India and, and the world. 
to a more uh, more ambitious figure. And just to give you an example, uh, uh, I have seen that JSW has uh, uh, declared they would like to be 1.95 by 2030. So we need to look at what is the government's target of the emission intensity, and then the steel industry will certainly follow to meet those targets. So first, the targets has to be set. So this is some one message which uh, which which I would like to give here. Just a minute, my screen is not moving. Okay, just looking at uh, the emission intensities in three different routes, the blast furnace, natural gas, natural gas based and the green hydrogen based. If you look at the scenario in 2019, this is based on the Indian, uh, the uh, carbon intensity from the grid, which is 698. We are emitting almost two. And if we try to bring in more renewables and try to bring low intensity from the uh, from the power, uh, the CO2, which is emitted from the grid. So we can we still stay at around 1.9 on the blast furnace route. If you look at the natural gas based, it goes to 581 in the future. Today, it is around 927, which is already 55 to 70% reduction from the blast furnace route. And if you look at the DRIEF route, which is based on green hydrogen, in this case, green hydrogen means that the the carbon intensity from the power is zero. If we use green hydrogen, whichever form it is, uh, and if you use 80, 20% scrap, so we can come down to 187 kg of CO2 per ton of liquid steel. So this is the final goal where we can achieve, which means that we can reduce by almost 90%. But on today's intensity of 698, even if we get green hydrogen, if we power the electric arc furnace with the grid electricity, we are still at 600 kg of CO2. So the goal is we need to have for the hydrogen society to be to be to realize more and more grid to be renewable. Renewable means green, absolutely green. If there is carbon emitted due to due to production of hydrogen, it is not uh, green more. It will be more more high. Last time I presented, if the CO if the hydrogen based GRI is made based on the existing grid, it will be more than the blast furnace emission. And uh, as Sachin has just said, uh, we did a joint study with uh, Terry, Siemens, and Prime Metals to look at the green steel to direct reduction. What are the implications for the Indian Indian industry, Indian steel industry? So this is available on the Terry website. So it's for everybody to have a look. It gives a quite a holistic, a detailed view into the different effects of using the hydrogen in terms of consumption, in terms of capex, in terms of opex. So please have a look at this report. It gives a very very comprehensive view on this. And now today I will focus on two different cases. Uh, first case uh, is the injection of hydrogen into blast furnace. And the second case is using low carbon hydrogen for direct reduction. And well, why I picked up these two cases, these are the two cases which has the maximum impact. Of course, uh, uh, like Linda has said, you can use hydrogen on the reheating furnace, you can use for the burners, you can use a number of applications. But I picked up these two, which has the maximum impact on the steel industry. Okay, so if I look at the steel industry, uh, sorry, if I look at the, the, the blast furnace, so uh, last time there was a question from, uh, from the audience uh, on the use of hydrogen in the, in the blast furnace. So what I tried to put here that, what happens if you try to use hydrogen? So there is a scenario here, if we inject 25 kg of hydrogen per ton of hot metal, there is a reduction of roughly around 14 to 15% on the CO2 intensity. The maximum which we can inject is 40 kg of hydrogen per ton of hot metal. Theoretically, it is not tested. This is the maximum which is possible. And then we have a reduction of roughly around 20%. The maximum which we can use is 40 kg per ton and 20% reduction. What happens in the process is as we use more and more hydrogen, the PCI is coming down. So if you can see from here, the PCI dropped from 150 to 100. And when we are at 40, it is almost zero, but the coke rate has gone up. The oxygen has gone up to provide the additional heat because as you inject hydrogen being endothermic, you need to bring in additional heat. So this is also coming from the, the oxygen. And what it implies is if you inject 25 kg of hydrogen, you require a hydrogen generation for a 2.5 million ton blast furnace, for example, of 380 megawatt of electricity, electrolysis capacity. And if you inject 40 kg of hydrogen, we require around 600 megawatt of electrolysis capacity. 
So this could be a interim solution, but this is not the final solution for deep carbonization. The blast furnaces which are looking at hydrogen injection can maximum look at 40 kg. Beyond that, there are issues with the top gas temperature and the other, other blast furnace conditions. This is the, based on the modeling. The actual injection is done, tested right now in, by Thyssen Kuru for one of the two years. So it's expected that they are going to test for all the two years for, for Blast Furnace 9 in Duisburg in Germany uh, in 2022, and then we know exactly the effect. But this is the effect on using hydrogen in the Blast Furnace. The second scenario I would like to talk is the use of hydrogen in direct reduction. Today, the natural gas base already uses 55% uh, hydrogen in the natural gas, which is already available, which reduces almost 60%. In the future, 100% hydrogen can be used. It will reduce the emission by 90, depending on the intensity and other things, around 90%. We are also working on a futuristic R&D scenario of trying to use a hydrogen-based DRI, but trying to avoid the complete pelletizing. In both the scenarios, we need a pellet. In the high four process, which we have put a pilot plan in Austria here, which is under uh, test work. We are doing a lot of test work. So we, we are directly trying to reduce the concentrate into direct reduced ions. So this is a, a new topic which we are working on. I just wanted to brief you. And if you look at the amount of hydrogen required, even if you use 30% hydrogen for a 2 million ton DRI, we are talking about 34,000 tons of hydrogen per annum requiring a electrolysis capacity of 215 megawatt working on a continuous basis. And if you use 100% hydrogen, we are talking about 715 megawatt of electrolysis capacity only for the reduction. I'm not talking about the heating and, and, the, and the electricity required for the EF. So it's a huge demand on the renewable power, which is required for the hydrogen-based reduction. No, we from Prime Metals have is a licensee of Midrex and uh, we have built a number of plants worldwide. And we believe the Midrex plant is, uh, is hello. Yeah, and we believe the Midrex plant is fully flexible to start with natural gas in the initial days. In, in the presently, it can start with natural gas and produce based on natural gas. When hydrogen is available, we can use the hydrogen in the system as and when it is available at a competitive price, use up to 30% hydrogen with no change. And beyond, uh, the, uh, when you go to 100% hydrogen, the reformer which is there is no more a reformer, but it has to be reconfigured as a heater. So the Midrex plant can today be built for the future transition, it's currently using natural gas or syn gas, whichever gas is available in the form of CO or H2, to build today and future. As hydrogen becomes competitive, we can transition into a hydrogen-based plant. So in, for, in terms of the requirement of uh, the hydrogen, roughly for 100% hydrogen, we require around 58 kg of uh, hydrogen for the reduction process. This is excluding the heat, which is required, which Dr. Mukesh Kumar said, for additional heat, we have to bring in uh, additional heat in terms of electricity or gas or hydrogen addition to the reduction requirement. The positive aspect, which I see in India today is the high, uh, the renewable cost power is coming down. So we are talking today at 25 to $30 per megawatt. And already India has achieved 100, mega, 100 gigawatt of renewable power which is uh, likely to go to around 450. So there's a good storyline that huge amount of renewable power is available at a very, very, I would say, competitive price compared to a lot of the places in the world. But this price is expected to further go down. So we think that India has a good story on the hydrogen, uh, hydrogen to produce hydrogen at a relatively competitive price compared to other parts of the world. Now the effects on using hydrogen on a matrix based plant. So as we use, as I said, the base case scenario today, when we use natural gas, we already use 55% hydrogen, 35% CO. And as we go, as we inject 20% hydrogen, the ratios get changed. And the effect of that is the carbon in the DRI gets reduced. It reduced from 2.4 to 1.5 and all the way 0.5 to zero as hydrogen gets increased. So what is shown here is, it's starting with 55% hydrogen. With a 20%, the hydrogen content goes to 62%. With 50% addition of hydrogen goes to 72%. And then finally, at 100% hydrogen, the carbon content in the DRI is almost zero. So this is also a problem for the electric car corner. So we need to have a blend of what is the right amount of hydrogen which can be used on a DR plan. We believe it could be 70, 65, 70 to 80% we still produce some amount of, uh, of carbon. 
and the emission intensity this is only the direct emission so this is not the scope one and two this is the direct process emissions so the emissions start reducing from 500 kg all the way from 250 to 150 to zero as we use more and more hydrogen so as we can also see the h2co ratio how it is getting increased when we use more and more hydrogen so already we have experience of using higher h2co ratio in the past so we don't believe technically there is an issue with uh, with the technology technology can work with hydrogen it is available today at scale for implementation if hydrogen is available at a very very competitive price and at the scale which is required so this is just an example uh, of the of the recent uh, of a project which we are doing for in russia so this is a 2.08 million ton hbi plant it is designed to start with a, a natural gas based uh, natural gas and subsequently as hydrogen becomes available from from this is uh, hydrogen will be not a green hydrogen in this case it would be from the natural gas so as as hydrogen becomes available it can be used in this plant so this is an example of a large scale plant which we are implementing in russia so this is just an overview of the latest technology which we are working on which i said it's a hypo technology hypo refers to hydrogen fine or reduction technology this is a technology being developed by primetals we have put up a test plant here in Donavis, testing ore for clients globally to see how this technology is working. It is still a very, very uh, on, a, on a test phase plant. So the idea of this uh, technology is to avoid the pelletizing completely and to reduce the cost of production. So we want to use directly the pellet feed concentrate up to a grain size of 150 micron and then use hydrogen and uh, reduce the operating cost because there's no more pelletizing there's no pellet premium which is required we can directly use the concentrate after the beneficiation so on the pelletizing the, the the benefits are of course there are no pelletizing there's a high oxide yield because this is also connected to a dry reducing system which is also recycling so there is a high oxide yield there is a we have a co2 free iron making because of the hydrogen usage and also because the particle size is very very low the reduction uh, can be possible at a low temperature and the kinetics is much more better. So this is a very interesting technology which we are working on. It is still not ready for the commercial scale, but it is a technology for the future. Now, what does it take uh, in the Indian context when we talk about the hydrogen? So we try to do a study on, on if India today at 111 million ton is to go to 368 million ton, as uh, Sachin has said, based on the resource efficiency and uh, all the uh, all the material efficiency scenarios by 2050, we are talking about a 4% CAGR, in which case we still believe that uh, the DR-based route uh, will still play a major role in, by 2050. Uh, so we have taken roughly around 20% of the production is coming from the DR route. So if 20% production or roughly say uh, 75 million ton of steel is produced from the DR route, what is the imp implications? So we would require additional iron ore pellets if it is a midrex based DR or HYL based DR of roughly around 100, 110 million tons by 2050, addition over and above what we have today. There's a hydrogen demand of 5.2 million ton. This could go up if the, if, the, if, if, if the hydrogen based plant is more, but we have estimated it is 75 million ton by 2050. So we require around 5.2 million ton of hydrogen, which requires roughly around 200 more than 260 terawatt hour per year so what does it translate is basically it requires almost the same amount of uh, the solar and the wind power which is available today in india for hydrogen production for the steel industry so this is the magnitude of challenge what we are talking about it is a huge challenge and uh, and and the renewables has to really come up a lot there has to be a, a infrastructure built to even store the hydrogen if we have to realize a hydrogen society okay just uh, on the on the cost of hydrogen i picked up some of the graphs which was done by terry so the 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 right hand uh, right side was the cost of hydrogen uh, as the cost of hydrogen falls to 1.5 to 1 kg, which Sachin also just talked about it, we still see that the hydrogen-based route will be expensive compared to a blast furnace route, because as hydrogen becomes cheap, we believe the coal also will be become more cheaper, and then the blast furnace would become even more competitive. So the hydrogen route will always be an expensive way of making steel in India. But the good news is, 
on the left hand side the price of the hydrogen is dropping in india we can see in the different scenarios which terry has published in his report that the cost of hydrogen can be less than the natural gas base by 2030 so basically by 2030 if you use the solar based power which is having a low low cost of power so the the cost of hydrogen produced can come down less than 1.5 dollar per kg or less than 100 rupees per kg so with this scenario hydrogen tries to become competitive but still not competitive compared to a blast furnace there has to be other green premium or tax tax incentive which is required for green products for example the government can look at a zero vat or a lower vat for green products there, there has to be a green premium especially the auto industry could afford to give a small green premium for the steel industry for the for the auto grade steels so there could be policy measures which could be put in place but india could could uh, come come to this because of the lower hydrogen cost which we can produce uh, and the lower renewable our, uh, renewable energy prices which is prevailing with this i would like to summarize today that the technology is available today on a large scale for production of low carbon metallics today the matrix based plant can reduce up to 50% more than 50% compared to the blast furnace route the green hydrogen provides an excellent pro possibility to directly reduce for, for to, to direct reduction and blast furnace carbonization and we can transition in the future to hydrogen as hydrogen is available we can blend as available so that the technology is future ready i believe today if uh, if somebody invests on blast furnace which has a life of 30 to 40 years they will be still sitting with technologies which will get obsolete in the next 30 years so so this is the technology which will still stay and then this technology is relevant when hydrogen becomes available in whichever color or form but if there is a low carbon hydrogen available, it can be injected. And some of the policy or the key enablers we believe is the rapid deployment of renewable energy. The storage of hydrogen is very important for the steel industry also to be successful because we need continuous supply of hydrogen. So there has to be storage uh, hubs or uh, caravans for storage of hydrogen to be generated. It's, and there are models which are available in US, in Europe, where are, there are hydrogen hubs being created. India should also look at creation of hydrogen hubs where they are com combining the fertilizer, the, the petrochemicals, the, the, other, the other industries together to produce hydrogen, store hydrogen and supply to the industry. There is a huge amount of work required on the infrastructure in terms of pipeline, transport, hubs, hubs for hydrogen. A policy support for green hydrogen usage in steel is necessary. Without a policy support, it will not, uh, uh, nobody will move to even look at green, hydro, green, green steel. CO2 tax in the future would help uh, to give a competitive uh, playing field for people who invest in green and a zero or a low VAT. We had green financing uh, is now relevant is relevant for the renewable energy. It also has to come for the for the steel industry. So there has to be a green product standard. So today, when we talk of green, there is no standard. There has to be a standard which has to be done. Mandates can be done by for, for public procurement, corporate buyers, uh, buyers club. And finally, there has to be a green premium which the consumer has to pay. And we believe the auto industry or the white, white good industry could possibly pay a small green premium for the, for the green steel. We believe in summary, India is very uniquely positioned to take advantage of the emerging hydrogen economy and shape to the decarbonize the steel industry due to the low renewable energy power cost and the high capacity plan and possibility, possibility of a competitively priced uh, green hydrogen or, uh, or hydrogen produced from other sources and huge demand for steel. So Indian steel industry is poised to grow. The new capacities could be adapted to the future technologies and keep, and India can contribute immensely to, to make a carbon neutral world. So that's all from my side. Thank you for hosting me today. Any questions I would be happy to take. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. John. And uh, I will just check if we have any open questions for you. So we have a question from Mr. ACR Das. He mm -hmm. says, Mr. John, thanks for a very informative presentation. Can you tell me what is the source of great CO2 factor of 698 gram per kilowatt hour? Secondly, if you are aware, can you tell what is the global average uh, of great CO2 emission? 
Yeah, I don't remember the global average, but the 698, uh, as we said that uh, we had done a work with uh, Terry in the past. So, so if you see one of this, uh, uh, one minute, I will just show you. So there is a publication which is available. So this is based on uh, when we did this, uh, we got this data. This was the, the emission intensity of the, of the Indian grid. And uh, there are some public data also available. So we took 698. Uh, which was uh, which was available roughly around 700 which is uh, maybe in the future it is changing but this is the basis on which we have calculated and the global uh, is uh, uh, i do not know the global average but in europe is come down drastically the great intensity in europe today we are talking about uh, 242 uh, uh, gram per uh, per kilowatt hour and uh, the plan is to go to 80 gram Okay, thank you very much, Mr. John. And we have one more question for you. This is from Mr. Pritesh Garg. He asks, what is the maximum allowable top gas hydrogen content in hydrogen injection scenario for blast furnace? Also, what are your views on lower uh, raft operation of blast furnaces with hydrogen bearing injectants? Yes, there is a very good question. So that's the reason why there is a limitation on the amount of hydrogen which can be done. So what we have modeled is maximum the best case scenario, I would say, is maybe 27 and a half kg is, is the and maximum we can go up to 40 kg, but it is not tested. So beyond that, there is a problem with the with the with the, the top gas temperature and problem with the whole uh, the, the blast furnace. So there is a limitation on how much we can do. But if Mr. Garg is interested, he can get in touch with uh, me separately to have a more detailed discussion. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. John, uh, for, for your wonderful presentation and also for answering the questions. So with that, I will now move on to our next speaker. We have Mr. Ilya Pavlov. He's the head of hydrogen and innovative decarbonization uh, from Sevastal. So over to you, Mr. Pavlov. Uh, Mr. Pavlov, you are muted, so we cannot hear you. In just a second, I'm experiencing kind of technical difficulties in my screen. Yeah. Just wait for a second. No problem. Okay, let me share it. Good, can you, can you see it now? Yes, we can see the screen, yes. Super, okay, good, good day and thank you for having me here on this great webinar. So we had a lot of uh, beautiful insights uh, during the previous presentations. And I'm trying now to probably look at that from the little bit different perspective, uh, because now we're experiencing uh, the dramatic industry change, uh, not just in steel industry, but generally we all now in the context of our energy transition. And so we here at Severstal believe that it's not just a threat and difficulty for our industry, but also an opportunity. So uh, I'm Ilya Pavlov, and I'm head of hydrogen innovative decarbonization at Severstal. What I do, uh, I do invest in uh, technological companies, which do provide breakthrough technologies to our industry and just outside of our industry also. And also we do different pilot and bigger size projects, which are related to hydrogen and decarbonization. Good. Okay, and so just the two words about Severstal because I believe for that are not so many people aware. We are a big Russian based producer of steel. We are vertically integrated. We do everything from ore and coal to steel. And uh, we are the most efficient 
the most the most efficient company uh, in the world in terms of EBITDA margin. So it's a pretty big company, 50,000 people. And uh, you can see all the numbers. I think it's kind of gives you some, some, some idea about the scale. And actually we are, no, two, two more words. Uh, actually we are fortunate that we do have access to natural gas, uh, which being a hydrocarbon already much cleaner agent than the coal. And actually thanks to that, uh, thanks to technologies we deploy at our premises, we are in the first quartile of our CO2 emitting companies. Uh, I think, or I believe our emission is a little bit more than uh, two tons per ton of liquid steel. It's pretty good parameter, but not, not the best, obviously. And uh, we do have now kind of short target uh, to reduce it 3% 3, 3 to 2023 and 10% to 2030. So we don't declare carbon neutrality yet because actually we do deal with all projects based on uh, whether or not they may be economical and viable for us. So that's why we can say that those numbers, which I just mentioned, are very much real for us. I want to, I want to discuss kind of the, the change in paradigm or for a methodology from kind of from this point of view that we are today in our carbon-based chemistry industry. So everybody knows uh, those reduction reactions and uh, what we can do here, uh, we can just uh, probably be much more energy efficient. We can produce better quality steel, which are kind of less used and the overall amount of steel produced worldwide may become smaller. And of course, our interesting way of doing things is carbon capture and storage. And uh, we are now considering this opportunity. And I believe in India, it may be also a pretty good way uh, because as Russia, you're a big country. So you do have a lot of places uh, where CO2 may be, may be stored um, under the ground. So I believe that uh, here we still do have a good room for improvement. But what we can do and what are, we are actually now discussing in today's webinar, then we can go further and we can go to hydrogen methodology. And here, one of their key questions is how we get pretty cheap hydrogen and even more important hydrogen with a low carbon footprint. And here around those technologies are so many things happening. And we want to kind of actually to be a part of this, of this journey and to find, invest and grow technologies which are going to deliver cheap and low carbon hydrogen to us and to other industries. And uh, one beautiful example that we can go even further and uh, there are technologies there in the early stage but we can actually use electrons, electricity as a reductant agent and reduce ferrum oxide with this way, it is gonna be very much like aluminum. Uh, so this technology is in the earlier days of its kind of existence, it's just on the pilot scale, but I think with time uh, it may go further and having, for example, in India, you do have great plans for renewable electricity growth and it may be used not just for hydrogen production, but actually to directly reduce the iron ore. This is far away, but still we need kind of to consider those things because they're very energy efficient. Is it enough actually to talk about hydrogen, to talk about the direct reduction? So we believe that obviously not. And um, many speakers today, they kind of presented many different ways of how we can reduce CO2 emission in our industry. And here, I believe we can talk not just about the decarbonization challenge uh, with CO2 capture, with hydrogen, carbon usage, but we can kind of look on a much broader picture, kind of making better steel for circular economy. And uh, we are doing many things around it. Mining, mining is very big part of the story. And here also, new technologies developing very fast. Byproducts, 
there were some words today about the byproducts already said, and I believe that this is also a very important part to focus on. And obviously today everybody talks about electrification, and here the question is whether or not we can grow our renewable assets as aggressive as we want. Um, I believe India has a great potential. Uh, myself, I believe that nuclear has a pretty good future, but let's see what regulation gonna tell us in coming years. But I believe that uh, being a very low carbon footprint electricity, it may be very useful for hydrogen, uh, for hydrogen generation. And the last but not least, we need to look that we are actually in the context of the- Really? Yes. Sorry. Is it okay? Are you still receiving me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Very good, very good. So, well, last, last thing that are, we are in the context of energy transition with other industries and approaches like, for example, shared infrastructure, may be very useful. For example, in the ethanol production, the byproduct is uh, hydrogen. And then there are some projects already in the world in Europe when the hydrogen is taken from one manufacturing facility and actually delivered as a feedstock to another. And for that, you need kind of to have a really kind of industrial clusters to, to coexist. It's not that easy to do, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's a good way to kind of to go forward. Just uh, to kind of to give you an idea that uh, continuous improvements in terms of technology, it's not enough obviously today because the revolution we see today for our industry and for all heavy industries is huge. And then we really need to, to work with more radical and disruptive technologies and disruptive approaches, even though they are not known today. And uh, this is very nice uh, statistics from Energy Agency that are, what it does say that uh, if you go to the low carbon scenario to 2050, then are most of the technologies which is gonna be deployed and which are gonna help us to get to those numbers in terms of CO2 emissions. There today in the demonstration or even prototype phase. So, and what does it mean? It means that we need to find instruments and we need to unify and to, to find the ways how to work with those technologies, how to find them and how to help them to mature and to be deployed at our industries. What I want to say that actually India is famous uh, for its technologies and venture capital, mostly in IT, but also you do have many companies which uh, does technologies based on physics and chemistry, for example, in space and automotive industry. And I believe that India is kind of full of great innovators and great companies, which may help us to, to kind of to work on the, on, the, on the issues we are facing today and going to be facing in the next 10, 20 years. So the problem is that and for steel companies, uh, it is very difficult uh, to, to work with those companies and not so many steel companies has instruments. But uh, we do have instrument how to work with these kind of new and disruptive companies. We do know how to run best practices. And actually we are open for cooperation and we can share our knowledge, we can share our approaches. And I believe that uh, today, this is kind of the right time to join forces kind of for different companies in the industry to help those disruptive technologies come alive. So thank you so much for your attention. And if there are some questions, uh, please ask now, or you can drop me a line in the email you can see here. Again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pavlov. You, I, I love your email ID. I love, means you love the world. So- Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So is there any question for Mr. Pavlov? Any question in the chat section? I don't see any question. Unfortunately, so yeah, I can't read. 
So as I said, uh, if you do have any, any questions, proposals, ideas, drop me a line. Sure. Uh, so the email ID is very simple. I yes. love at I love at sevastal.com. I L O V at sevastal.com. And as you we all know, Sevastal is a very respected company in Russia. In fact, uh, I would say Magnitogorsk, MMK, and Sevastal are the two most respected companies in Russia and known globally. Everyone knows uh, Sevastal very well. So with that. We'll come to our, uh, thank you, Mr. Pavlov. We'll come to the next speaker, which is uh, whom we missed earlier, Professor Basu. Professor Sudhasatta Basu, uh, his turn was earlier. I know Masi Malano, uh, Mr. Fantuzi is scheduled to uh, be the next speaker, but uh, the Professor Basu was scheduled earlier, who had a very important award function to attend. So that is why uh, he was a little delayed. So, uh, uh, you have to excuse me, Mr. Masi Malano, because we missed him already. So uh, your turn will be next after Professor Basu. Now, Professor Basu, Professor Sudhu Sato Basu completed his PhD MS in chemical engineering from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, after obtaining his BTEC in chemical engineering from Calcutta University. Uh, he, was, uh, he worked for five years as a research fellow and as a visiting faculty in the University of Alberta, Edmonton. Prior to taking over as director at IMT, he was associate dean research and development at uh, Institute of Technology, IIT Delhi, and former head of chemical engineering department of IIT Delhi. He has vast work experience in development of energy materials and its application to energy conversion and storage devices that is fuel cells, supercapacitor and battery electrolyzer for hydrogen generation by water splitting and CO2 reduction to organics. He has worked on oil sands extraction in Alberta, Canada, specializing in slurry transport and separation of oil and sand. Uh, he had also worked on colloids and interfacial phenomena, particularly on demultification and removal of dye from wastewater. He has published high impact journals. He has seven patents, transfer technologies to various industries and completed 20 crore worth of projects in IIT Delhi. So with that, we move on to Professor Basu. Professor Basu, the floor is all yours. And once again, uh, my apologies for the slight delay in uh, uh, your slot. You have to wait for a little bit. My apologies. Over to you, Thank Professor you. Basu. Thank you, Mr. Nirmala Mukherjee, uh, for inviting me in this August gathering to give a talk on uh, green steel or use of hydrogen in steel making. And I'm really little, uh, I'm sorry that I'm a little late, but uh, I could not uh, help because I had to be another meeting, uh, which uh, which was supposed to end a little earlier, but uh, took a little more time. Uh, without further delay, I just straight away go to the contribution that is made by um, CSI Institute of Minerals and Materials Technology Bhubaneswar on uh, production of green and clean steel by hydrogen plasma smelting and reduction process. This work is done by a group of scientists in our advanced material technology division, uh, Dr. Bhui, Dr. Paramguru, Dr. P.S. Mukherjee, and Dr. B.K. Mishra uh, is involved uh, in this project. And it is because of them only I'm able to present it. I think this slide, of course, I'm sure number of people must have shown by this time uh, that what is the benefit of use of um, hydrogen or why should we use hydrogen to start with that you have about 1.7 to 1.9 tons of CO2 generated per tons of crude of steel. I mean, it shows here in the left hand side what goes inside the uh, uh, in, in a blast furnace. And uh, then what comes out uh, here is shown you here, the flue dust, the blast furnace gas, the slag and the hot metal, uh, which we are mostly interested in. And then how much, so that is how it makes sense today uh, with this amount of greenhouse gas emission that uh, whether this, this is a sustainable in a long run uh, for this uh, mother earth. And I'm showing you this is a little old data I'm showing you that currently the 6% of the greenhouse gas emission comes from iron and steel industry. Although it looks 6%, but it's a huge amount when you see it, the part ton of crude of steel that is being, uh, that, that CO2 is generated. So every phase 
as everybody's talking about renewable power for electricity generation, as everybody's talking about using battery, not the crude oil or diesel or uh, petrol uh, for mobility, it's only about the e-mobility. So here also we can do our part, uh, those who are in steel making or those who are, those who are metallurgists. So that is how the question comes that uh, why hydrogen and what is the use of hydrogen in here in steel making. So instead of CO2, hydrogen is being used for making metal in lab for uh, to get a pure metal from oxides. That is a hydrogen reduction process. All of us do, all of, all of us do when we are trying to make catalyst in, in even, in, even in large quantity in the lab uh, from its oxides um, and various other sources. And we do hydrogen reduction process or any reduction process involving removing of oxygen. So from, from to get a metal. So that's, that's where it's well known. And instead of using coke and coal, one can use hydrogen. And I'm showing you some of the basic stuff because I thought this must be also go to the people who are actually uh, are involved in conventional process that how, what is the way that hydrogen can be used to make pure iron from iron oxide. And uh, that is what we are talking about. We are using hematite in our, uh, in, our, uh, in our experiments that we have shown, which will come a little later. And this table shows that the use of hydrogen and generation of water here in the case of uh, um, the iron, that is uh, in, in the case of the uh, theoretical reductant and the product balance that comes when you use carbon um, uh, or you are using coke and how much CO generated, and if you are using uh, CO2, how much CO2 generated and requirement of carbon, of course, is goes down when you have CO2 generated. But in the case of hydrogen, of course, you have um, uh, 54 tons of H2 generated, which is a reduction product. Um, here, we are trying to show that uh, uh, an important part, one is using pure hydrogen, other is using hydrogen ion or oxygen ion, which is also coming from uh, Fe2O3, which is we our starting point of, uh, of hematite, which we are trying to reduce to make iron. So a uh, little bit of, uh, little bit of uh, thermodynamics here, uh, those who are working on a fundamental, that we, what we are saying is the delta G reactions of these two are similar, okay? So, so you do not get that great advantage of using pure hydrogen if you want to use hydrogen as a reductant. And there could be, uh, you require a huge amount of hydrogen and the percentage conversion is quite low. Instead of that, if you're using plasma, or hydrogen plasma, which generates not only uh, we have a atomic hydrogen, we have also have ionic hydrogen. So moment you are using hydrogen plasma, what is that the theory that we are proposing or the work that we have already done that if I using uh, plasma, hydrogen plasma, which generates ionic hydrogen, which is far more effective in reducing um, iron oxide to iron than pure hydrogen. And your requirement of hydrogen also goes down. There is a power requirement, but that needs to work out. Of course, when you are using plasma, you will generate plasma. So I'm uh, the thermodynamic uh, calculations are shown you here that I I talked about. So I'm not going to details of this. Delta G I said is delta G of formation is similar, and uh, some of the reaction schemes of generating oxide ion also is generated when you have Fe2O3 and hydrogen ion is also generated and everything together is more effective in doing reduction process. So uh, what we did in CSR MMT is that we have a hydrogen uh, plasma uh, 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 reactors. Uh, we are, uh, we, uh, as we are showing you here, that um, uh, here the, uh, the reactor is shown you here. And of course, here traditional process and HPSR, uh, when you are using hydrogen plasma, is been is been shown you here. Um, normally, uh, the use of hydrogen um, is only a recently that people have talked about. But last fifteen years, or about twenty years, I'd say about two thousand four onwards, uh, people were talking about ultra low CO two uh, steel making, uh, top gas uh, sequestration or recycling. So such kind of CCS with the top gas coming from blast furnace and then recycling it 
And so you are trying to use um, as much as uh, CO2 and CO that is coming, which has a still potential to do reduction process. All these things were existing, uh, which is known as Alcored. Uh, and then people have used in mid-brex, Corex and Finex process in different way, like POSCO had a process of Corex and Finex using CCS coming from a top gas, or they're using natural gas as a reductant and uh, getting a uh, DRI out of it, which is then sent to EAF, electric arc furnace, melting it and then getting iron. So these processes are being tried by all steel making companies, just named POSCO, but I'm just not I'm by POSCO. Everywhere you can find it in Germany, you can find it in Korea, in China, in the US, in Canada, in Australia, many places, Japan, uh, many places it is being tried. But our theory here is about using a thumb plasma and the plasma could be two kind of plasma one is thermal plasma and in one non thermal plasma so here we are talking about thermal plasma which will uh, which will resulting uh, smelting reduction process and in the case of uh, non thermal plasma you can have a reduction at solid plasma interface and leading to formation of dri or solid metal so depending on that how you want to do it so i def definitely here i mentioned that what are the advantage of HPSR hydrogen plasma process? Uh, definitely no CO2, six tons of hydrogen is required to produce one, one ton, uh, two tons per iron. Okay, H2 vapor is a byproduct and which is all, all known. And on the other hand, uh, we all, uh, and our predecessor, all the, all, the, all the people might have talked about already the, the minutes that we have in CO2 generation and the greenhouse gas emission. So this is the process that we have gone through that uh, we have taken hematite, uh, we take iron ore, then we have granulation and flux being added. Then we have hydrogen plasma spelting where we do it here. We have a video also, but we're not showing you. And the metal and slag comes out and, and the magnetic fraction, non-magnetic fraction can be divided. And you can see that these are the some of the uh, that iron that we have got uh, from here with the iron content of 97%. Phosphor is so small. 0.02 percentage, small sulfur and very small carbon. So, I mean, you can get a steel out of this process directly. And uh, here we are showing you the our furnace, the plasma furnace that we have used. And then here the drop that we have, and we are collecting the 10 kg um, uh, steel uh, here, uh, which is having phosphorus content is very, very small. So this has been tested and tried at IMMT and developed in a 10 kg scale. And um, of course, people can talk about that you are using plasma, so you're using huge electric power. Um, uh, so what is the uh, advantage of it? Uh, of course, hydrogen one can generate from photovoltaic and then uh, photovoltaic power one can use to split hydrogen in electrolyzer to make hydrogen and oxygen, which can be used, of course. And plasma, of course, required power, but then the requirement of uh, the hydrogen is goes down and you get a you know, requirement of power of plasma will be much less, which I'm not talking about here when you get to higher scale. But we have to do that and we have to prove that on theoretical basis, we have proven that if I go to 100 kg scale, if I go to one ton scale or uh, 100 ton scale, the requirement of plasma power goes down. So I just wanted to talk about that. This is being uh, being developed quite quite some time quite some time back, and then uh, uh, and, and then here it is uh, uh, some something which uh, which uh, 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 one minute. Uh, so uh, we are uh, uh, just uh, one minute. Uh, somehow, uh, this is uh, uh, this is how the uh, uh, ap appreciation we got from uh, Schenk and Paul of uh, University of Newborn, Austria, when they came and visited our uh, Mantriji visited here and uh, and. We have shown and, and given uh, shown them the how this uh, green steel uh, uh, is generated by using hydrogen and hydrogen plasma, and this is the uh, process. It's schematically when envisaged 
how uh, HP SR process in 100 kg scale can work, uh, which we, we have shown you here that uh, in, a, in a pilot scale of 100 kg, that uh, we can have a slag metal uh, can be separated out from the plasma furnace and uh, we have raw material coming out and the whole process I've already, I've already talked about that we have a separation and then we have a charging and the plasma that is generated here and we are using hydrogen um, argon uh, to, um, to generate the plasma here. And of course the emission is much, much cleaner. You have only hydrogen, um, the aqueous phase or the uh, moisture emission from here. And uh, so this has been well uh, covered in our patent portfolio, in US patent, Indian patent, the two patents are being uh, filed, one in 2014, another is granted in 2018. We have Indian patent and many publications that, uh, that has come. And we think that this can take forward, uh, can be taken forward and will be enormously uh, uh, beneficial for the society in terms of the emission uh, standard currently we have in for many industries uh, that we cannot emit such amount of CO2 and CO to the atmosphere or greenhouse gas to the atmosphere. And uh, believe me, uh, once um, uh, uh, in the social media, I just posted that uh, we have a green steel hydrogen plasma or uh, a green steel, uh, hydrogen based green steel uh, production seminar. Uh, uh, Dr. Vezi Rogulu uh, sent me a note. He is quite old. He's close to about 90. He is the founder. He is the founder of International Association of Hydrogen Energy. In 1966, he is still alive. Founder of International Association of Hydrogen Energy, Mr. V Dr. Vezirogulu. He sent me a message saying that keep it up. So he still he still believes he's be he believed 1966 that hydrogen economy is going to come and hydrogen is the way forward in every sector. Whether it's talking about mobility, it is talking about generation of power. Now we are talking about generation of steel. So I just, at the end, I just want to show you the coverage that we have got, uh, the, the one that we have worked on. And uh, this is in brief, I just presented our work and thank you for your time. And any question, if you'd like to ask, we'll be happy to do that. And we are looking forward from industry to work on to scale this up to 100 kg scale to one ton scale um, uh, where your emission is negligible and the power requirement also can be brought it down. Uh, once we work on at least on 100 kg scale, we will be knowing it. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Professor Basu. And, uh, you know, uh, just uh, to go through your presentation, I noticed that. Uh, uh, Professor Schenk was there uh, uh, with you in uh, at uh, Bhuneshwar. Uh, Professor Schenk, whom I know for many, many years, and Professor Schenk is someone whom I consider a very good friend of mine, and uh, he's worked very closely with, let me tell you, with Vost Alpi National, uh, uh, and University of Leoben, uh, in fact, has a very close coordination with Vost Alpi So I'm sure uh, our uh, colleagues from Primal who are here, including Mr. Shibu John, will take it up to see if uh, IMT can work closely with primatos on developing and the, as well as the other players who are here like Polward, uh, Tenova, and uh, Daneli. All of them are here, uh, who are present here today. We'll uh, look at opportunities of working together with IMT and uh, which will ultimately result in uh, lowering the cost the higher the scales you go into. So is there any questions for Professor Basu? Any questions? Uh, that is, uh, Satendra has a question. FE is 97.3 with very low CPNS. What is remaining? Is it SiO2, Al2, or 3? Now, uh, I yes. don't know. Yeah, uh, we have removed most of the silica alumina already. Uh, uh, prior to charging um, and uh, already that part is removed as I was showing you in my scheme uh, sometime uh, uh, I just see whether I can move for back uh, I was showing you that here it is so uh, the we have the I don't know fine granulation flux and then you get a slag out of it 
and so that will be mostly that separation takes place and you can clearly see that metal and slag are coming out separately and uh, that is uh, we we i uh, i have not shown any schematic but there is a schematic for that uh, which can be shown and there is a clear separation of the slag so all that is coming out uh, uh, after the operation okay thank you professor basu and uh, if there are any questions you can post it in the q and a section and professor basu will be happy to answer it thank you uh, I, there is one more question professor basu sorry can you throw some light on the effect of thermal and non thermal plasma on the steel product yes so uh, that's a good question i think i little bit explain uh, when you ge generate a thermal plasma there will be a smelting reduction taking place and that's how the process that i'm showing you currently is a thermal plasma if you using non thermal plasma this is a basic fundamental work then the uh, the, uh, the reaction of the process goes on in the interface of the plasma and the and the solid surface so there this is a solid completely solid process and then there, there you can generate dri which will be a very um, uh, uh, like a, uh, from there by if i using a non thermal plasma i will be able to generate dri from there and the uh, uh, solid plasma interface uh, the reaction will take place so both is possible and both can give you different kind of product where one can get, get dri and another can, you can get a steel so that's how uh, this works uh, and one can generate i hope one can generate I, they know that how a thermal plasma and a non thermal plasma can be generated well thank you professor basu and now we'll move on to our next speaker mr masimalano fantosi vice president r and d of danili chetro kambaschan uh, first of all mr masimalano please excuse me for uh the delay and uh, i uh, seek apologies from you for uh you know the the delay that you have you had to wait for a longer time but i i'm sure we as we always keep saying it better late uh, is so and uh, in italy it is not too late because it's yeah. a friday uh, it's a friday evening and uh, Uh, everyone knows the best wines of the country are available in Friuli in Italy. So Friuli is known for its beautiful wines, which you can go and uh, enjoy in Udine this evening. But uh, before that, uh, before that, we need a good presentation from you. Over to you, Professor Fantosi. Thank you very much, Mr. Mukherjee. Uh, the delay is also an opportunity to to debate uh, to have. Uh, a longer and interesting uh, uh, opportunity to to listen to presentation and uh, an overview of the technology so thank you very much for your uh, invitation uh, i have uh, to share the i i, I only prepared a, a very short uh, presentation just uh, in uh, with idea of uh, uh, respecting the the time uh, so okay uh, i i suppose you can see my screen no we cannot see it yet not yet no for share the screen screen share now yes now it is visible now it is visible thank you uh so um here is better again uh okay sorry for this inconvenient um my brief uh, speech is uh, concerning uh, uh, our perspective uh, relevant to the uh, downstream uh, 
uh, area uh, of the and, and therefore so we we are talking of reheating and treatment furnaces and uh, the roadmap to the carbon neutrality by uh, 2050 stepping uh, with uh, uh, it is not completely clear uh, with intermediate uh, uh, steps uh, by 2030 or a reduction of uh, by 50% of uh, CO2 emissions uh, uh, is seeing uh, many players in this scenario. And uh, along the supply chain, uh, all the players uh, are called to contribute with uh, uh, their uh, capacity uh, in order to contribute to this uh, big effort. So uh, we are ready for hydrogen, but uh, hydrogen is missing. Therefore, what uh, we can do, uh, gas producer, uh, are uh, called uh, to develop uh, technologies uh, for reducing the cost uh, of uh, hydrogen because we are talking of hydrogen as the main uh, opportunity for uh, targeting to the carbon neutrality. It is not really the only one. Uh, other uh, energy carrier are available and many studies are ongoing about that. I'm talking of ammonia, on example. But coming to the, the, the list of the, the players, uh, uh, we are also called to do uh, our part uh, as a technology provider. And uh, our task is to supply our customers uh, with uh, reliable solutions. And uh, we also have to consider and to program how to manage the transition uh, to the total carbon neutrality. This is uh, meaning that uh, we have to face uh, the lack uh, of uh, hydrogen or progressively introduce hydrogen in uh, the combustion of our furnaces. And in particular, if uh, we take a look to this uh, table, we see that uh, in the hot rolling area, both uh, energy intensity and uh, the relevant uh, CO2 emissions uh, in terms of uh, uh, gigajoule per ton of steel or uh, ton of CO2 produced by the combustion in the hot rolling area, uh, we see that uh, uh, they are only a fraction of other uh, uh, areas uh, in the iron and steel uh, production. It is only 8% uh, uh, of uh, what uh, is occurring in the blast furnace area. Oh, and anyway, this uh, is uh, a commitment where we have to, to face uh, uh, this uh, reduction. And uh, the reduction is uh, uh, the result of uh, our uh, technology. So uh, we have a tradition uh, in the development of, of uh, technological solutions, uh, and in particular of uh, specialized burners according uh, to different uh, uh, processes. Uh, and so the, the reheating furnaces for billets uh, which are operating uh, uh, for temperature up uh, uh, 1150 or reading furnaces for slabs uh, operating at higher temperature 1250 and, uh, and above. Uh, if we are thinking to these furnaces uh, uh, completely fed by hydrogen, uh, we, we simply do what we are used to do. So developing uh, a technology uh, which is able to, to fire uh, hydrogen 
uh, up to 100% uh, while keeping uh, the same uh, effect on the the, the product uh, to be reheated and uh, without uh, uh, increasing NOx emissions because uh, it's well known that uh, hydrogen combustion is uh, it is operated at higher uh, temperature and adiabatic flame temperature is higher than in comparison to the one of natural gas but uh, thanks to the, the flameless combustion uh, we we were able to uh, maintain the same level of nox emissions uh, even for a full hydrogen combustion and therefore uh, what uh, you can see here is uh, uh, a, a side burner operating uh, in flame and flameless mode uh, suitable for uh, reading furnaces that was uh, tested uh, successfully with uh, mixtures of natural gas and hydrogen uh, in the order of uh, 0, 100, uh, 100, 0. And so the complete uh, uh, set of uh, possible mixtures. Uh, it is uh, the result of uh, uh, a research uh, process, the research uh, process which uh, uh, is leading also to customization of uh, these solutions for uh, uh, any type of plant. This is a, a burner for uh, side installation in reading furnaces. And uh, these are the emission level uh, in flame or in uh, flameless mode. Uh, with the uh, an adjustment of gas lenses in flameless mode, uh, we discovered that uh, the, the same uh, NOx emissions were also maintained in a flameless condition. While in flame mode, uh, it was expected uh, an increase and uh, we, we measured it. So the same development was concerning uh, uh, this hydro uh, RAD burner, uh, which is uh, installed in the roof of the reheating furnaces, operating both in flame and flameless mode, and also with the hydro TFB uh, rack, which is a, a self-recuperative burner uh, used in flame or in flameless mode in uh, heat treatment furnaces. This uh, means uh, mm, allowing our uh, customers uh, mm, to, to ask, uh, to demand uh, uh, hydrogen burners. So we are uh, receiving a lot of uh, demand in this sense, and we are operating uh, uh, for uh, some uh, new furnace, uh, the, uh, also the, 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 the setup for, uh, uh, for hydrogen. Of course, hydrogen is a concern, the availability of uh, the, the, the fuel is a concern, and therefore, uh, at the moment, only a small percentage, uh, let me say in the order of 20, 30 percent, uh, uh, are uh, the focus of this uh, request from our customers. And second point is managing the transition. This means that in the coming years, we, we are expecting a progressive introduction of uh, hydrogen as uh, primary energy carriers in mixtures. Uh, it is possible also a massive introduction, but the, the point is uh, we are ready to go for uh, the hydrogen demand. We are looking uh, and waiting for infrastructures and we are ready to, to use it in our furnaces. And the question how we can decarbonize steel production in our area 
without using hydrogen or even using a, a limited amount of hydrogen as a, as a, a first uh, answer. So we, we are strongly committed in increasing energy efficiency of our furnaces, both in the existing uh, uh, plants or also, of course, in new plants, uh, through the traditional uh, uh, methods uh, uh, which are leading to an increase of energy efficiency. And uh, I mean uh, high temperature air preheating by means uh, of uh, reliable and uh, high performance uh, heat uh, recuperator and uh, able to preheat combustion air above uh, 650 degrees uh, uh, by means of uh, oxygen uh, as uh, air enrichment or uh, even to oxy fuel which are considering as a, an opportunity in that sense and uh, the presentation of my friend uh, Joachim uh, was uh, uh, anticipated that is a possibility for the reading furnaces. Uh, we have solutions uh, designed in order to uh, avoid uh, the cooling water in the beams, uh, which is uh, suitable for billets only, unfortunately not for slabs, uh, but uh, it is, uh, we, we call the, the solution dry furnace, which uh, is uh, able for uh, reheating furnaces for billets uh, to operate like uh, its treatment furnaces for pipes uh, are doing. Uh, with a special design of the beams, uh, uh, fixed and movable, and uh, thanks to um, special alloys uh, used as uh, riders, uh, um, we reduce uh, to zero the heat losses from the cooling uh, system. And of course, uh, automation is a wonderful method for reducing uh, mainly in the transient phases uh, uh, energy efficiency by optimizing the, the demand of uh, fuel. Of course, we are able to, to take opportunity with our customers and uh, building and setting up uh, hydrogen ready furnaces and uh, okay, we are, we are ready. <laughs> this is the point. And uh, so I concluded my very brief uh, overview of uh, what we are doing in this field. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fantosi, Massimo Lano Fantosi. Uh, is there any question? So Danelli, Centro Combustion is ready. Is ready. Uh, yes, to take up the challenge of the reheating furnaces. Uh, any questions? Uh, in Q&A, let me see. Okay, so there is one question for you, Mr. Fantosi. Since hydrogen is highly explosive at high temperatures, how is the safety aspect taken care of in reheating furnaces? Of course, uh, I, I, I open uh, <laughs> another, another topic. Um, of course, we have tested so far uh, our burners, as I said, uh, in, uh, in the range of mixtures, uh, hydrogen, natural gas. We are uh, aware that uh, safety issues are present, uh, but so far we do not have industrial installation operated at full scale. Uh, we know that uh, uh, if uh, hydrogen production is uh, generated by true electrolysis, uh, uh, there are around uh, these uh, machines uh, uh, safety issues. Uh, and uh, the regulation, let me say, ATEX uh, uh, rules uh, can be applied also for, uh, for hydrogen. For sure, no uh, unsafe installation will occur <laughs> 
and uh, everything is respected. And the, all the equipment uh, should be uh, carefully uh, installed according to the characteristic of hydrogen. And so the valves, uh, pipelines, uh, and uh, everything is uh, considered for safety, including all the risks of explosion. Okay, thank you, thank you, grazie. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Massimala Nofantosi. Uh, so we'll now move on to my good friend, Praveen, whom I know for a very long time, from the day Manish, he was with Manish Arora. In yes, 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 so, yes. Uh, our relationship goes back to those days. And uh, let me welcome my good friend Praveen Chaturvedi, Vice President and Head uh, Sales up, uh, Upstream in Tenova Technologies Private Limited in India. So what to you, Praveen? Thank you, Nirmalada, giving this opportunity to us. And uh, good evening to all. Just good a second. Just, as, yeah. just a second, Praveen. Uh, Mr. Fatuzi, if you could stop sharing your screen, Pravin can share it. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. Share my screen. Uh, are you able to see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Is it visible? Uh, perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I will just make a yeah. So thank you for giving this opportunity. And I have got a couple of mini slides. So what I will do, I will just quickly run through and we can have a detailed discussion because there are a lot of things uh, which I would like to just present. So let me start with this hydrogen and decarbonization, which we have, which is the topic of our today's subject. Uh, this uh, you can see basically we are part of Techint group and you can see that Tenaris and Ternium, these are the two steel making uh, divisions we have. So, and Tenwa is part of our Techint group. Then, yeah, we are into the metal and mining. Just I'm taking one slide and then we'll jump to our main subject. And uh, we are not only in the DRI, but also in electric car furnaces, heat recovery solution, and also in the down, downstream products. Now, some basics of the DRI. Uh, just very basic, I'm just going to touch what uh, are we talking about. Of course, this has been already addressed by uh, Dr. Dr. Mukesh Kumar, but still, uh, I'll just tell you, just like in case of the blast furnace, uh, basically carbon monoxide is used as a reductant, reducing agent for reducing the RN oxide into the Fe, pure Fe. So in this process, apart from Fe, what we are getting out is as a product is CO2. So CO2 emission is there that we all know. On the other hand, when there is a natural gas in the DRI plant, then there is a combination of both because methane is getting reformed into carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So both hydrogen as well as carbon monoxide, both are acting as a reducing agent, a reductant for reducing the iron oxide. So at the end of the day, what we are getting is apart from iron in DRI, when we are using natural gas, we are getting carbon dioxide as well as hydrogen in equal proportion. It means that 50% of the CO2 is getting reduced by replaced by uh, water we can say now the hydrogen subject if we touch upon the hydrogen sub subject here we are doing the electrolysis in the water and we are getting hydrogen and this hydrogen when it reacts as a reducing agent finally what we are getting is zero carbon only water only water so this is our aim this is our aim so the topic is that yes hydrogen how we say that with hydrogen, we are able to make this steel. It is the process that hydrogen is acting as a reductant and we get the clean, clean uh, carbon free steel. This is what we call steel. Now, so what is our main aim? How to make the steel in future? So here you can see the RN making via this, uh, as, as I explained to you that DRI electric R furnace, definitely the CO2 greenhouse gas emission is reduced by around 50%. And this gap as compared to BFBOF route, and this gap furthermore increases when we switch over to hydrogen, hydrogen. 
and this is a DRI what we are showing. So of course, later on in the next slide, we'll discuss that this hydrogen, how we are getting is renewable energy that is already the project, which is already implemented. So I'll just touch upon that subject. But as what we have discussed in the beginning, that we cannot ignore blast furnace BOF because blast furnace BOF is used for making whether it is high grade or low grade, whether it is for the long product or flat product, BF, BF route so far, it is an ideal situation. But talking about the carbon, if we switch over to a scrap route, because that was also one of the discussion that we can use the scrap. But if we use the scrap for melting electric R furnace, the challenge is that we can make low grade steel, but not higher grade steel. For making high grade steel, like alloy steel, piano steel, bearing and all, we need some virgin source. And then virgin source, how we can get? That is through DRI or HPI utilization. If we want to eliminate BF and BOF, switch over from BF to BOF. So here the DRI comes into the picture. So as to make the high grade steel, this is the virgin source. So this is the brief concept about what we are talking about. Now coming to energy run, HYL energy run. Here you can see this is uh, the technology, HYL technology that belongs to Tenova. And uh, the, the, the energy run process, it has been jointly developed by Tenova and Denali. Uh, Mr. Ashton is already there. I think he, will, he might be waiting for his turn. <laughs> so he will explain much about the technology. Uh, so I will give him chance to explain about the DRI process. Uh, very quickly, I'll just touch upon, of course, the explanation will be more, more explanation will be given by Mr. Ashton. Uh, here you can see, very, more, very important thing is, yes, Dr. Um, Mukesh initially told that decarbonization and hydrogen, let us keep it separate. Even if hydrogen is not available, then also we should make the low carbon steel. That is more important, Janet. And this is what we have been doing. Uh, here we are not using, uh, for the timing, let us ignore hydrogen. Even with the natural gas in our system, there is inherent technology, inherent property that we are able to do the removal of CO2. So already carbon capture unit and carbon storage, these are already present in our system. We are able to remove the CO2, number one. Number two is the DRI quality. Yes, DRI, it ranges from 1.5 to 5%. That is another thing and having the high metallization. And third one is most important now in the present scenario is, this is our DRI plant. Uh, the same scheme, the same scheme is used, whether it is natural gas or reformed gas or syn gas, cocoon, shell gas, CBM, hydrogen, whatever may be, we just, we can use it. We have our process gas heater, we use it, and we we, we we don't have any reformer, zero reformer. So we need not change our system. We need not change our scheme. Whatever gas is available, we, we just uh, plug in and we get the uh, our reduction done. So the product, what we are get, we'll be getting out is the cold DRI, HBI, hot DRI into the EAF, of course, it is done. And most importantly, I am here mentioning the pig iron. This I will just tell you in what way our pig iron is important because you can see we are getting high carbon DRI. I'm talking of the natural gas case. So high carbon DRI, if you melt it in open slag bath furnace, this is a separate equipment in which you get the pig iron and that it can replace the uh, blast furnace directly. It is an alternate route of making the uh, hot metal that we'll discuss in the next, next slide. So this is selective removal of the CO2. The CO2, as I mentioned to you, that you are able to remove 62% of the CO2, unlike, uh, the other technology which is available in the market and that co2 has got the value it has got the um, added value we, we can use it uh, as a resource as a resource as a revenue and these are the various company linde and all they are already the, the companies who are uh, working in our various plants including in gsw salaw in india air liquid is there that can be used for the food and beverage industries even for the dry ice or even the enhanced oil recovery just like in emirate steel so the, the, the CO2, what we are capturing, storing, that is have the further more utilization. So this is one part. So this is what I am telling that carbon we are not emitting in the atmosphere. So here we are not uh, talking right now about the uh, hydrogen, but without hydrogen also, we can reduce the carbon footprint. So th that, that should be the one thing. Then, of course, we will talk about the hydrogen. That is our subject. Now, this is the another technology, what I was mentioning that pig iron, you can get directly from the direct reduction. What basically we are doing is we are using the BF grade pallet, 
you can see on the top uh, the DRI, and in the bottom you will find the furnace that is reducing furnace, open slag bath furnace. Basically, we say it by look and appearance, it looks like a submerged R furnace in which basically we are removing the slag, but whatever ganges are coming, it can be slagged out, and uh, we get the hot metal, and that can be used for uh, for for the BOF. So our aim is that uh, if you are replacing the blast furnace, don't there is no need of putting electric R furnace. There is no need of putting if you are putting the DRI. No need of replacing the uh, BOF. You can use as it is. Just replace the blast furnace with this small scheme, provided you have the gas. Of course, you have the gas uh, because it is not with the uh, coal. Coke. And you can see in our DRI, we are getting carbon more than four percent. The moment we melt in here, we are getting the hot metal of the same chemistry as of blast furnace even the slag has got the same property as of blast furnace which can be used for the cement in industries so of course this is one of the way by which we can reduce the carbon footprint here we are not talking about the hydrogen directly even with the natural gas or coke one gas or syn gas whatever gas is available we are able to do it so this is the actual plant this is not in paper this is actual plant already in working so this is, i have shown the try try to show the how the outdoor drawing is and uh, there is these uh, hot metal can be tapped in the existing torpedo ladder and can be taken to the existing uh, boof shop that is one of the thing then now coming to the hydrogen based dri reduction yes so in here what we are talking about ccu to carbon direct avoidance now it is not to capture or not to store or not to utilize what we are telling you just directly eliminate and it it is possible if we use the hydrogen as a reducing agent of course this process scheme remain exactly the same we get the hydrogen but hydrogen is a green we always refer green hydrogen we, mr sharma has referred in the in, in one of the question answer that uh, brown hydrogen and even making the hydrogen from the uh, natural gas is not a viable solution better we should uh, think of the other solution yeah so we are here about uh, talking about the electrolysis uh, definitely we need electrical energy use electrical energy but if you are getting from the uh, renewable energy so it is quite good and we are happy with hydrogen and we can do it so the plant looks like this will look like this and already looking like this uh, i'll tell you the plant which where it has been installed in the next slide but everybody is now talking about the hydrogen 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 but that is that is nothing new with us for us of course in this forum uh, in last couple of years people have started talking about the hydrogen uh, after this paris paris agreement which has been signed last time but tenova hyl energy round we have been doing this from in 90s itself from in 1990s we have been doing this 90% hydrogen nothing new even in present scenario in all our uh, um, dri plant they are already working with 70% hydrogen 70% so it is nothing new that uh, we are we are using this 70% now the only challenge is how to get the hydrogen pure hydrogen so this hydrogen what we are getting is from the reformer gas what we have i have shown in the in the in the beginning methane methane when it breaks into uh, hydrogen and co so basically we are hydrogen ratio if it is more the better for us and we have already experience in designing all the equipments we have done it for last 1999 onwards 30 years we have been doing it for designing this so somebody asked about how 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 the safety point of view in the reheating furnace but for the our dri also there is no problem already it has been trial and tested process gas heater even the gas sealing system uh, design everything has been done and that is why uh, most of the customer i will just show you the references of cell skeeter as well as hybrid they have uh, married with us uh, i should say for this uh, journey now yes this was also discussed in the previous discussion that uh, hydrogen is going to be the is the best reductant as compared to carbon monoxide when it comes for the reduction Bec uh, so th those uh, re reaction has uh, explanation has already been done in the previous slide and uh, here you can see that uh, the iron ore reduction with hydrogen is four times faster as compared to carbon monoxide so the better the, the the more the hydrogen the happier person we are in terms of the productivity faster reaction and of course the cleaner cleaner uh, the steel what we'll be getting out of it yes there was one question uh, mr dr dr uh, mukesh has says has explained that uh, this hydrogen reaction with uh, iron oxide is an endothermic reaction agreed here also you can see an enthalpy change this is endothermic but in our system already we are working at high temperature and high pressure 
so that is that is already taken care of and we have got our, our process gas heater which ensures that even the, uh, whatever shortfall in the temperature is there we are we, we are very much comfortable in that so this is the plant of the actual plant of in monterey in uh, mexico of the dri plant what we are now talking of the exactly the same plant is 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 uh, working now it has already started uh, in hybrid sweden and now they are selling the dri to 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 volvo and mercedes and you know those those news are coming up in this market so for us we are not uh, we are very much comfortable because we are here we are supplying only the dri plant the what is the major important thing is that they are they are doing it for uh, from the green energy green green hydrogen sorry green hydrogen which is coming from the renew, renewable energy so since 1990s we have we have been doing this 90% hydrogen and all those things uh, have been already implemented this is actual plant and similar type of plant we have we have already commissioned in hybrid student so this is what i was also discussing that uh, yes uh, as compared to natural gas if it is hydrogen more hydrogen you need less energy less power consumption basically the main mo most of the important uh, factor is the compressed air line which we need so the more the hydrogen the less the power consumption of course here we are showing the comparison of the hydrogen versus energy from 100% natural gas if you are moving to 100% hydrogen you need less energy and from the emission point of view zero emission zero emission obviously there would be zero emission here we have tried to just uh, explain you the matrix between the hydrogen and the electrolyzer uh, based on our uh, the references at cell skeeter as well as in uh, hybrid uh these are the various uh, dri plant starting from uh, micro module we call it from uh, 0.25 million ton to we can go up to 2.5 or 3 million ton and these are the various percentage of uh, hydrogen and uh, we can increase from 55 to 100 percent and this is this is to to 2300 is the kg per hour of dri is required for making uh 0.25 million ton of uh, uh, uh of the dri so these are the various chemistry of course it is already available here you can you can furthermore we can review on it and these are the how much megawatt energy is required so that we have made a, a, a simulation out of it now the, what it would be the sustainable path for the decarbonization of the steel making so what so far we have told and discussed it is nothing on paper it is already implemented one plant is cell cost cell skeeter cell skeeter low carbon uh, steel making this is this is the the full form of cell skeeter this is in uh, cell skeeter they make 10 million ton of steel another plant is hybrid yes ssab lkb wet and fall and the dri supplied by teno hyl yes energy run process and uh, this cell skeeter again they are doing this is of course transform transformation this i will explain you in the next slide they are also coming up with new drl that is cell skeeter for the 100% dri 100% dri they are they are they are they, are, they, are, they are want to do now coming to cell skeeter here you can see today they are having they make 10 million ton of steel in germany uh, they have three blast furnaces two big one is small and three converters now in the pilot phase already we are in the execution phase in 2020 plus onwards uh, they, they, their aim is to install one uh, electrolyzer dri and then stop 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 one uh, one uh, one um, small blast furnace then they can reduce minus 26%. In the first phase, in the first phase of the pilot, uh, you can see minus 18%. Here they are using the DRI in the blast furnace, high carbon DRI into the blast furnace uh, as a replacement to coal, coke. So there they can reduce 18%. Furthermore, if they stop one uh, blast furnace, mini blast furnace, this small blast furnace, they will reduce 26%. By end of 2040, in, this is the basically the transformation uh, of the steel all of the sudden they are they are not going to stop this plant even for the single day uh, so gradually it will be done so once they install the dri 50 percent hot hot hot, hot uh, co2 is getting eliminated finally all the blast furnace bof has been removed and you can see all the dri so I, i'll not say zero i'll never say zero it is 95 percent of the co2 is getting reduced of course zero it tends to zero but definitely it is uh there will be some carbon we cannot escape out of it so the approach is conventionally today cell skeeter we are we were talking about 1.6 ton oh sorry 1 to 2.2 uh, ton 1.8 ton but they are making the best of best 1.6 ton of co2 is getting any, uh, eliminated through their present route of blast furnace bof here you can see this iron oxide they are using the iron ore and pellet in the blast furnace and this is the present route they are making the steel 
uh now with the introduction of dri gas based dri and electric car furnace the gas based dri that is electric car furnace and hydrogen and natural gas of course for the makeup if they need if there is no uh, generation of uh, they will keep as a backup the, 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 this, this is this is the future route which they have uh, they can reduce 94 95% of the co2 emission now uh these are the various agencies which you can see they are involved one is generation of the solar energy <clears throat> or wind energy into the power and that power can be should be used for making the uh electrolysis electrolysis also in terms of making the so there are various agencies you know tenoa is a part of for making the steel steel basically if we get the hydrogen we'll make the reduction of the dri and making the steel but there are many companies polworth is there then sun fire is there and uh, yeah there are many companies we call it green you can see green industrial hydrogen 2.0 2.0 so this is cell skitter cell cost this is the total plant and our portion is getting the co2 uh, okay, sorry getting the sorry getting the hydrogen and making the reduction in our dri plant and the downstream facilities uh this is this is a demonstration plant uh which is 100% based on 100% dri that is for the same cell cost cell cost the, you can see the 3d modeling already work is going on by next year it will be in operation it will be operation of course we are getting the grant from the german german uh, government uh so at the end of the this is selkos approach is that you put the pellet this is our dri this is our portion what we are giving and we are reducing the iron but yes various agency they will be converting this uh, uh, non renewable energy into the uh, electrolysis uh and then we can step wise step wise basically the 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 interest is to do the step wise initially they will they will have the natural gas also then renewable energy and step wise but this uh, the, the 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 mu drl what we have shown already this is a parallel exercise last uh, last year we, uh, we we signed the contract and we are executing this project next week uh, next year you will also hear the news like hybrid that they are able to make the fossil free steel uh this uh, selkos if you compare the footprint this is only for depiction purpose that uh, the emission what because they make 10 million ton of steel uh per annum so 4.6 this is just for and uh, just for impression purpose uh so much of car emission can be can can be it is equivalent to that one and equivalent to the co2 absorbed by 500 million trees so something about 6.6 .6 times the burden this is only to just give you a feel about uh what is the importance of reducing the carbon footprint for the cell cost project cell, cell cost this is the hybrid plant inside though we are not authorized to show what is there inside the plant but the, here you can find this is our dri plant which is there fossil fuel steel yeah so now this here you can see we are also executing one project uh, in russia that is uh, in omk that is 2.5 million ton of course this is ultra low nox and co2 removal system already it is uh Uh, inherently present in our scheme and jointly developed by Tenova and Denali. I think Ashton will may explain you after maybe a few minutes later. Then, most importantly, China. China, the first DRI plant is now uh, under installation, and maybe by next year we will see its uh, its production. Seventy percent hydrogen they are using for making the half a million around half zero point five five million ton of uh, DRI. so that is being supplied in the group called hbis hbis uh, that is one of the largest steel maker in china so that is also we are we are under execution and another one is patmin patmin is the the plant you can see the it is the first uh, nodular pig iron plant the pig iron is generated through melting of the dri in our open slag bath furnace we call it open slag bath furnace and uh, this construction is also going to be completed next year it was already in the in the in this uh, in the in the process this is this is in usa and another one is the black rock that is in canada quebec here you can see there also we are using the dri for uh, melting the, uh, the 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 dri and uh, we are making the pig iron out of it so the the final product will be the high high quality pig iron and uh, this is the better route as compared to the blast furnace route so we are not depending on blast furnace we are not using any coal we are not using uh, that is why there is no uh, issue of sulfur desulfurization is also not required so it is a clean way of making it is an alternative way of making the dri so this is what i have just explained to you in the beginning that yes 
with the DRI, you can uh, you can you can use uh, in the liquid steel. But in the end of the slide, I'll just try to show you how we can foresee DRI. Uh, this is the DRI. We are getting high carbon DRI. We can either melt into the electric arc furnace or in our open slag bath furnace, and you you will get the high carbon high carbon uh, hot metal, meaning. That in the present situation, what is happening is when there is a pellet, BF grade pellet, we are using in a blast furnace for an BF BF route. What we are telling for such a steel maker like uh, even Tata Steel or uh, JSPL, uh, sorry, not JSPL, I can say JSW or uh, like Cell Skitter, those who are having already, because we, we, they, there is no much generation of CO2 at this level, the maximum CO2, all the CO2 is generated in the blast furnace level. What we are telling, you use the BF grade pallet. We are not asking DRI grade pallet because the price difference is quite high. So same BF grade pallet you use in our DRI and you the same hot DRI, you put it our OSPF, open slag bath furnace. The conversion cost is very, very minimal, very minimal. And you get the hot metal and the same hot metal you can use in the downstream facility, retaining the same converter and you can make the steel directly with 50% less CO2. So here there is no, no, no hydrogen is involved. This is what Dr. Kumar was also mentioning that without using even hydrogen, we can reduce the CO2 footprint. So that should be that should be one of the way one 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 can one can think in that respect. Uh, yes, of course we we discussed about the scrap. If it is scrap, we can melt into the electric arc furnace. Uh, what we have recently seen that the scrapage policy is there, and then even Tata is coming up with the Tata uh, recycle business. So scrap generation will be more in India. That is true, but we cannot get quality steel from this scrap. We need some virgin source. So that is why the iron ore use use the hydrogen based uh, DRI. Uh, either put in a electric arc furnace or you put in a OSBF and you can use just uh, in a BOF and you can make the steel out of it. So this is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Praveen. Uh, there are a couple of questions which I would like to just uh, put before you before we move on to Arijit from uh, Tata Steel. So next presentation will be uh, Dr. Arijit Bissas, Principal Researcher, Ferroalloys and Mineral Research Center, Tata Steel. But before that, let me ask you the question which are there. Mr. Chaturvedi, where is the pilot plant with 90% H2 in DRI production? Next is Mr. Chaturvedi got the answer from the next PPT. Can you please explain the difference between Energiron with say 100% H2O vis-a-vis -vis hybrid and they the same? Uh, yeah. If so, where is the need to start from scratch? lab to pilot, etc. in hybrid, ACR does. Uh, next question is Asim Poddar, thermodynamic question. Are you, as you mentioned, reduction of iron by hydrogen is four times faster than carbon. If the delta G is, is more or less for both induction process, how come it is four times faster? This is, this is what free, free, uh, gives free energy, gives free energy that the equation I already have shared in one of my uh, presentation. I can give you the calculation based on this. Uh, there is one technical paper. I'll just forward it to, to, to Mr. ARC Das. And this hybrid project and our DRI project, it is all the same. Uh, the photographs which I have shown you previously, that was from our Mexico, uh, Mexico plant, the actual DRI plant, what we installed in 90s. And uh, the similar, similar concept is already working in hybrid, hybrid, that is in Sweden, the same, 100%. I think uh, Mr. Uh, A.N. Singh uh, had raised a question. Ankit, can you upgrade uh, uh, Mr. Akhilesh Singh to uh, panel so that he can ask the question? Yes, uh, Mr. Singh, uh, you can now unmute yourself and ask the question. Mr. Akhilesh Singh, can you hear me? Uh, is he okay. Yeah, yeah, he's he has unmuted. Yeah. Ah, Singh sir, ask There is some problem in the. Yeah, no, no, no. Ab, 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 no, I just want me to how it is going to be cost competitive. Ultimately, the whole thing has to be uh, uh, still made through this uh, uh, 
DRI route, how it is going to be cost competitive with the conventional blast furnace and BOF route? Yes, if you're talking about hydrogen, surely this has been already addressed. Uh, and uh, if you're talking about natural gas, that also, it, because major component, major uh, input cost is the reductant. So it all depends upon it all depends upon the price of the the, the hydrogen. It won't be economical if we see the high 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 price of uh, reducing gas, whether it is natural gas or whether it is uh, hydrogen. So this is what we have to address. I agree with you. Yeah, because since I was involved in installation of the hydrogen plant and the steel plant long back, mm -hmm. it's a very expensive and very complex process. And more importantly, there is a lot of safety hazard. Any any oxygen, if it is a polluted in the hydrogen, it becomes a hydrogen bomb. That is no, one uh, of the yeah. Yes. That, that is know. one of the. It has yeah. been a very big yeah. Uh, I yeah. don't know whether Mr. Uh, Joe Sim is here or not. From Linde, he can he can he can give more more answer on hydrogen generation and hydrogen. Uh, no, you, Nirmala, is he there or not? Because no, no, Linde Joachim, can give. Yeah, yeah, Joachim has left. He has just left a message in the group that uh, he has another yeah, yeah, meeting, yeah. so that's why he had to leave. Because yeah. why I am sharing for the silicon steel, in fact, for CRGO, very high temperature hydrogen box and furnace are used. There are three, four layers of the safety systems are there because of this danger, and it has happened also. Some explosion has happened. So the main problem is that safety is the greatest concern, and I found means nobody is mentioning about it. It may be thermodynamically and kinetically very attractive, but I don't know how how the safety-wise it is going to work because safety maintenance cost is going to be very, very high. Yeah. Anyway, yes. this is the input from. Based on my limited experiences for the all the people who are involved in the development of hydrogen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. ACR Das has just sent me a question. Uh, that not a question actually. He wants uh, Praveen. He wants your email ID. So if you could just share it with him in the chat box, or uh, I will I can send it to him later. I, 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 I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. No issue. Just put I'm it in the chat box so he gets there. Yeah. Uh, so with that, we'll move on to our uh, next presentation. Thank you, Pradeen, so much. Doctor, you, yeah, Dr. Arijit Biswas, he's a principal researcher, Ferrola is a minerals research group at Tata Steel. So over to you, yeah. Dr. Arijit Biswas. Yeah, good evening. Uh, good evening, all. Thank you, Mr. Mukherjee. And... Uh, uh, thanks uh, for a nice presentation, uh, Praveen. It was nice to hear from you. And uh, hope my screen is visible. Yes, and, it is. Yeah, Perfect. okay. So, uh, so as everybody has been uh, talking about the usage of hydrogen in the in the steel prospective and the decarbonization section uh, sector, so as uh, Mr. Mukesh Kumar has already told that the two subjects should be decoupled, it should not be kept uh, seen uh, with the one lens. We should be decoupling it. So uh, though hydrogen right now is a is a costly affair, but uh, we should not uh, look. Uh, at, at uh, with that we should be trying to decouple and that's how the Tata Steel uh, scenario is looking at. So uh, if we right now these numbers are known to the uh, the August gathering over here that the people know that uh, how much of the CO2 is coming from a bit sector in the manufacturing. Though to the brush up that the steel contribute approximately ten percent of the of the CO2 emissions right now uh, as per in Indian uh, Indian context. And and this will this will increase as our GDP will be increasing if we continue to go ahead with the with the current blast furnace route. But but there and if we if we see uh, that in an integrated steel plant uh, like uh, Tata Steel we have a integrated steel plant and we have two point we approximately it is two point five tons of CO two per ton of crude steel uh, which which we uh, look at this moment the CO two emissions and most of it has come from the blast furnace which contributes to around sixty eight percent of uh, the of the CO two emissions come from the blast furnace as Praveen has mentioned so an uh, other part is like um, mostly are uh, very nominal to contribute in that uh, so. So blast fun, if we, if we have to decarbonize um, the steel industry, we have to look at the iron making sector very thoroughly uh, in that respect. 
but uh, but there uh, there is a there is a catch on it. Uh, there's a caveat on the top of it. If we look at the evolution of the evolution of the iron making technologies in terms of of the usage of hydrogen and the pattern of uh, CO two emitted pattern of crude steel, we we see uh, that uh, on the top there is a Corex, Phoenix, and the BF. Uh, BF technologies and the Hisarna, which is getting uh, developed uh, and which will be implemented by Tata Steel. And eventually, as we increase, as we right now, uh, we have, if we see the current uh, prospective technology of, in, uh, of uh, usage of the hydrogen in the blast furnace, we currently use only 5% as an injection with the, with the steam. So, as eventually we go ahead, uh, like uh, uh, like HYL and energy iron and the uh, matrix energy process, which is there. So which reduces the, uh, which reduces the CO2 footprint from 2.2 to around 1.5. And even with the usage of natural gas, which reduces uh, the carbon footprint and drastically by approximately 50%. And eventually if, as, as, uh, as Praveen has already shown that, uh, HY has the capability to in, uh, intake the hydrogen from uh, uh, around 90 95 percent in in their in their uh, in their energy iron process which 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 is uh, which is a very uh, which is very attractive and that's why people have uh, taken so the question comes is that though we know that the hydrogen uh, will decarbonize but the question comes with the from an Indian perspective is that where from the hydrogen will come so I will try to catch up on that and I will try to um, look at that perspective where the hydrogen will come and if we have to look at the with respect Indian perspective how hydrogen can be produced so this is a beautiful um, a pictorial uh, version uh, produced at the Moscow website that the how the hydrogen is categorized. So most of us know that it is categorized into uh, gray, blue, and green. And the new two, uh, the versions is the YOLO and the turquoise hydrogen. So right now people have been looking at the green hydrogen, but if we see, if we see at the different energy companies like Shell and uh, uh, Shell, who who has given their their uh, perspective that the blue hydrogen also has a as a long run. Uh, will be cost competitive with the green hydrogen. That, that's how uh, I will try to show that even it can be, it, it, it is possible to look at that perspective and the lens. As Mr. Sharma has also mentioned at the starting that the, the coal gasification is one of the one of the areas. Yes, but there, there, there comes with the caveat that the substantial amount of CO2 gets generated, which, which, is, which is extra CO2 other than the blast furnace, uh, blast furnace generated CO2. So how, how can we, use how can we use uh, uh, the the steel making technology as a benefit or the iron making technology as a benefit for our hydrogen generation if we see the hydrogen generation technology at this moment um, with respect to the different trl on the x axis and the kg of the co2 because the hydrogen doesn't come cheap it it comes with a substantial amount of co2 which is generated per kg of hydrogen so that is projected on the y axis and we see uh, that categorically uh, there are different uh, circles which has been made which shows what is the prl and how much is the co2 if we see the smr is the biggest uh, biggest producer of the hydrogen is a, is a commercial technology is smr for producing hydrogen throughout the world followed by the alkaline electrolysis uh, alkaline electrolysis which uses the grid electricity if we see both of them they have the substantial amount of footprint if, if we compare that uh, somebody has asked that where from we get uh, how much is the energy how much is the uh, co2 emission per kilowatt of uh, so if we consider our uh, indian grid which is having a 0.8 kgs of co2 per uh, per uh, per kilowatt is substantially high and if we take uh, efficiency of alkaline electrolysis uh, to be approximately around 60 percent you can do the math that it will be approximately 29 kgs of co2 per kg of hydrogen which is substantially high but if we uh, and if we uh, look at the other perspective, like uh, if we see at the biomass gasification, I will touch upon that. Biomass gasification is another perspective, and India, being a uh, 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 agricultural rich uh, country, we have a pretty uh, very bright perspective to utilize this biomass to give an example that approximately in India, 100 million uh, metric ton of the crop residues burned every year. So you can do the math and 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 uh, from there, and if you have the biomass gasification, uh, we have always can have a negative CO2 footprint from there. 
Secondly is the utilization of steel mill off gases, which we generally the steel uh, steel producers produce a lot of uh, integrated steel producer produce a lot of uh, steel mill off gases, which is generally used for making of the power. And if if you do the math with respect to the cost of power and the cost of uh, the hydrogen, you will find that the cost of hydrogen is much much higher than the cost of cost of power. So whether we can use this, uh, whether we can use this. Uh, of gases which we are using right now for the generation of power uh, as, as a uh, in the captive power plant can we use it for generation of the hydrogen as well so there are a few technologies which Tata Steel is working on and uh, and the, with the, some critical success factor that the the it cannot be a single technology which will which will uh, suffice our needs we have to have a, a lot of uh, different technologies into taken into account um, and uh, and we have to look at the cost, which is a lower cost, and the high, uh, lower cost will be much better with respect to if we see a levelized cost of the hydrogen. We cannot afford to work on with around seven dollars uh, per kg of hydrogen, which is currently or uh, which is currently the cost of the hydrogen, which is coming out from the alkaline electrolysis or electro electrolysis. So uh, there are three different approaches Tata Steel is working right now. That one is on the carbon capture and utilization. Second is the hydrogen generation, and the, there is a carbon direct avoidance. Uh, so, current carbon direct. I will start with the carbon direct avoidance. That the hydrogen which can be generated, it can be used directly inside the BF, which can reduce approximately fifteen to twenty percent, um, depend uh, fifteen to twenty percent of uh, of theoretically the CO two footprint. Uh, few of my colleagues are there in the uh, in the audience. They have done the calculations from the iron making group, and they uh, they have done. And eventually, we it can be started with the usage of uh, of steel uh, of uh, reform of the of like um, uh, natural gas or uh, hydrogen bearing gases uh, like coal bed methane which can be used uh, to start the practices when when we don't have the cheap hydrogen availability we can start and eventually it can be it tuned the blast furnace operations can be tuned and eventually the hydro when we have the cheap hydrogen availability with us we can uh, we can go ahead with um, we go ahead with the replacing of those uh, those gases with the hydrogen, which which will give us straight way re reduction. Second is the usage of hydrogen in DRI plant, and and then and then the carbon capture. So we cannot we and uh, India being uh, India being a country which is uh, predominantly dominated by the blast furnaces, and and blast furnaces will remain because uh, the and new installations are coming. If we see at the life of the blast furnaces, there will be fifty years uh, with the new blast furnaces coming in, in right now. So there will be. It will be running another 50 years. So, what to do with the CO2 which is generated? So, CO2 has to be generated in term. Uh, CO2 which will be generated has to be converted into a valuable product like DME or the methanol, uh, which which like uh, which government is supporting to use in the alternative fuels. Though we also require hydrogen over there. And hydrogen has to be has to be coming from either green sources or it has to be carbon neutral sources, and it has to be cheaper. So if we see at the Tata Steel prospective for the decarbonization, where if we have been looking at the hydrogen generation, one is the electrolysis, which is very high TRL. This is a uh, this is though there is a caveat on the top of it that the, if the green electricity is available, that that will make our life very easier. And and uh, and as per the Niti Aayog's uh, Niti Aayog understanding that the, the green electricity and uh, as the and Tata Power and NTPC is working, that, that they will be putting up their uh, the green electricity grids are increasing in India day by day, and uh, and by 2030 it will be 400 gigawatt of uh, green electricity in the grid. So that will be uh, other good to look at by 2050 how much of the electrolyzers, uh, electrolyzer, uh, what will be the cost of electricity, and how the CO2 footprint goes down. Second is the biomass gasification. The biomass gasification is is getting followed up uh, in Europe as well as in Sweden, where they they generally use uh, Sweden generally use MSW 2 point and generate the heat. So this heat uh, and the biomass gasification can be controlled as uh, in, and the traditional gasifiers can be used to convert convert this MSW into into the syn gas and this syn gas which, which which can be used uh, either in the DRI process or as an inject in the blast furnace or even for the carbon capture utilization. Third is the is the technology which uh, we have been working um, with our collaborators uh, in US is a, a chemical looping uh, combustion. Uh, basically, it is from utilization of steel mill off gases. If like right now, if you see uh, the blast furnace gas, the blast furnace gas has a uh, been used mostly um, for 50% uh, of get goes into the captive power plant. And if we see 
that um, uh, that uh, these gases can be utilized uh, for production of hydrogen and we have we have seen uh, we have been we have tested this technology at a 10 kg scale and we're pulling up the pallet on this that um, this can produce 100 percent pure hydrogen and the, and the co2 plus nitrogen mixture so there will be no mixing of the co2 and nitrogen and there will be 100 percent hydrogen coming out of it and that and that and that hydrogen can be utilized either in the dri plant or uh, or in the or or in the blast furnaces. So if we, if we see uh, the carbon footprint, the carbon footprint is around 5.5 kg, uh, kg per kg of hydrogen. And if we, if we compare, if we compare the, the CO2 footprint, or uh, if we compare the cost of the, of, the, of the hydrogen, which is coming from the steel mill of gases, is approximately $1.2 uh, per kg of hydrogen, which is much cheaper comparing the cost of the blast furnace gases. Most of the steel, uh, most of the colleagues from the other steel plants are, uh, knows that what is the cost of the blast furnace and math can be done on the top of it. So uh, then, then the off gases which are coming out uh, from the uh, from the blast furnaces that, that has to be mitigated and that that uh, how it has to be converted into fuel, and and that fuel can be utilized in in um, uh, in for uh, as a fuel or in the in the fuel as well. So if we if we see uh, a case scenario that. Uh, with the hydrogen injection and without hydrogen injection of the current BOA practice, approximately as many people have uh, told that uh, around from the 2 million ton with the hydrogen injection, we can go to 1.85 million ton. So approximately 10% of hydrogen uh, reduction can, can be straightway seen. Uh, by injection into the blast furnaces. Uh, though blast furnace, uh, due to the uh, uh, due to the thermodynamic limits and uh, that uh, hydrogen cannot be injected uh, more than more than a particular amount in the blast furnaces due to top gas limitations. So uh, what it can be done, it can be a mix and match with respect to with the DRI and the, and the, so uh, right now, if we see uh, that uh, the natural gas, we can use uh, the natural gas, but if we see the Indian context that we don't have natural gas and eastern part of the India is a, is a is not having that much of natural gas uh, as the uh, western part of India uh, is uh, seeing. So if we have the cheap hydrogen sources available and the technology which uh, which HYL has already shown that it is ready so that it can be it can be directly injected into the blast furnaces uh, is in, in sorry into the DRI making to uh, abate the CO2 which is coming uh, uh, from the uh, from the uh, from the natural gas route as well. So, and if we look at the carbon capture and utilization aspect that if we look at the meth methanol production, I have taken the two scenarios, if a methanol production site, if we have to abate around 1 million ton of CO2, um, then we approximately require 0.14 million tons of hydrogen. And that hydrogen has to be coming from uh, the green sources, which, which can be uh, biomass. Uh, so considering the biomass that uh, the biomass has a negative CO2 footprint, we don't have to abate the whole amount of CO2, which can, which can uh, which uh, which can able to mitigate only the part of the of the CO2, which is approximately 40, 60% has to be around 40% can be can be taken from the inherent uh, biomass uh, uh, biomass availability of hydrogen. And if we take on the ethanol production also, um, there will be some amount of hydrogen and CO which which is required. So so we we bet on the methanol production is much uh, much uh, economical and much easier to do than the ethanol production which requires CO as well. So with that, uh, I see that uh, that uh, the hydrogen I will be uh, the cheap hydrogen uh, deployment is required uh, for the bio like uh, uh, the biomass will play an important role as well as the steel mill of this. And second thing, there are the few caveats that there has to be a transportation or a hub, which as most of the speaker has already spoken, uh, has to be there. A uh, pipeline of hydrogen storage has to be there across the across the across the Indian plat Indian globe, so that we can we can look at uh, at a better hydrogen economy uh, to uh, to get a 1.5 degree target with the steel industry. Thank you. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, uh, Dr. Biswas, a very uh, interesting uh, presentation indeed, because Tata Steel has always been a front runner when it comes to you know uh, reducing the carbon footprint as well as taking on futuristic technologies like uh, hydrogen 
based uh, steel production. Tata Steel has been the front runner in India. Uh, I would say next to Tata Steel is of course uh, JSW, which has taken uh, lead off late and uh, taken a lot of interest in, uh, I would say, uh, decarbonizing the operations of the entire JSW uh, fold. So it's over to Dr. Mr. D. Shatish Kumar, who's uh, R&D and SS Steel Mills uh, DGM uh, for R&D, SS Steel Mills and Product Development Group of JSW. So over to you, Mr. D. Shatish Kumar. Ankit? Ankit? I think uh, Mr. Deep Shumar has left. No, no, no. I can see him in the attendees list. Just promote him to the panel. He's there in that in the attendees list. Okay, I, I think he had disconnected. So, yeah. Just promote him to the panel. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Satish Kumar, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, by, you know, I think you got disconnected. So you went to the yeah, attendees list. I, I was outside, yeah. So yeah. Now, now, you're, now you're back in the panel. You're promoted from DGM to, from DGM to CGM. <laughs> uh, uh, sir, is it visible now? Uh, yes, you have to just maximize the screen. Okay. So perfect. is it okay? per perfect? Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for giving us an invitation. Uh, uh, we are very happy to join this event, and it was quite uh, a good learning for us from the eminent speaker whom you could bring in for this event. Uh, here, I would like to give a, a, a kind of an overview or perspective uh, from a steel industry, and I would like to share a couple of things on the uh, JSW. Uh, activities on this front. Uh, to be very honest, uh, being such a huge steel plant, a single location, uh, decarbonization is really important to us. So I put decarbonization and hydrogen uh, in a different baskets. Decarbonization is a much bigger uh, aspect as compared to hydrogen. What we see here is that uh, we have different plans for CO2 reduction. Uh, all those plans we put into four different perspectives. One is process improvement. Second is improved raw materials. Third, which has been added recently, carbon capture and usage. And third, uh, fourth, I say alternative reductants. I didn't say hydrogen, but hydrogen becomes a part of this. Process improvement has been our continuous journey of energy efficient furnaces, uh, other uh, steps which, which basically reduces energy consumption. When I say raw materials, we have one of the biggest uh, beneficiation plants with us. Uh, similarly, now we have started going into carbon capture and alternative radio. So I said process improvement and raw materials, pretty much every steel plant is doing at some or different levels. But now we have to take a jump at this stage where we would like to go into the carbon capture or alternative radio and spa. So, so, so what is the what is what is the trend in the steel industry? What how do we see both these things? So carbon capture is the one which we are looking directly right now. We said that okay. It is not possible to jump to an alternative reductants directly, whether it's hydrogen or, or other things already been spoken by my previous speakers. We need to take an intermediate step. We see carbon capture as a step to this. Even if I compare most of the things which has been recently published uh, as a carbon capture or alternative reductants, both being an, an a big step for any steel industry at this moment, uh, the carbon capture technologies looks to be more technologically ready and possible to transform into ground field. And among all alternative reductant processes which are coming up, the hydrogen-based DRI looks to be much ahead as compared to any other technology, as has been spoken by many speakers here. But we can't say because it's still a long way to go and, and the scenario is so fastly changing that this technology comes very fast. So it could happen the suspension iron making a plasma direct or electrolytic process can suddenly come and, and transform the whole industry. So we, we do are ready for such kind of transformations also 
coming up. But at this moment, if you see carbon capture and hydrogen looks to be hydrogen in DRI looks to be promising. Uh, coming to carbon capture, when I say carbon capture, we have started looking into its capture, compression, transportation, storage, utilization. This all comes into picture. Uh, but from a steel industry perspective, if I see, uh, there are two basic technologies which are, I would say, are available on, on large scale at this moment: the carbon to chem and the Lanza tech process. They both have been discussed quite extensively in many forums. But these two are the one which which are quite attractive to Indian steel industry at this moment. Somebody will definitely we will move with some of this kind of technology. But not only this, we we also try to scout the technologies which are available and can we collaborate at very 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 initial stage and then develop it into a big one. In carbon capture, there is seventy uh, rotating absorbent technology, CDR Max, SAPM, global thermostats. So there are a lot of things happening in the world on this. So so we don't want to restrict only to those two, but those are the one which are leading at this moment. But there are many small, small things which are happening. Deep Branch, which utilizes Novo Nutrients, Blue Planet, even Carbon Cure and Carbon Treat are, are very interesting technologies for use it in concrete, etc. So there are many ways by which the CO2 can be reduced to CCUS. Of course, for for coastal plants, there are carbon capture and storage coming up. Either it's below the wells or below the uh, over the seabed, especially for those steel plants who are. Uh, at, at the coastal region, so so we have been looking into these kinds of technologies, and very soon we would be uh, adopting one of them uh, at our plant. But again, when I'm talking about carbon capture being an intermediate step before I move to any alternative reduction, this also requires hydrogen. As most of the applications of methanol, ethanol, we see, we do require a certain amount of hydrogen. And once hydrogen comes into picture, the green hydrogen comes in, the green part of it comes into uh, the main front. So even that hydrogen has to be green if, if I want to make it completely green. So in in that manner, even if we are going for carbon capture and hydrogen later on, hydrogen generation has to be in the picture from now onwards for any integrated steel plant. Uh, when I talk about hydrogen, uh, we all know there are so many terminologies given: brown, blue, grey, green. Uh, green hydrogen is the one which is the ultimate aim to go up. But there are possibilities with natural gas and coal, which my previous speakers have spoken. But uh, what I see is most of the steel makers have to start at this point, whether it's brown, blue, or grey, and and finally culminate at green hydrogen once it uh, comes and becomes cheaper. And this hydrogen generation is nothing new to at least integrated steel plants. Just like for us, I will share two examples. All those steel plants who have who already have a coal rolling mill at their end or a continuous coal rolling mill at them do have a uh, Hydrogen generation facilities at their end. Just like at JSW Vijayanagar, we already have two types of hydrogen generation facilities. One which which uh, which works on PSA, uh, which which uh, takes hydrogen from the cocoa one gas, and second one is a DM water based PEM model, uh, which uh, is basically uh, for generating uh, a, uh, electricity from water electrolysis. But the difference lies here. Uh, the hydrogen what we are generating through PSA is is half the cost of the hydrogen what we are generating through uh, the water electrolysis. So this this do is a concern. But the point is hydrogen generation is nothing new. We all all knew about this. We just need to properly integrate with our requirements coming in the future. So if I put this hydrogen perspective, everything uh, from an industry perspective, uh, how to generate hydrogen? I think many technologies are known. There are a lot of people who supplies that. Uh, most of them are working on lower production capacities, but once I start using that on an integrated steel plant, the, the capacities needs to be increased manifold. And that's where the challenge lies, the scaling, storage, and transportation of huge amount of hydrogen. I would say in terms of how to generate hydrogen, that is the challenge which is there at this moment, especially when we are looking for integrated steel plant. Where to use hydrogen? Yes, it, it's still very limited technologies, technologies under development. And again, once I'm generating hydrogen, it has to be green. That's where the challenge comes in. Now, how big is that challenge? If an integrated steel plant, if we see, uh, normally hydrogen can be utilized at four different locations in addition to the heat source in any of the other furnaces. We are already using in our CRM annealing furnace that can be made green. Hydrogen is required in carbon capture technology, especially carbon capture or utilization technologies for methanol, ethanol, or methane, etc., or, or uh, ammonia production, etc., comes into picture. Th those looks to be an, uh, uh, products which will add to the future of uh, CO2 in an integrated steel plant. 
as alternative reduction in DRI and alternative injection to PCI in glass panels. Not many people have spoke about injection in glass panels because the technology is still too far from us at this moment. So I would say that DRI, there are so many people who have come forward, uh, mid-rex, ulcor, hybrid, prime metals, high for H2 future, uh, so many projects going on. Uh, so hydrogen usage in DRI looks to work. Hydrogen using in glass furnace will cost course 50 and some, some uh, Tyson group experiments recently being done. It's still a far way to go. So maybe the Indian steel plants, which have recently started furnaces, etc., may not move to hydrogen in glass furnace, but the new furnaces which are coming could be a DRI based on hydrogen or, or, or enriched hydrogen. We see this kind of picture a lot. Uh, when I say, okay, we need to use hydrogen, etc. Uh, the green steel concept is there. So we are, we say that we have to move from this glass furnace, bio fruit to DRI. Yes, we need to move for making it green or low CO2. But the biggest thing what fears or the biggest fear what comes from to the, uh, the integrated steel manufacturers is the amount of electricity, what it has been written as compared to the existing uh, furnace route which is coming up. Now, this is where we are going to get a big bottleneck. Let me put it in a very simple way. Uh, suppose a DRI unit has to be placed in. Uh, we need to know how much hydrogen would be required, what should be the electrolyzer capacity, and finally the power source. And if I put it in simple calculation, even with the best of the things, a 1 million ton DRI unit would require you to set up a 400 megawatt electrolyzer. Now, that, that's a kind of a calculation which goes on 1 million ton DRI a 400 megawatt electrolyzer. And if I'm talking about uh, making it green, uh, 1 million ton, 400 megawatt electrolyzer, if it is through coal, say, say it is blue or gray, you may require the additional power capacity of 534 megawatts. And if you want to make it completely green, uh, if it is through wind, you may require uh, 1143 megawatts of wind or 1600 megawatts of solar. Now, these numbers are too, too big, even for a single million ton DRI. I'm not think of uh, if it's a 10 million ton or 15 million ton steel plants which are coming up. Uh, this is where uh, the big bottleneck is going to come uh, to face it. So, so uh, do we need to jump to this immediately? There has been a lot has been published in BF Bio Fruit. Uh, some things are easy to implement with biofuel. Uh, BF Bio Fruit with carbon capture looks to be still uh, acceptable at this moment. BF Bio with hydrogen still a long way to go. Again, as I said, hydrogen comes in a big way in picture. Natural gas with DRI, it is commercially available, but high energy requirements. Blue hydrogen, still a long way to go with DRI, etc. Green with green hydrogen, I would say there is a flexibility coming up. Cost looks to be easier. Iron electrolysis, we still don't know. It might come up uh, in a big way uh, in future. But if I put everything into, into a single basket and try to see, there is a pathway which is very clear. To us. There is no single solution to do carbon steel. And there are many technological oh, options sir. which may be required to deploy alone or in combination. Especially in those areas where low carbon, is, uh, low carbon energy is available, water electrolysis can come into picture. The areas where CO storage or blue hydrogen reduction uh, is available, CCS or blue hydrogen reduction technologies should be adopted especially for those fuel plants who have, uh, or those areas which have potential access to biomass, maybe biomass and biochar as a substitute to coal could be an intermediate step. Or when you have everything with you, the CCU and utilization of the uh, CO2, which is emitted by converting them into synthetic fuels or chemicals such as acetone, isopropanol or, or methanol, ethanol, etc. coming to picture. So a lot of things depends upon your green steel pathway on where do you, where are you exactly at this moment, what kind of uh, costs involved in, in, in changing into the technologies. And based on this, you need to adopt those technologies in preference. And if I put it very simple way, uh, this is what the JSW looks like at this moment. Uh, presently, we are focused mostly till date on process improvement, digitization to reduce CO2 fuel consumption, optimization of process gases, or energy efficient technologies. This itself has brought a close to 0.5 tons per ton of steel CO2 reductions to us uh, in, the, in the recent past. But what we see as a short term plan is we need to move towards natural gas, syngas, biofuels, etc. Uh, in our furnaces, this adds value. 
we can look for hydrogen enrichment in those gases so that hydrogen percentage further goes up let's not wait for green hydrogen start with gray or blue etc so that we understand this technology and as soon as the green becomes cheaper to us economical to us we are ready to adopt them and the most important which cannot be neglected is uh, carbon capture and utilization this since we cannot move to uh, the furnaces exactly at this moment immediately if we are generating co2 let us capture and utilize them this this looks to be the immediate solution for integrated steel plants here in a long term plan if we build up green energy and green hydrogen capacities we can look for hydrogen based technologies to move in and then we can also look at that point whether there are some other breakthrough technologies available so this is the kind of a plan what what we are looking at this moment uh, very soon we will be moving many of our furnaces into natural gas and syn gas we are also looking into hydrogen enrichment these two are really happening at jsw vijayanagar at this moment uh, even with a small quantity of green hydrogen carbon capture technologies are also we are looking in one of the furnaces uh, in the near future uh, but most important thing to, which would say that already we moved in this direction because for most of the process i need some amount of hydrogen either enrich in the existing facilities either carbon capture or look for uh, for going for pure uh, hydrogen based technologies also we have uh, entered into collaboration with ffi australia where uh, we will jointly looking into scope for setting up an uh, electrolyzer at our vijayanagar facility basically for steel making green ammonia and other things etc and the very first green hydrogen generation unit is expected at vijayanagar very soon which will be totally produced from wind and solar energy which we have capacity near to our plant and this green hydrogen will be utilized in dri and and uh, carbon capture technologies which we are adopting so on a small scale we are already moving in and we'll see over a period of time as the technologies mature or the new technologies comes in we'll try to move towards uh, lesser and lesser co2 emissions in future thank you that's where i end thank you thank you uh, uh, mr d satish kumar thank you for your presentation now first of all uh, let me uh, thank uh, mr prabhat garui uh, mr uh, prabhat da was the first one who recommended you as uh, the speaker for this webinar so please convey my regards to prabhat da for uh, the thank same you. and also my special thanks to mr murugan and dr nawal now before uh, uh, i come to the question answer is oh there is i don't see any question for you but i'll just uh, read out uh, the la in, in the last uh, month in the month of august i did an interview of dr nawal in our magazine steel and metallurgy yes 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 uh, and in that, that uh, and in that uh, one of my question was i'm just reading out the question and the answer i asked dr nawal use of hydrogen as an alternate energy source has been a hot topic by almost all steel makers across the globe what are the initiatives being taken by jsw steel in this regard it has been recently reported in the media that jsw energy and its subsidiary jsw future energy limited have recently entered into an agreement with the australian hotsq future industries to collaborate on potential projects related to production of green hydrogen and utilizing for green steel making and other applications in india how much is jsw steel likely to benefit from this so i'm reading out uh, dr nawal's answer post paris agreement in 2015 reduction in co2 emission has been a mandatory subject for all the industry especially in the steel industry a lot of research work is in progress across the world initiated by most of the steel makers our sustainability team is preparing a road map to achieve this target by 2030 a lot of work has been carried out in reducing energy consumption and emissions in the areas of coke dry quenching Coke waste gas utilization, MEROS, uh, maximize emission and reduction of uh, sintering, WGR waste gas recirculation, Corex gas based direct reduced iron, JSW Energy is also working on hydrogen production which can be utilized for steel in BRI production along with the partial replacement of uh, PCI in blast furnace. We are committed to include and enhance green energy. usage in steel making that would further help us reduce and control the overall emission so this is what 
Dr. Nawal had to say. So yeah. a lot of work has already been done by JSW. And I would say JSW by next year will become the largest steel maker in India. And so the, the uh, I would say the industry leader in India is JSW for tomorrow. That is for sure. There is no second thought for it. And the way, uh, you know, whenever uh, I have interviewed Mr. Sajan Jindal, Sajan Ji has always said, our DNA is very aggressive. So he speaks about the DNA of JSW, which makes it an aggressive company. So with that, I thank you once again. And I'll now, move on, to, I'll now move on to Mr. Marco Perato, who is a technical sales manager for COC Iron and COE, uh, Metallurgy in Polward, which is now, of course, a part of SMS because uh, not only a part of SMS, it was a subsidiary or owned by SMS anyway, but now the shares of state of Luxembourg and all that has been acquired fully by SMS and it is uh, fully in the fold of SMS. So it is not, let's say, a company of SMS anymore. It is integrated in the system of SMS. So it's purely a SMS company now. So uh, with that, I'll move on to you, Mr. Perato, to take us through the initiatives of SMS Forward. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, it was also a pleasure to, to be part of this webinar and listen also to all the others uh, contribution, which were for sure very interesting so far. So uh, I will now share the screen one moment, and then we can immediately start. I prepared actually a very quick presentation because the allotted time was, uh, was quite short. So I just wanted to give you a few heads up of what, uh, what we are working. For sure, hydrogen in general, it's, uh, or in general, CO2 reduction, it's actually a topic which is very active now in SMS and in Polvort, and we are active in many fronts. Uh, so what I will talk about today is a CO2 mitigation approach for blast furnace plants based on an efficient integration of hydrogen, which is uh, one of the topics which is for sure of, of, of a matter uh, and, uh, and part of this webinar. Uh, just before I go into the slides, for sure, I just wanted to uh, anticipate that as SMS and, and Polvoort, we are working in many other fronts. As you know, we acquired a share in Sunfire, so we are also active in the part of uh, hydrogen production in an electrolyzing company producing uh, both uh, alkaline and SOEC uh, electrolyzers to produce hydrogen. And uh, in uh, other fields, of course, we are also a Midrex licensee, so we are active also in the DRI production. Uh, and as part of SMS group, you are also part of the full entire metallurgical chain. So uh, this is just one piece of a cake that we are discussing today, but uh, the, the topic of discussion is much, much wider and would, uh, would require much longer topic of discussion. So uh, starting from, uh, from the first introduction, we will then go in particular towards uh, topics of how to reduce CO2 in a blast furnace. Uh, making use of syngas and also in hydrogen as well. Uh, this is particularly interesting for India at the moment because the uh, Indian market is clearly dependent on uh, the FBOF route as it is uh, mainly in uh, Europe as well. Uh, so uh, this is for sure one possible path forward uh, until, uh, of course, a big breakthrough or big conversion of the full industry towards uh, uh, green hydrogen and uh, the green uh, DRI and green uh, steel in the end. And then a final a future outlook, uh, what, uh, what this could be look like. So these slides actually is showing uh, uh, what could be the, a, a potential, let's say, staggered approach in towards what we, in the end uh, will be the hydrogen uh, generation with the uh, green DRI, which uh, we are sure will come. But the only question is, is when, because of course, uh, economics of, of green DRI and green uh, hydrogen production it's still something that needs to be worked out, as also previous panelists and speakers have shown. And only when uh, the, the green hydrogen will become uh, much cheaper, then we can directly convert the full metallurgical chain towards this, uh, this route. At the moment, we are mainly here, either in Europe as well as uh, in, uh, in India. And so we have uh, different uh, possibilities in front of us to, to have a staggered approach. 
starting uh, from a partial conversion and uh, a change of the typical BF uh, that we know into a, what we call an ACID BF, and then also staggering then this approach with a partial introduction of EIF technology or in general electric steel making, uh, and partially uh, use also of uh, natural gas DRI, which is uh, typically based uh, uh, in, in places where natural gas cost is much uh, lower. And then, of course, a mitigation of the a mixture of these uh, with uh, CCS and CCU uh, that uh, also other speakers have spoken about uh, to reach in the end the final target, which is pure green iron and green steel making. So I just want to bring to you uh, what could be one potential vision of uh, one uh, European steel maker. So a plan that uh, it's, uh, it's now in, in action uh, in, uh, in, in Europe for one uh, European steel maker that has already, of course, planned uh, the, the next decades so what to do with the investments, so what to do with the present site, which is composed of uh, two blast furnace uh, and in this case, even five uh, DOF. Uh, so what to do? Uh, the decision was to, to convert partially, of course, the blast furnace with the use of uh, H2 either by connecting it to a network uh, of uh, providing hydrogen out of the fence and also by partially uh, producing hydrogen in a pilot plant, in a pilot project, which was called h 2 syn gas, uh, in which uh, we are actively cooperating with the customer to try to evolve the technology that is already there and try to produce syn gas by making use of the steel making uh, gases that are already there available in the plants. So uh, instead of putting this steel gas uh, uh, generation, which is now normally used for electrical production, we want to divert the, the steel making gases and reuse it uh, in the cycle to reduce in the end the total CO2 footprint. And this is uh, the first stage. Then there is a second intermediate phase in which on one side, we, there is a starting of uh, electrical steel making at site. Uh, mainly based on uh, HBI and uh, scrap uh, out of the fence available and uh, reduction of number of uh, blast furnace to one, but this blast furnace is being converted into what we call an ancient blast furnace, which I will explain in the next slide. And then uh, as soon as, uh, let's say, uh, the availability of, uh, of green hydrogen, uh, reduction of uh, cost of electricity, and in particular green electricity would avail uh, the economics to be run, then there is a shift uh, with the inside uh, DRI production. Uh, and uh, in the end, by 2050, uh, these customers foresee, foresee to not uh, have any more any blast furnace at site and run only with a partial uh, electrical steel making and the DRI production at site. So if we go then a bit closer in what it is actually in the nascent blast furnace, it's, uh, it's not a single technology, it's many technologies that uh, we are studying actively in Paul Wood since many years. Uh, in particular, one that I've shown here, it's the shaft injection of reformed singas. So to increase and to shift uh, the reduction from carbon to partial carbon and partial hydrogen uh, to reduce the total CO2 footprint, uh, we make use of singas uh, produced, so CO, a mixture of CO and uh, H2. And then we are foreseeing to install uh, and to inject these singas either in the two-year level, but also in an intermediate level in the shaft, which is a shaft injection technique, which, uh, which have many advantages in our opinion, because of course, uh, globally, the nascent blast furnace can reduce uh, the, the CO2 significantly. In this case, we've shown 28%, but in the next slides, I will show also potential for, for higher percentages. Uh, potentially depending on the economics, uh, the raw material cost, the, the gas cost, the electrical cost. So the, the, the global uh, price scenario, uh, it can reduce also the, the OPEX, uh, mainly dependent on the reduction of the copper rate. Uh, another particular aspect is that uh, can increase the productivity of the furnace because by injecting or reducing gas in the shaft, we are bypassing uh, the, the Bosch level. Uh, and therefore the, the limitation of the productivity given by the flooding. And, uh, and this is particularly interesting also, especially for cases in the future when we foresee to have already installed a base of BF, BOF, and we want to remove uh, one blast furnace, for instance, if uh, the other blast furnace can be more productive, this uh, we can make use already of the secondary steel making that is already there at site, so reducing overall the capex. 
And at last but not least, of course, it's an additional adding on technology. So we can change or uh, let's say improve the existing base uh, by adding uh, in a brownfield expansion uh, this technology, not uh, let's say wasting already all the blast furnace uh, plant that has already been uh, there since maybe some years and which can be upgraded to an enhanced blast furnace concept. Then uh, these are just a, a typical chart that we show to, to, to show what are the possibilities to reduce uh, CO2. One side is uh, potentially to integrate charcoal in the sinter plant uh, to reduce CO2 overall. Uh, this, of course, cannot be done everywhere in the world or cannot be done unless you have some outsourced charcoal production in places where charcoal make economical sense. But uh, what it's a matter of discussion today is actually the, the nascent blast furnace, so the single CNA injection. And these, as you can see, can be either viable, uh, interestingly viable, either if you have uh, H2, green H2 available, or also in cases where no green H2 is it's available there. So, uh, of course, uh, this kind of uh, selection uh, depends on the, where you are in the world and uh, whether the price environment uh, it's allowing you to have maybe cheap natural gas or other gases to be instead uh, utilized like uh, COG gas. And uh, depending on the routes you choose, you can go roughly in between a range of 20%, which can be a range in which you are injecting, uh, let's say, COG or natural gas uh, at the, or hydrogen directly at the two-year and start injecting also syngas and then shift even much aggressively towards uh, something more uh, CO2 reductant, which is a scenario in which we inject also hot uh, hydrogen or hot gas either in the two-year and as well as in the shaft. Uh, if we then couple these technologies with the carbon capture or carbon capture and usage, then the reduction are much higher and can reach uh, potentially in the best scenario, even something around uh, 78%, so around 80% of the present scenario that it's today. Uh, not mentioning that, of course, uh, many blast furnaces are already using that. Uh, if we increase the pellet utilization, typically the lower gun content uh, allows also to reduce uh, the, the, the cock rate and therefore having additional per, uh, percent reduction of, uh, of CO2 by approximately 6%. So all in all, uh, as you can see, uh, of course, a potential shift towards uh, uh, electrical steel making and the uh, RI based on hydrogen is for sure a viable source of reducing uh, CO2. But there are potential ways also to reduce CO2, keeping the blast furnace as a central uh, process to produce uh, iron and then steel. Uh, at last, of course, uh, when in a later stage there will be availability of cheap uh, green hydrogen, which uh, can be done only when cheap uh, green electrical uh, energy are there, uh, then there is also a question of how to use it efficiently in the blast furnace. And uh, also in previous discussion, there were, uh, there were slides that were showing that uh, there is a certain limitation of using uh, hydrogen directly in a blast furnace which is typically the top gas temperature or the raft temperature at the two-year level. Uh, but also, I just wanted to point out another potential issues that is there by using a typical hydrogen dietary in a blast furnace, which is the efficiency overall that you get. Because if you put uh, hydrogen at two-year level or in general in a blast furnace, uh, of course, the efficiency of the hydrogen is not 100% inside the reduction area. And therefore, you get a percentage of this hydrogen that is uh, escaping the blast furnace and will be found in the blast furnace gas. Now, if we use uh, the typical configuration of the iron making plant that is today, this blast furnace gas will be burned in the electrical generation uh, plant. Uh, and therefore, the overall efficiency is not that much. But if we shift towards a nascent blast furnace concept, uh, typically also the, the hydrogen that is, uh, is going into the DF gas can be mainly reused again for the, for the iron making production by making again steel gas, syngas, that can be again re-injected uh, partially uh, in, the, in the blast furnace. So overall, uh, what we see is that uh, the enhanced blast furnace can be also an enabler or further use of, uh, of hydrogen in, the blast, in the, the blast furnace process by increasing overall the, the efficiency and the utilization of the hydrogen in the route as well.
So I have gone uh, quite fast, and of course, there are many more topics that we can discuss and that can be on interest. But uh, considering also the Indian time, I would say, uh, if you have any question, you can directly contact myself. Uh, and uh, we can maybe have uh, further times for, for discussing these topics in major details and also discuss uh, potential other routes like DRI and also hydrogen generation, which uh, Paul Wood SMS uh, uh, group are very active uh, in the last years and can be providing you solution for your needs. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pirato. Um, so I will just check if we have any questions for you. So no questions in the chat or uh, in the Q&A section. So any questions from the panel? If not, then uh, thank you very much. And we will move on to our final speaker for uh, today's webinar. We have Mr. Ashton uh, Hertrick, sales engineer, Danelli Centro Metallic. So um, over to you, Mr. Uh, Ashton. Okay, good evening to everyone. It's a very pleasure to be here during this important webinar. Uh, I will start to share my screen in order to show you my presentation. Please confirm it that you can see my presentation. Yes, we can see. Okay, great, perfect. So uh, for today, uh, I prepared this uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Ashton Hertrick. I'm a sales engineer for, for Danieli. Um, as you will know, uh, Danieli is recognized as one of the major uh, technology suppliers in the iron and steel sectors uh, with the most sustainable technologies in his portfolio. Among these, uh, it has also the energy technology that has also the greenness and is recognized as the greenness way to produce GRI. Mr. Pravin Chaturvedi already uh, discussed and illustrated very well the energy and technology, so I will go very, very fast and just highlighting the, the, the major points uh, that from my point of view should be highlighted and in order to give you a quick overview of this uh, technology that is capable to use a high quantity of hydrogen up to 100% and also uh, is recognized as the DR technology that has the lower uh, environmental impact. So let's start first saying you who is Energiron. Energiron is a strategic alliance that was born during the 2006 uh, between uh, Tenova and Danieli to bring to the market the most uh, sustainable and environmental uh, clean solutions for the iron and steel industry. Let me uh, make a quick overview on how uh, today is produced steel. So as of today, approximately the 70% of the world's steel production is still made by the traditional integrated plants. Iron ore is reduced by the coal and in this way, uh, this kind of plants generate a considerable amount of uh, CO2 and other pollutants also. But uh, thanks to the introduction of the electric car furnace, emissions have been drastically reduced and indeed nowadays still ranks amongst the most recycled materials in the planet. Uh, but uh, any, any, anyhow, the quality of steel may be limited by the residuals in the scrap. So to overcome this potential limitation uh, is to dilute or to replace scrap with the uh, direct reduced iron or the coal DRI, which provides virgin iron units to the electrical arc furnace. So um, let me say that uh, the blast furnace uh, doesn't uh, uh, emit only uh, CO2 emissions, but have also incorporated, um, but also produce uh, other uh, big pollutants that usually are associated integral in the steel plants and with the coal uh, combustion, such as NOx, SOx, volatile uh, organic compounds and other that are very dangerous for human health. And let me say that with the uh, DRI technology, with the DR plants, we are capable to drastically uh, reduce these kinds of pollutants that are very dangerous for human health. 
let's see an overview on how a comparison of the CO2 emissions from uh, an integrated plant uh, comprising the blast furnace and basic oxygen furnace with CO2 emissions from a mini mill comprising the energy iron direct reduction plant and an electrical furnace. As you can see, uh, the 100% represents the blast furnace and BOF and accounts approximately for one, uh, one ton and 0.8 tons of uh, CO2 emitted per each ton of liquid steel. Instead, if, um, if we couple, let's say, uh, uh, they are plant, so we are introducing uh, DRI in a blast furnace, these emissions can be, can be reduced up, up to a 15%. And also uh, there are other uh, researches also and applications of hydrogen inside and blast furnace that can be uh, useful to reduce emissions in the blast furnace. But neither of these have uh, to now demonstrated that it's possible to reduce up to 100%. Instead, if we are speaking on the energizing technology, uh, just by uh, applying the energizing technology, so with the base case, with the use of the natural gas, we can see that uh, emissions are more or less half of the emissions that are in the blast furnace. Plus, if we are taking advantage of the capture system that is embedded in the energy plant, that is the CO2 removal system, emissions can be lower and can arrive at less than 77%. And furthermore, if we are using up to 100% hydrogen, we can reduce emissions up to 86% per each ton of the liquid steel. In this case, we are considering um, the, uh, the, the uh, CO2 uh, emissions equivalent uh, for the electrical arc furnace. So th th that's why you are seeing that there's still a small amount of uh, CO2 that is still emitting in atmosphere. So let's go a little bit more in detail for what concerns the energy and technology and, the, and his process uh, configuration. Uh, energy is recognized as the most flexible uh, technology available in the market because with the same process scheme, we are capable to use uh, all uh, these kind of reductants. So we can use uh, natural gas, we can use uh, hydrogen di uh, directly inside our process scheme. We can use also syngas, uh, and we can also uh, use cocoa and gas. So as you can see, even if we are changing uh, the uh, makeup gas, our process scheme remains the same. We don't have any type of variations. The only variation that we can have is when we are using high percentage of hydrogen, that for sure in this case, we will not need more the uh, CO2 removal system, so it can be removed. So in, in this case, uh, can be removed the CO2 uh, removal system, but the process you, you can see that will remain the same. So we have this great uh, flexibility on the makeup gas that we can use, but we have also a great flexibility on the product that we can produce. So we can produce uh, HBI, we can produce even cold DRI, we can produce also hot, uh, hot DRI by means of our proprietary equipment that is uh, the high temp system, that is a pneumatic transport system that allow us to transport a uh, hot deer right. Uh, covering long and for technology that we can uh, high amount of uh, carbon up to five percent. So if we see our uh, process scheme like a black box, uh, the, you, we know that for the principle of the mass conservation, we know that the carbon that is coming in has to come out from, from somewhere. So usually if we are uh, in, uh, putting in the carbon with the natural gas, we are having the carbon will result in the stack, for example, of the gas heater. We result in the DRI that, like I was telling you before, uh, we can uh, uh, easily adjust up to 5%. Uh, 
and the other remaining uh, is selectively removed uh, by the CO2 removal system. So totally, we can se selectively remove uh, 72, up to 72% <clears throat> of the CO2 uh, that is produced. Uh, and for us, it's not a problem, the CO2, because most of our uh, clients are using this, um, this CO2 for other uh, applications. For example, in our plant internium, we are using it in, uh, within the uh, food and beverage industries. Uh, in our plant in Emirates Steel, we are using it, it for enhanced oil recovery. So they are selling uh, all the CO2 that they are capturing thanks of the uh, CO2 removal system. They are selling this CO2 to this oil company that is using the CO2 for recovering oil. So um, this is just some of the applications that, uh, that can be uh, done with the, the CO2. For, for example, are also use the CO2 uh, for uh, the, the cement to produce cement. So there are many applications that can be used um, uh, uh, with the CO2. <clears throat> so let, let's go now and highlight the, um, how uh, our, let's, let's say, experience on using hydrogen. Uh, since 1960, we have been using uh, steam reformers with a gas composition of over 70% of hydrogen. Therefore, Energiron is already well known to be able to use high concentrations of hydrogens. So furthermore, in the 90s, we conducted some uh, campaign tests in our plant in Mexico using a makeup gas up to 90%. So this test allow us uh, to provide all the information that we needed to define uh, all the process design parameters, such as uh, flow rate, as uh, such as temperature, such as the reactor LD ratio, the operating pressure, uh, also the solid resistance of the of the DRI. So we have all the data to design correctly the plant uh, by using up to 100% of hydrogen. So hydrogen. So if, if, we, if we go then to the flexibility of our makeup gas, as I said, Energizer can use any kind of reducing agent. So the only thing that we need is, um, we are uh, an off taker of hydrogen. So only what we need is a, a flow of hydrogen at our battery limit and we can use it. So the technology is ready and we don't have, and we don't have any doubts on using high percentage of hydrogen. But we know at the same time that nowadays hydrogen is not yet economically available. So what we are suggesting to most of our clients that uh, we like to uh, install a new uh, energy iron plant is to install today an uh, energy iron that is capable to use uh, up to 100% uh, of uh, natural gas, as, as always. And in a, a near future, in order to meet also the, uh, the Paris uh, goals that are set uh, to be uh, to reduce 55% uh, of the total uh, CO2 emissions compared to the uh, Nairi level, industrial Nairi levels, uh, we can use uh, a mix, a mixture of, uh, of natural gas and hydrogen, a blend of these two. And in a long future, when the hydrogen will be available at a reasonable uh, quantity and a reasonable price, can be use uh, can can use also up to 100% of hydrogen. Uh, however, what we suggest is to use always some amount of uh, natural gas because, however. Uh, we need uh, uh, during all the value change of the steel making carbon. So carbon always is a, a part of the of the uh, of, of the steel making. So the possibility is to give the carbon inside the uh, DRI or inside the electric car furnace. We suggest to do it directly in the DRI because the carbon that is uh, bonded in the DRI is in the cemented form. It means that it's available uh, with a uh, hundred percent in the electrical furnace. So this is what we are we are suggesting. Furthermore, uh, we are like I was telling you before, we don't have any kind of uh, issues of operating with high uh, 
high percentage of hydrogen. For, for us, hydrogen is only at an advantage because the kinetics are faster, almost five times more faster than CO. We, uh, since hydrogen is on, uh, with uh, the, uh, with the iron um, is an endothermic reaction. It uh, uh, provides us a, a, a cooler bed. So we have also less sticking problems and less fines. We have no formations also of uh, uh, coke inside the, the, the heater because we don't have high uh, hydrocarbons. And furthermore, if we are using high percentage of hydrogen, the CO2, uh, can be can be smaller, so it means also the capex uh, uh, and the investment is uh, is lower. And if uh, a high percentage of hydrogen up almost to 80, 90, up to 100 percent of hydrogen is used, we can't avoid using the CO2 removal system because we are not uh, producing more uh, CO2. So this is this table just to give you a, a quick overview of the expected performance of an uh, energy ion direct reduction plant with different concentrations of hydrogen. Uh, this table has been divided by using 50% of hydrogen, 80% and up of 100% of hydrogen uh, based on energy basis. So when we are using 50% of hydrogen, more or less we can achieve 2% of uh, of uh, carbon. It means that we need uh, more or less 402 normal cubic meters of uh, hydrogen per each ton of the array. Instead, if we go uh, to 80% of hydrogen, we can achieve more or less one uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.6% of carbon. That is, this is the, our uh, recommend, uh, recommendation for most of the uh, steel makers that want to use high percentage of hydrogen. In this way, you need uh, more or less a quantity of uh, 600 normal cubic meters of hydrogen per each ton of DRI. But nevertheless, you can also use 100% uh, of hydrogen. But in this case, for sure, you will not have carbon inside the, um, the DRI. So it will result a DRI without carbon. In this case, you will need about approximately 700 normal cubic meters of uh, hydrogen per each ton of DRI. So you can imagine the quantity of hydrogen that is needed to run uh, uh, they are plant that is utilizing 100% uh, of hydrogen. Um, in Europe, we uh, projects aiming to utilize hydrogens are already starting to appear. Uh, already, Prime Minister Chaturvedi uh, give uh, an overview of our latest projects that are the hybrid project that uh, already demonstrate uh, the, the capability to use 100% of hydrogen. Uh, without with in, incurring no problems, uh, so they already produce green steel, and they already deliver it to, uh, if I'm not wrong, to Volvo. And I read also that they are now uh, signed a, a partnership also for uh, with uh, with Mercedes. Uh, so I, I think that in a next uh, not long future uh, we will see uh, green uh, green steel production. And for tomorrow, we are also uh, part of the Salkos project. So the transformation of their uh, blast furnace of the integrated steel plants into a, a DR plant that will utilize 100% uh, of hydrogen in the uh, 2050. So also thanks of our flexibility and uh, environmental compliance, uh, Daniele has been also selected to supply a 2.5 million tons capacity uh, to uh, OMK. In this way, this, uh, th this plant has the characteristic that will reduce by more than 60% their carbon dioxide emissions. And the other, uh, let me say, uh, achievement, uh, later achievement that Energiron has has achieved is that he has been also selected by HBI's group to supply a, a 0.55 million tons capacity plant, their plant that will be the first uh, DRI plant in China. And this has the characteristic that will use coke oven gas with an uh, uh, enriched gas 
with 70% uh, of uh, hydrogen. So Energiron in this case, once again, proves its capability of being the reference technology for future green iron production. So just to go into quickly to my conclusions, uh, I can conclude saying that Energiron is uh, characterized to be one of the most flexible technologies available, like uh, demonstrated and also recognized by many of the steelmakers, uh, built, uh, players, steelmakers in the world, and that has also the possibility to be fed by different fixed stocks with no modifications on the main process, including hydrogen, in order to comply with the most stringent uh, emissions regulations of uh, CO2 that are applied uh, worldwide. So with this, I finish my presentation. If there are any questions, I, I will be very glad to answer now, or otherwise you can also write me uh, in my email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashton. Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation on Energiron. Now, uh, though Praveen had uh, initially given some idea about the modules, but you gave a much more wider presentation. Uh, my only question is, uh, when uh, the gasifier is required, the customer says, no, I need a gasifier. Yes. Uh, does, uh, let's say, Daneli provide the gasifier as well, or you know, the customer's responsibility is to set up the gasifier? On no, we, we uh, didn't, let's say that uh, portfolio of Daneli, we don't have such uh, technology. Um, we have uh, previously studied the, the, the application of couple uh, gasifier with an energy plant. We, we also demonstrated that is not a problem because uh, the, the, the resulting gas will be hydrogen and CO, so two reductants that we can accept at our battery limit. So if is the possibility from a customer to uh, reuse a, a gasifier and to produce CO and hydrogen, we can use it with no problems. Suppose I want to use coal gas, uh, you know, because in India we don't have natural gas available to that yes. extent. So, so the best option would be to use coal gas. So when uh, I want to use well, let's say I want to utilize the coal gas, uh, put up a gasifier. Uh, will Daneli uh, include it as a part of, uh, you know, a third party or it is the customer's responsibility to put up the gasifier? On the well, we, we can support for sure. We can support the, the, the customer on the selection and some, uh, let, let me say, basic engineering for this case. So giving him all the characteristics that uh, we will need our, of, of our battery limit. Uh, but to answer you directly to your question, we will we, we not provide this kind of technology of classifiers. Okay, and my second question is small question. Yes. Uh, as a single module, yes. How, wh what is the maximum capacity I can put up for an energizer plant? Let's say I'm looking for a 5 million ton plant. Can I do it in a single module? No, no, not really. The maximum technological achievement uh, since now is 2.5 million tons per year capacity. <clears throat> For sure, we are now also <clears throat> starting the, 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 the possibility to, to increase this capacity. But <clears throat> since now, we don't, uh, we, we, we don't provide it to the market. Let, let me say still under development. <clears throat> Obviously, for a 5 million ton plant, I would need... Uh at least two modules. Yes, <clears throat> yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. And, Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, uh, Nashton, uh, pleasure to have you for the second time. You. <clears throat> Thank you very time. much. Uh, I'm very, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, you are very, very, very kind, and yeah. hope to you to, uh, to thank, meet you thank soon you, again. Thank you. It it enriches our, uh, you know, the Indian steel <clears throat> industry to a great extent. So I'll be the happiest man. The next time you tell me that you sold a couple of modules of Energiron in India. Uh, yes, we hope so, we hope so. <laughs> and I, and I, I sincerely think uh, JSW is the one you should be after <clears throat> because JSW has a good possibility to look at uh, putting up because JSW is going to reach 38 million tons by 2025. That's their target. So yes. to move from say 2021 to 38, they will mm -hmm. obviously need to move fast and think of judicious decision. Obviously, I, I'm sure they're not going to uh, lose time by trying to put up another blast furnace somewhere. 
So obviously, uh, it will be a judicious decision on the part of JSW if they think of putting up a couple of Energizer modules. To yes, yes. That and it is faster. I think putting yes. up uh, uh, the, the time which you save is also money. Correct, correct. So uh, that way, I think that will be the best possible solution, solution for the, uh, you know companies like JSW. For that matter, JSPL as well. Both right. Intel Steel and Power and JSW, I think it is. So you have to work hard to ensure that you get the order. Yes, yes. We, we work uh, very next to our customers and <clears throat> we hope to, to, to have a good collaboration with them. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. Thank uh, you. Buonanotte. Buonanotte. Uh, Bye bye. Uh, before we say ciao, ciao, I have a small duty to perform. My son will propose a vote of thanks before you go. Uh, you are based in Milan, right? Or in Butrio? <clears throat> no, in Butrio, in the headquarter oh, in of Daniele. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so you are based in uh, Butrio. And uh, so tonight you can <clears throat> go to Udine. Somewhere yes, hope to, to have you soon here, Mr. Yeah, Mukherjee. Yeah, I know. Because of the pandemic, I could not go. Otherwise, normally, you know, for the annual meeting <clears throat> in October, yes. I am normally there. And hopefully, if situation pandemic uh, goes away, next year we will perhaps have the DIM. You know, the Daniel Innovation meeting is uh, most probably likely to happen if uh, the pandemic goes. So I will be there enjoying some good grappa with you. Yes, and good wine. We, are, good wine we will be very of, happy to have you. <laughs> yes, yes. The, be the best wine of Frioli uh, I will surely enjoy. Do you stay in uh, Butrio? I mean, close to Butrio? Is yes, very there? close. It's, it's like about 10 minutes from here. So it's not okay. very far away from here. Oh, very good. Very good. Very good. So... <clears throat> We will surely meet and uh, sure. we will have more discussion when we meet. Uh, yes. And my best wishes to you. And, For you uh, too. Yeah. And let uh, my son propose a vote of thanks before we say ciao. Okay. Yeah. So um, not a lot of panelists left now, so I'll make it uh, short. Um, so overall, a lot of important topics today were uh, discussed and <laughs> innovative ideas about uh, alternative processes for steel making were discussed. And I would like to thank all the panelists for being here today and making uh, the session a vibrant one. My heartfelt gratitude to the Honorable uh, Minister Shifagan Singh Kulasteji and our sponsor Daneli and the entire steel and metallurgy team for making this webinar possible. Thanks again to all the panelists as well as the attendees for joining us today and for their active participation in the discussions. And with that, I would like to conclude today's meeting. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you, Ashton. Uh, just uh, one last uh, sentence. Yes. Please, please convey my thanks to uh, you know all my uh, friends in Daneli, including my good friend Paolo Massina. I think Messina. you know Paolo. You yes, know yes, Paolo? yes. Yes, for sure. For, yeah, sorry, Paolo, Paolo is a very good friend of mine. Please convey my regards to Paolo and tell him <laughs> that we had a good discussion today. And uh, I, I would like to thank everyone in Daneli. Daneli is uh, very close to my heart, right from Mr. Benedetti down to everyone. I thank everyone and Daneli Collective for the good work that Daneli has done over the years. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Well, thank I you very much for the nice words. Wow. Yeah. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Thank you. Ciao. Yeah.